The Columbia Broadcasting System presents the Mercury Theater in a special series of broadcasts about the other Americas produced by Orson Welles. Hello, Americans. I stand here in a room of a building in this modern city, surrounded by streets and planning and the shadows of monuments. There are parks here, playgrounds and plazas, churches, cathedrals, and holy air. There are marketplaces, laughter of people, electricity, motor cars, the singing of women. Age is here, and the wisdom of it. Time is here, in the stillness of the land. Time surrounds the city with huge hills, snow-covered, solemn. The conquistador lies below us now, beneath the foundation of the buildings, beneath the stones of the city he lies. All the weapons of slavery are dust in the earth. The chains, the lances, the cannon, the hard skulls, all are packed down by the weight and anger of centuries. There were graves in Mexico for tyrants then. There is room for graves still. He who comes to conquer this soil will learn to sleep under it forever. A mile from where I stand, the voice of Moctezuma spoke. His palace is now one side of the Plaza Mayor. In the subsoil of the Plaza Mayor, the Aztec calendar stone was found. Piedra del Sol, the stone of the sun. On its stone face are carved figures. They tell the time, the month, and year. Frozen in the giant stillness of the past. They return us to the time, to the history, to the name the invisible dead. Kukulkan. Quetzalcoatl. The god. Tall with white skin. He went among the people. The land is sacred. It belongs to those who work it, who plant and reap, not to those. Slavery is ungodly. Each man is master of his own body. There is enough in this land for all. All should be I, Emperor of the Aztecs, proclaim that Quetzalcoatl be punished. Find him! The bearded one has fled. East he goes in a ship. He will be back. We'll come by sea. He has set the date. He will return, bringing us freedom. The date. Set. The date was set. 1519. Almost on the day, a sail appeared in the east. The people quivered with hope. Moctezuma trembled on his throne in the mountains. The sail sagged on the mast. And a man set foot on Mexican soil. Cortez. Hernan Cortez. Gold lured him here to this very city, then called Tenochtitlan. And it stood in a clear lake like a jewel. And its temples were brighter than a hundred suns. The lake is gone. And many temples are gone. But Moctezuma walks in the blood of Mexico. With all his sadness and suffering. Moctezuma, standing at the temple, facing the terrible god of war. What do they bring, these white strangers who march westwards from the coast? Shall we sharpen our flints for them? Only the wind answered. Only the silent air, with its wild omens of doom. I speak to you, O oh God of peace. What do these strangers bring? 
Do they tell you, Moctezuma? Do the gods warn of the Spaniards? The white men? Will you call out your warriors, O king? Let them enter the city. Perhaps they are children of the sun. Bring them fruit and wine. They shall know we are not cannibals. The causeway's open. And the Spaniard armor shines like the surface of the lake. The air is quiet on this day. Cortez, horseman, hero, advances to the center of the city, smiling. White visitor, be welcome. This palace belongs to you and your brethren. Rest after your fatigue. Then I shall ask what brings you visiting to our island city. I shall answer you now, great Montezuma. I have come to see so distinguished a person as yourself, to spread the wonders of your empire. We must prepare for a bold stroke. Montezuma's uneasy. He asks questions. Shall we battle their army then? No. We strike where we'll dazzle them most. We strike at Montezuma, the heart of the body. Do you dare, conquistador? A few hundred men? A known quantity of blood? To pit against these minions? I tell you, Montezuma, this is no time to seek counsel from the stars. These men are not gods. They walk as men. They can die as men. Too late. Too late. The Spaniards strike swiftly. The great Montezuma, whom only the air dare touch, is learning the logic of chains. Speak, O king. For they have defiled you. They have struck at the hand of friendship. This very moment they run through the temples, looting and burning. The civilized man has come bearing gifts, Montezuma. The eastern world has come to save you. They prod you to the window. They have a knife at your back, O oh, emperor. Your people are below, impatient, deadly. Speak, Montezuma. Tell them to lay down their arms, or you die. Be tall at the window. Be strong. Be greater than these conquerors. Below, the Aztecs sound like a burning forest. They think you've betrayed them. They throw stones. Be strong, Moctezuma. For the arrows are on their way, dipped in their anger. Arrows for your heart. The blood is out. It falls. The empire bleeds. So, Cortez, is your triumph here? You're far from Cuba now. Or the sea. You're in a city on a lake. And the causeways bristle with men. Mexico waits for you, conquistadores. Listen. On the open causeways they fought. The Spaniard hacking his way through. The bridges pulled down. The Aztecs dragging the riders down to the water. And they fought on the bridges and under. Fought with the fury of tigers. The men from the east and these tough warriors. The wind, heavy with the odor of blood. There was no surrender. There was death and pestilence. But there was no surrender. There was ruin and desolation. And a forest of dead covered the valley of Mexico. In the history of conquest, as Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Hitler, and the rest are called great, so Cortez was great. No adventurer was ever more daring. He burnt the ships that brought his little army from Cuba so no man of his could turn back. A handful, stifling in rusty armor, they braved strange mountains, terrible jungles, lived to assassinate a civilization. The Aztecs fell before the gun and the horse, and the slave empire of Moctezuma joined the dust of empires. So the Spaniard raped Indian Mexico and held it in chains for three centuries. Mexicans won back Mexico in the end. But the Spaniards came again. This time, a joke of history by invitation. 
Another shipload of Spaniards has come. Over 2,000 in one ship. Your grandfather is sleeping. I'm not sleeping. What is this about 2,000 in one ship? Don't try to hide it from me. I know. Mexico's been invaded again. No, Grandfather, you don't understand. Someone fetch me my rifle. Grandfather, I listen. I shoot through the window. These people are not our enemies. They've been fighting a civil war in Spain. I know that. You think I'm a fool? The loyalists have been defeated, Grandfather, and we're offering them a home here in Mexico. Spaniards are Spaniards. No, Grandfather, a Spaniard's a man. And there are two kinds of men in the world. Those who march forward and those who march backward. I'm 86 years old. That's the first time in 86 years I've ever heard a member of my family say anything that made sense. Somebody fetch me a glass of wine. <laughs> Once again, the Spaniard invades the Mexican soil. But this time, he does not bring his swords and cannon. I come from Guernica, the holy city of Spain. Hitler and Franco destroyed our city, and now I am here. What work do you do? I teach Mexico how we make wine in Catalonia. I am from Barcelona. I play the violin in the Orquesta Sinfonica Nacional. I used to practice medicine in Madrid. I practice medicine in Mexico City now. I was a teacher in a Spanish university. Today, I teach here in Mexico. I'm an artist, senor. A ham artist. A ham artist? <laughs> That's one thing we never admit back in the States. Oh, see, si, ham artist. I teach Mexico a fine way to cure hams. Food, you know, hams. I've brought what I know. I've brought, too, my hatred for fascism. That hatred is shared by your adopted country, senor. By the people, by 18 million of them, by the workers and their unions, the men and women of professions, the musicians, the painters, all share your hatred of tyranny, your love of freedom. You know, and Mexicans know, that freedom is a prize hard won and easily lost. You know, and Mexicans know, that so long as somewhere freedom does not live, free men must die for it. For 300 years after Cortez, Mexico bowed her head. Then the bones of her ancestors stirred. The Indian blood, the peasant anger stirred again. From the south, the grito de Dolores, the cry of 50,000 peasant voices, thundered their anger against the Mexican skies. Father Miguel Hidalgo, obscure parish priest, the father of Mexican independence. We are resolved to sustain man's inalienable rights. We will sustain these rights by letting rivers of blood, if necessary. Rivers of blood did flow but they left a brief red stain on a conscience of a people. And from his prison cell, a captive priest put by his beads and spoke to the sons of men. O oh, ye who inhabit the earth, be my witness. I call you to behold the crimes which have been here perpetrated and in my deep grief call the whole world to see for itself the pain which is here in my land. Even before the echoes of Hidalgo's lament had died away, a new leader had arisen, a young guerrilla warrior, Jose Maria Morelos. Hidalgo was executed, but over the crash of the rifles, Morelos hurled the people's defiance. America is declared independent of Spain or any other foreign power. The seed was strong. The soil was rich. Another man walked into Mexico... No conquistador, no fiery rider, no great king or his power behind him, but the people's power, Mexico's power, Benito Juarez. And in this city, in the Alameda, a monument stands for this man, and along the Avenida Juarez his ghost still walks. This time the conquistador was within and the people closed their terrible ring. And Emperor Maximilian learned what Cortes did. The soil of Mexico has room for tyrants. Centuries of room. This man Juarez, this lawyer with craggy face and stovepipe hat, 
Lincoln of the lower continent. What fire burned in his silent eye? His hands are hands of a peasant. His face is known a whip. The back too is bent. In school, the Spanish gentlemen turned their backs as if my Indian face was a disease. I am not bitter. I am ashamed for Mexico. Lawyer Juarez. To Governor Juarez. With the wind of war rising among his people. Poverty's war. And Juarez walked through village and city. Searching. Keeping his faith with the people. Taking his strength from the people. For he was one of them. The poor. The proud. Why are the workers on the road chained? Why are the workers in the mines chained? You see, senor, there are reasons. Besides, they are happier that way. So, the Mexican is happier in chains. You think so? Soon you shall hear a noise, senor, greater than thunder. It will be the chains breaking. <laughs> Juarez waits for the hour to strike. Waits like a boatman for the tide. Listens to the stirrings of the people. Juarez could wait. His people had waited for centuries. There was strength in waiting. And the moment had come. Juarez in exile, penniless, leaves his rooming house in New Orleans. Alone, he returns to Mexico, the center of flame. He walks through the jungles alone in his black coat to meet his army. Walking with the strength of hills. Walking with the wheel of history. By foot, by ship. Alone he comes. Welcome home, Wallace. God and liberty. The people rise. The people wake at last. They converge toward the angry cities. The fishermen with their shining knives. The sowers of corn and cane. Farmers with scythes, the straight and the bent. From Indian towns and Spaniard towns, they came giving their blood. And blood soaked the dry earth. And man marched towards the dream of equity. Then it was Presidente Juarez speaking to the ambassador of France. You threaten me with this Maximilian. If he has landed on our coast, as you say, with Napoleon's army, tell him this. The people of the Americas know well how to receive conquerors. Tell him there is room for one more grave in Mexico. Maximilian stands on the hill of bells. In Cerro de los Campanas on this cool morning of June 17, 1867. Facing his appointed rifles. Not all his royal friends could save him. Not all the voices of the sovereign kingdoms who came to plead for him. Juarez listened to the voices as they spoke. Then Juarez spoke. Maximilian must die, senores. Not for revenge, no, not for that. He dies because he is a sign of tyranny. Mexico says to the world, know that as Maximilian dies, so dies his dream and the danger of it. The people have spoken. After Juarez, the scene darkens in Mexico. And to Porfirio Diaz, tyrant, Emiliano, the food is on the table. Why do you sit there in the dark like a frightened wolf? Will you answer me when I ask you a question? I'm not hungry. Then you are sick. No. Don't turn your head away. Look at me toward the light. I... Who did that to you? A Rorale. With his horse whip? Yes. What have you to do with Rorales? 
I was at the farm of Tio Badillo when the Rurales came to take the land. What did you do? I threw a stone at a Rurale. That was a wicked thing to do. It was more wicked for the Rurales to take the land of Tio Badillo. The land of Tio Badillo is part of the Hido. The police of Diaz do not recognize the common land. I think President Diaz is a thief. That is a dangerous thought. I have thought that thought since I was seven. Oh, an old thought, eh? Two years old. Yes. And what will you think when you are 19? I think I will kill many Rurales. And maybe even President Diaz himself. I think you will not live to be a man if you speak those thoughts aloud. Do you understand? But I can speak my thoughts to you. Yes. Yes, you can always speak your thoughts to me when we are alone and the door is closed. Now eat your supper. And let us hear no more of your thoughts until you are a man. A strong man. And to be strong, you must eat. I will eat and I will go strong. And someday the Rurales will run like chickens when they hear the name Emiliano Zapata. In my own office, without an appointment, without any warning, this flea-bitten, ragged, stinking crowd of peasants. Bandits. Bandits worse. A crowd of illiterate villagers who wanted to take action against the Asindados, claiming they were stealing their land. Such claims are common. Uh, the leader of these peasants... As I know, Emiliano Zapata. Yes, well, he had very little to say when I offered to call the police. Then they went quietly enough. They have no appetite for the rurales. They think because they were born on the land that it is theirs. The next thing you know, the parrots will be flying in from the jungles and claiming the mahogany trees are theirs because they were born in them. A parrot can talk, too, you know. <laughs> Emiliano, I have come from the village. They have posted a paper about you in the Plaza de Armas. What does it say? You are banished from the state of Morelos. And you are not permitted to return. On pain of death. They've made me an outlaw. Very well. Others will join us. There are still men in Mexico who do not love a dictator. <laughs> Zapata's white horse pounded like a war drum through the villages. His cry of land and freedom rallied a mighty army. Diaz died and the rich landowners replaced him with Madero. I aren't prepared to grant you full amnesty, Zapata. And more than that, I'm prepared to give you an estate of 150,000 acres. Have you not heard that I'm fighting to restore the land to the people? Yes, I have heard. I'm but... fighting for everyone. Men of Mexico! It is better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. There are those in the state of Morelos today who will tell you that the body publicly exhibited on April 10th, 1919 was not Zapata, but a wax figure. Zapata is not dead, senor. He still rides. The thunder of his horse's hoof shakes the world. He is finishing what he started. Every man will have his own foot of land. And there will be no hungry child anywhere. And the buzzards who live on death will die of starvation. The people march, asking questions. Land is poor. There is no water for the soil. Can we grow food from stone? We have many oil wells, true, but where is work for us? Our children die of disease. Why must that be? There are no schools. Must our children not be able to write their names? They say we are a rich land. Rich for whom? Tell me that. Asking, searching, taking on the democratic stature. Somebody said Mexico is the land of manana. Manana means tomorrow. And tomorrow in Mexico is no longer an excuse. Tomorrow is more now than a promise. Here is a land with the longest yesterday in the new world. And no American nation has so advanced in the third decade of our century. No American people are more solemnly consecrated to the future. Viva la revolución! 
revolution again? Yes. This time it's the National Revolutionary Party, the PNR, the CTM, the Confederation of Mexican Workers. We've arrived at the year 1934. They're cheering the new president, Cardenas, elected by the will of the majority. Cleveland Cardenas! <laughs> In 1910, there were 700 schools in Mexico, all in cities and towns. There were no schools for the children of peasants. By 1935, in the country, in the farm and cattle lands, there were 20,000 schools. The art of Mexico and Mexico's artists. Aztec and Mayan art, colonial, popular, tradition and progress. Orozco, Rivera, Sequeiro, more, many more. Great painting on public walls. Murals, art for everybody, and music for everybody. Rivera, Chavez, the Orchestra Sinfonica Nacional. Popular music, folk music, mariachi, marimba bands, rancheros, boleros, the lovely ballads of the jungles, the plains, the mountains. Song and while we're about it, wine and women. Say nothing of food. I'd like to do a whole series of broadcasts on Mexican cooking. Listen, you can hear the great bell of a cathedral the largest bell on our continent. There's so many things I wish I had the time to talk about today. The street in honor of Louis Pasteur, the Washington Monument here, the Don Quixote Fountain, the auto trailer camp, nightclubs, museums, cathedrals, the stadium, bullfights. Another time I'm going to tell you about Mexico's new president, uh, Camacho, and Padilla's magnificent achievement at the Pan American Conference in Rio. And now it's time to say goodbye. To leave you with a message from the Republic of Mexico. We declare the sincere friendship of the workers and the people of Latin America with the great people of the United States. We defend the same cause, the cause of the people. For this cause, we continue united, and we will be courageous in the future as we have been in the past. Our flag is the Atlantic Charter. Our slogan, the inviolate right of self-determination. Liberty for each nation of the world. Progress for the working people everywhere. Liberation of all mankind. You have been listening to the eighth in a series of programs about the other Americas, in which the Columbia Broadcasting System is presenting Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre. The Columbia Broadcasting System is the originator of South America's network of stations, La Cadena de las Americas. In the Southern Hemisphere, as well as in this hemisphere, CBS provides daily programs of news, entertainment, and recreation to bring about a closer understanding among Americans everywhere. Next week, the ninth program in this series will be brought to you by Orson Welles. Mr. Welles has recently returned from an eight-month visit to the Latin American countries for the office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs. In the cast tonight, Laird Gregar was Montezuma, Hans Conried was Cortez, Ray Collins was Juarez, Lumero Zapata, and Agnes Moorhead, Zapata's mother. Original music tonight was composed by Lucian Maravec and directed by Lud Buskin. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Of course, most of you homemakers listening in know how deliciously good margarine can be today. But some of you may not have used margarine as a spread for bread for a good many years. Well, if that's the case, you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you taste parquet margarine, the margarine that's made by Kraft. That's because parquet margarine is really different from the margarines of a few years back. First, parquet's flavor is pretty certain to please. It's so delicate and wholesome, so deliciously good. You'll be delighted with parquet as a spread for bread or rolls, yes, and for baking and pan-frying, too. 
Second, unlike old-time margarines, parquet margarine is a reliable year-round source of vitamin A because every pound contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. And besides, parquet is an excellent energy food. So try economical parquet margarine in your household and find out how extra good it is yourself. Just ask your food dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now on to Summerfield and the Great Gildersleeve. Saturday afternoon finds him in a flurry of preparation for the expected visit of his old friends, Fibber McGee and Molly. For hours, he's been running up and down stairs, issuing orders and countermanding them, and now he pauses to light a well-earned cigar and snatch a moment's respite from the labor of supervising Bertie. Well, Bertie, how do we stand? Has that roast of beef turned up yet? No, sir. I phoned the market, and they said the bar left with about a half hour ago. Maybe he's been hijacked. Yeah. Well, we'll give him a few more minutes. How about the sleeping arrangements? I did like Miss Marjorie said. I'm giving Miss McGee your room. That's right. And Mr. McGee gets the den. I hope he'll be comfortable. He doesn't have to be comfortable. That guy can sleep standing up. <laughs> what about me? Where do I go? <laughs> well, uh, you sort of get the sewing room, Mr. Gilsley. <laughs> I knew at the sewing room I'll be on pins and needles all night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sir. I got you all fixed up snug there on Leroy's folding camp cot. Yeah, the last time I camped on that cot, it folded all right. <laughs> You remember? Well, I got it fixed up now, Mr. Gillsleeve. I got it tied up with some string. Oh, fine. I'll sleep like a baby. Yes, sir. I'll bet I'll be asleep before my head hits the floor. <laughs> oh, Marjorie, is that you? It's me, Uncle. Huh? Marjorie's coming. She's outside talking to some guy that brought her home from the plant. How was the movie? Uh, Bertie, take this book upstairs with you when you go, will you? Yes, sir. I saw a white cargo. <laughs> it's about this guy. Oh, good. And uh, put that book on the table next to the bed, Bertie. Mrs. McGee might want to read before she goes to sleep. It's about this guy goes to Africa, and he runs into Hedy Lamar down there, mooching around the jungle. Yep. So the heat begins to get him. Only yep. I forgot to tell you, Walter Pigeon is there. He's running the camp. That's Mr. Miller, only in this picture his name is Witzel. <laughs> oh, hello, my dear. Hello, are they here yet? So, uh, so, so Witzel says to this new guy... Not yet. Their train's doing about a half an hour. So Witzel says to this guy... Witzel, that's Walter Pigeon. Leroy, I haven't got time to listen to all that now. Well, you asked me how was the movie. I'll be more careful next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're early, Marjorie. Yes, I got a ride, so I didn't have to wait for the bus. We picked up Leroy just as he was coming out of the theater. Yeah, tell him who picked you up. Marjorie's got a new fella. Yes. Nobody picked me up. And I have not. That's no way to talk about your sister, young man. One of the men from the plant very kindly offered to drive me home, that's all. Who's on his way? Yeah. Mike, she calls him. That just happens to be his name. She's only been there working there a week, and already it's Mike. Hiya, Mike. Hiya, baby. <laughs> now, come on, now, don't you listen to him. <laughs> very nice, though, really. He works in the drafting department. Oh, well, that's fine. He's a draftsman, all right. If you ask me, he's got designs on our nail. <laughs> Leroy, you mind your own business. I've got something to say to both of you. Yes, Uncle Mort? When Mr. McGee arrives this afternoon, there are two things I want you to be careful not to do. In the first place, I don't want you to make any reference to Fibber's size. What about it? Well, he's a little runt, and like all little runts, <laughs> he's sort of sensitive about it. That's why he's so pugnacious. Oh, I wouldn't say anything, Uncle Mort. Well, I know you wouldn't, my dear, but I'm not so sure about Leroy. <laughs> Did I say anything about him being a runt? You're the one who brought it up. Well, just don't, that's all. Actually, he's not so small anyway. It's just that he's not as big as he thinks he is. <laughs> he has the mind of a small man, that's all. <laughs> Always carrying a chip on his shoulder. Oh, we'll be careful, Uncle Moore. And another thing, and this applies to both of you. I'd rather you didn't say anything about my engagement to Mrs. Ransom. Oh, but the McGees are your friends, Uncle Moore. They'll be offended. We're not you. announcing the engagement just yet, my dear. We're uh, keeping it a secret. Mrs. Ransom isn't. I heard her talking to Mrs. Pettibone down at the grocery. We're not announcing it to McGee, and that's final, Leroy. Because if I know McGee, he'll start making cracks. <laughs> if he makes any cracks about Lita, I'll punch him in the nose. And if I do that, Molly will be upset, and if she's upset, it'll spoil the whole weekend. And that's what you get for inviting McGee anyway. <laughs> He hasn't had a chance to open his mouth. Well, I know, McGee, his mouth is open right this minute. <laughs> You'll see, he'll arrive here in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> Nobody will be able to get a word in all weekend. If 
he ever finds out about me and Leela, he'll be like a Scotty with a bone. Oh, Uncle Mort, you're being silly. Well, he isn't going to come in here as my guest and bandy so-called witticisms at my expense. I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. But just keep the whole thing dark, if you don't mind. Come on, it's time to go get him. Can I go, Uncle? Uh, no, Leroy, there's something else I want you to do. What's that? I want you, in the interest of peace, to go out in the garage, get the lawnmower, and hide it. <laughs> This is it, folks. It's no palace, but it's home to me. What do you think of it, Molly? Oh, it's a lovely place, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, nice hunk of property you got here, Gildy. A hundred foot front by a hundred and seventy-five deep. Well, that ought to give you room to spread out. (laughs) (laughs) And I can see that you have. (laughs) What was that, little chum? McGee, watch it. Hmm. Hey, Throcky, uh, who lives next door there? Next door? Oh, some woman. I uh, forget her name. Uh, Mrs. Ransom. R- R- oh, yes. Is that it? <laughs> She's a widow. Oh, so? Uh, widow woman, eh? Give you much trouble? Uh, no, no. <laughs> As a matter of fact... Marjorie, uh, suppose you run in and ask Leroy to come out and help with the bags. Uh, that's a good girl. <laughs> you know, I think nice neighbors make all the difference in the world. So do bad ones. <laughs> We had one once who borrowed our lawnmower and kept it so long he finally had to leave town. <laughs> and he took the lawnmower with him. McGee, if you've come all the way to Summerfield to open up old wounds... You want me out? Oh, yes. Come here, my boy. Well, well, this must be little Leroy. Yes. <laughs> Leroy, I want you to meet Mrs. McGee, a very dear friend of mine. How do you do? My, he's a fine-looking lad, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, and this is Mr. McGee. Hi, bud. Gosh, I had no idea you were such a big kid. Gosh, I had no idea you were so big either. (laughs) What do you mean by that? Well, you're not such a little runt. I'm told me... Leroy! (laughs) I'm just building him up, huh? Well, cut it out. Never mind him, Leroy. If you eat your oatmeal and cod liver oil regularly, someday you may be as big and fat as your uncle. (laughs) Are you kidding? (laughs) None of your impudence, young man. Out, oh, Gildersleeve, the boy meant no harm. He's plainly the victim of an unfortunate environment, that's all. <laughs> well, let's go inside, shall we, where the environment is warmer. Oh, yes, by all means. Uh, Leroy, you go get the bags out of the car. By George, I tell you folks, it's wonderful to have you here. This is just like old times. Oh, it's good to be here, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Let me take your coat, Mrs. McGee. Oh, thank you. Where will I put mine, Trocky? Well, I'll take it. Just hang it up here in the hall closet. McGee. What, Molly? You see that closet? That's what I mean. <laughs> well, sure, anybody can keep a closet clean <coughs> if they don't use it. Mr. McGee, if you'd like to come upstairs, I'll show the room you're, you're to have. Oh, thank you, dearie. I would like to freshen up a little before dinner. Uh, dinner's in about a half an hour, everybody. Hey, where do these bags go? Uh, Mr. McGee's bag goes in the den, and Mrs. McGee's goes up in my room. Here. I'll take it up to her. Uh, hey, Sonny, is there any place around here where a fellow could buy a toothbrush? I came off without one, as usual. Well, sure, there's a drugstore right down the street about three blocks. Good, I may run down there a little later. Well, what have you been doing with yourself all day? I went to the movies this afternoon. Uh-huh. White Cargo, have you seen it? No, that's one I missed. Well, this guy goes to Africa, and he can't stand the heat. Uh-huh. So he and Walter Pigeon get mad at each other, and Walter Pigeon says, you'll quit. And he says, I will not. Uh-huh. So he goes off by himself and plays the phonograph, and then he... Well, uh, look, uh, on second thought, maybe I better go right now and get that toothbrush. <laughs> Wait on. I'm just getting to where Hedy Lamar comes in. Oh. Well, I'll wait for that. <laughs> Well, he's playing his phonograph there, yeah. and it's getting all dark and spooky. And he looks out the door, and all of a sudden, what does he see? Hedy Lamar. Yeah, only you'd never know her. Huh? She's got a sort of a thing around her. And she comes in like this. Uh, look, you're Walter Pigeon, and I'm Hedy Lamar. Well, if you're Hedy Lamar, I guess I can pass for Walter Pigeon. <laughs> Shoot the plot to me, Todd. Well, she slides around the edge of the door like this, uh-huh. and she says... I am Tondaleo. <laughs> well, look, Rondaleo. I've got to run down to the corner and get a toothbrush. Hey, wait! I'll be right back. Well, this is the best part. Whistle comes in and catches her. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Peavy. Good night. 
And now, what can I do for you, sir? I'd like to buy a toothbrush. A toothbrush? Mm -hmm. Uh, Did you have any particular kind of toothbrush in mind? (laughs) Yes, uh, something I could brush my teeth with. (laughs) As a matter of fact, I don't really need a toothbrush. I've got one at home, but I came away without it. Oh, yeah. Uh, None of it's perfect. Uh, (laughs) You say you're a stranger in town? Uh, I didn't say so, but I am. McGee's my name. I'm staying up the street here. Oh, I'm pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. McGee. My name is Peavy. Anytime I can be of service, only too glad. Oh, thanks. I- I'd like to buy a toothbrush. Any, uh, any particular kind? Co- oh, I asked you that, didn't I? Yes. Well, I have a number of varieties. I have them in red, green, white, small, medium, large. Now, give me a red one. And uh, then they come in the nylon bristle, the exton bristle, the proton bristle, and... Uh, they're just plain bristles. Look, Bud, I just want a toothbrush. I want to brush my teeth. Well, here's a nice brush. I'll take that one. Well, I don't want you to feel I'm high-pressuring you. I, it's just... Wrap me. it up. Yes, sir. Uh, will there be anything else? No, that's... Oh, wait a minute. Seems to me Molly did mention something. Oh, I know. We're spending the weekend with a fellow up the street here, and I'd like to get a little something for him as a gift. Uh, what type of gentleman is he? Oh, he's a big, fat blowhard. (laughs) Doesn't do much of anything but eat, sleep, and brag. (laughs) I've got something here that I think uh, Mr. Gildersleeve would like. (laughs) You know him. Oh, yes, he's in here almost every day. And I think if you really want to surprise him... A nice package of bubble bath would do the trick. Gilder's sleeve in a bubble bath? Boy, he'd look like a blimp coming out of a cloud. Well, of course, it wouldn't make much of a wedding gift, if that's what you have in mind. Wedding gift? For Gilder's sleeve? Well, haven't you heard? He's engaged to marry his next-door neighbor, Mrs. Ransom. Rocky, engaged? Yes. Oh, tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> What'd you say her name was? Uh, Mrs. Ransom. Leela <coughs> Ransom. Widow. Oh, the widow next door. Uh-huh. <coughs> the one he said he never met. Didn't even know her name. The big fake. What's she like? Well, she's a southern lady. Uh, very well preserved. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Let me at him. Here, what do I owe you? Uh-uh, that'll be 77 cents. Uh, cheapest toothbrush I ever bought. Well, so long, bud, and many thanks. Well, just then Walter Pigeon comes in from the jungle and catches Hetty slipping in the poison. Heavenly day. Leroy, that'll be quite enough now. Oh, now, don't <laughs> discourage the boy, Mr. Gildersleeve. Discourage him? I only wish I knew how. Hi, folks. McGee, where on earth have you been? Oh, just down the corner. <laughs> Say, you look like the cat that swallowed the canary. You know that you've kept dinner waiting 15 minutes? Oh, that's perfectly all right. Leroy, run out and tell Bertie she can serve at any time now, will you? McGee, have you washed? <laughs> McGee, what's got into you? Yes, what are you looking at? <laughs> Hi, Rocky. Yeah. Hello. How's every little thing? How are you feeling? Uh, I feel all right. Why? Everything under control? Certainly. What do you hear from Lulu? <laughs> Lulu? Who's Lulu? McGee, what on earth are you talking? When are we going to meet her, Rocky? Meet who? The Queen of Sheba. Scarlett O'Hara. That widow you're going to marry. Oh! <laughs> Mary? Mr. Gildersleeve? Leroy? On a I didn't say a thing. Marjorie? Now, keep Uncle Lord, I swear. If you knew Lulu like I know Lulu. <laughs> Her name is not Lulu. Oh. No, it's Leela. Leela. Lee is a leave her out of this, and La is in lots of people get a punch in the nose. <laughs> That's just what you're going to get if you ever so much as... Why, you big bumbling balloon. Come over here, and I'll let the air You muscle bound <laughs> McGee. McGee. Dinner. Saved by the band. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. You know, especially in times like these, it's smart to be economical. But when it comes to food buying, it's important to be wisely economical. 
to be sure that the economy foods you buy fulfill the requirements of good nutrition. Now, one food that's both economical and highly nutritious is wholesome parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet margarine, you know, is one of the kinds of foods recommended in our government's nutrition food rules. That's because parquet is so nourishing, having both food energy and important vitamin A. And what's more, parquet helps provide these essential food elements in so many ways. It's a delicious spread for bread or toast or rolls. It's a tasty seasoning for hot vegetables. It's a real flavor shortening for baking. And it's grand for pan frying, too. Yes, in all these ways, parquet margarine adds delicious nourishment to meals. So tomorrow, ask your food dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine made by Kraft. And now, what of the great Gildersleeve? Well, it's Sunday morning, and the great man has come down to enjoy his usual outsize Sunday breakfast. He walks into the dining room, sniffing the air like a bird dog in a hot scent. Uh, uh, that's funny. The stuff must be here, but I can't smell it. <laughs> Birdie? Yes, yeah, Mr. Gillsleeve? Where's breakfast? Well, Mr. Gillsleeve, Miss Marjorie told me y'all would wait until Mr. and Ms. McGee came down. I never heard of such a thing. Marjorie? Yes, for goodness sake, Uncle Lord, now be quiet. Think of our guests. I am thinking of them. I'm thinking, why don't they get up? Oh, the idea. Anyone would think you hadn't eaten for a month. That's exactly the way I feel. When I think of that little termite, McGee, probably lying up there in bed right now, just on purpose to keep me for my breakfast. Who's that? I'll go. Well, good morning, Judge. Oh, Hooker, come right in. I'm glad to see you. I can't stay, but I've heard the news from Leela Ransom, and as your ex-rival, I simply wish to tender my congratulations. Oh, thank you, Judge. After thinking it over, Throckmorton, I feel sure that Leela's heart has guided her to the right choice. Oh, you think so, eh? Well, I hope so. Uh, by the way, I'm giving a little party for Leela this afternoon. I hope you can come, Horace. I'd love to. I hope you'll make Leela very happy, Gildy. Well, I'll try. Fine. Uh, Throckmorton, yes. have you, um... Uh, have you given Leela any kind of uh, token? Uh, token? Well, as a symbol of your plight at draw. It's customary, you know, to give the lady... Hooker, a... are you trying to peddle a second-hand engagement ring? <laughs> no, certainly not. Then what are you talking about? It's not second-hand. <laughs> Leela's never even seen it. This ring has never encircled a human finger. Then why don't you take it back to the jeweler? Well, for sentimental reasons, I wanted you to have it. Uh... Besides, I had Leela's name put on it. Oh, well, what'd you pay for it? Seventy-five dollars. I'll give you fifty. It's robbery, but I'll take it. Well, I want to see it first. Well, here it is. Oh, that's quite a flash. Wait a minute, what's this inside of it, this inscription? Oh, yes. To Leela from Cuddles. No, I thought... I forgot to mention that. Hooker, did Leela Ransom ever call you Cuddles? No, Gildy, but I just hope she'd learn to. Uh, well, obviously the ring is of no use to me, but I'll give you $25 for it. $25? $25, Judge, take it or leave it. I'll take it. But what are you going to do about the inscription? Well, if I play my cards right, she might learn to call me Cuddles. <laughs> <laughs> Yoo-hoo, anybody around? Hey, don't tell me I'm the first one up. First one up, your clavicle. <laughs> I've been up for three hours. I waited breakfast for you till ten o'clock. I'll tell Bertie you're ready. Oh, I've had breakfast, if that's what you mean. If you've had it? Yeah, had breakfast in bed. You? I tell you, it was quite a treat. Things ain't like that around Wistful Vista. Things ain't like that around here, either. <laughs> Bertie? Yeah, yeah? Why don't I ever get breakfast in bed? Because breakfast is the only thing that gets you out of bed, Mr. Gilsey. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Well, maybe when you're mad, Mr. Gillsleeve, things will be different. Yeah. You'll have to toe the mark then, Throcky. By the way, uh, when are we going to meet Lulu? The name is Leela. Oh, excuse me. Uh, when are we going to get a gander at her? What's the matter? You're not ashamed of her, are you? Look here, McGee. You're not even boys, fit to... Boys, boys. So early in the morning? Oh, good morning, Mrs. McGee. i just telling my little chum here I can't wait to have you meet Leela. Well, we can't wait either, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> That's no lie. Yeah. <laughs> She's coming over this afternoon for tea, and I'm having one or two others in. Uh, Judge Hooker. Oh, how are you and the judge getting along these days? Well, we have our ups and downs. Some days I think he's our purest little jurist, and others I think he's a stench to the bench. <laughs> you know, I'm very anxious to meet him, too. He sounds like such fun. Yeah, more fun than a goat. Yeah. McGee, what do you say to a little constitutional before lunch? A little what? A little constitutional, a little walk. On foot? Why, sure. I'd like to take you out and show you the reservoir. Go on, McGee, to do you good. How far is it? Oh, only about four miles. Are you kidding? 
McGee, I want you to keep away from Leroy for the rest of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is quite an occasion, yeah. quite an occasion. Everybody here now but the guest of honor. Where's Leela, Gildy? Uh, Leela, oh, she'll be along any minute, Judge. You know, Judge, I've heard a lot about you from our friend Gildersleeve here. Have you? I've heard a lot about you, too, Mr. McGee. Well, I'll tell you what he said about you if you'll tell me what he said about me. <laughs> McGee, you're a guest here. I've never said anything behind your back, little chum, that I haven't said to your face. Oh, so that's the way you talk about me behind my back. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, folks. That must be Leela. I'll go, I'll hey, go. Never mind, Leroy. I'll open it. Don't bother. I'll go. Leroy, you hurt me. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, I can't wait to meet her. Just think, McGee. Mr. Gildersleeve in love. Yeah. Staggers the imagination. <laughs> Boy, they're taking long enough. <laughs> wonder what's going on out there. McGee, you stay right here. Well, I just thought maybe he needed some help. He doesn't need any help. <laughs> okay. Quiet, here they come. Hey, looks like Gildy done all right for himself. wonder what he used for bait. <laughs> Uh, Leela, darling, you know most of these people. Oh, yes. Good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon, Leela. Oh, Marjorie, honey, I love your dress. Oh, thank you. Hello, Leroy. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. <laughs> <laughs> Leroy, uh, my dear, I want you to meet some old, old friends of mine. We're not that old. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. and Mrs. McGee from Wistful Vista. This is Leela. Oh, I'm just thrilled to meet y'all. Drock Martin's told me so much about you. I reckon you must think I'm just terrible carrying him off like this. Dearie, I think it's the finest thing that ever happened to him. And I want to be the first to congratulate oh, you. thank you. Oh, isn't that nice? Well, McGee, aren't you going to congratulate Leela? Why should I congratulate her? It's Gildersleeve that ought to be congratulated. <laughs> Oh, you're just sweet talking me now, Mr. McGee. Oh, shuck, sis. Just call me Fibber. <laughs> Mr. Gilfleet, excuse me. Could you come out in the kitchen for a minute? Oh, certainly, Bertie. Will you excuse me, folks? Go right on talking. What's wrong now, Bertie? You know, I just can't get over Mr. Gildersleeve after all the years we've known him falling in love. Uh, tell us, dearie, now that it's all over, how did he propose to you? Yeah. Did he get down on his knees? And if he did, who helped him up? McGee. <laughs> Now, this is just between us women. Well, it was terribly romantic and all. It was in the evening, and he came with a beautiful bunch of roses. Oh, sure. You hear that, dearie? Roses he brought her. What's the matter? <laughs> I bought you some roses a couple of anniversaries ago. <laughs> well, I just want you to make a note of it. Oh. Go on, dear. Well, I, I remember I just happened to be wearing a gown that he particularly liked. <coughs> a, a flowered chiffon, very tight through here with a long flowing skirt. I've been planning to spend the evening with a good book. Go on, you'll get plenty of time for that later. <laughs> Well, uh, we were standing there together arranging the flowers, and all of a sudden, right out of the blue, he said, well, I don't know that he'd like me telling you, but he said, what would you do if I was to steal a little kiss? Oh, my God. <laughs> Is that corny? Keep out of this, McGee. You don't understand. And then what? Well, naturally, I tried my utmost to discourage him, but seemed like he just refused to take no for an answer. Oh, not only that, he started to chase me around the room. <laughs> right, Martin, I couldn't understand it. Uh, look, Leela, uh, when did you first begin to suspect that uh, something was cooking? <laughs> When he sang to me, just a little love, a little kiss. Just a little love. <laughs> <laughs> just a little. <laughs> Is everybody happy? What's going on, folks? Hey, what's the big joke? Nothing, Mr. Gildersleeve. Nothing at all. McGee, go on outside till you can control yourself. Come on, get out of here. Oh, I hear any more of us. <laughs> Leroy, show me where I get a glass of water, will you? Right out here. Leela, what's wrong with McGee? I don't know, Throckmorton. I was just telling them about our engagement and how you proposed to me, and uh. all of a sudden something seemed to strike him funny. 
Leela is nothing sacred to you. Now, Mr. Gildersleeve, don't be blaming her. Is our romance nothing but a farce to be torn to tatters for the amusement of the mob? Oh, no, Throckmorton. Am I nothing to you but a laughing stock? Oh, no. Well, that's the impression I seem to get. Now, listen, don't be blaming it on her, Mr. Gildersleeve. Blame it on McGee. Huh? And now, listen, remember... Every proposal is sweet to the woman who hears it. Mm, isn't that a fact? Uh, tell me, Mrs. McGee, how did Mr. McGee propose to you? McGee? <laughs> <laughs> well, dearie, McGee proposed in a leaky canoe. Yeah. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Which he had to paddle with his mandolin because he lost the paddle. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. And the song he sang to me was Pretty Red Wing. Yeah, Pretty Red Wing. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this Summerfield water tastes a little funny, doesn't it, Gildy? It does not. You can say what you want to about me, McGee, but Summerfield has the finest water in the country. McGee, stop picking fights. You've made enough trouble already. Who's picking fights? I just made a simple observation, that's all. Well, you're a bad boy. Come over here. What do you want? I want you to apologize to Mr. Gildersleeve. Go on, tell him you're sorry you hurt his feelings. Okay. Throcky, old chum, I'm sorry. Uh, well, that's all right, McGee. I know you're sensitive, and it's only natural. And I want to take this opportunity to say that where you're concerned, old chum, there's only one thing in this world I want. Oh, uh, what's that? Just a little love, a little <laughs> All right, McGee. All the moon shines tonight on hey, Green <laughs> Well, it's certainly been, been nice having you folks here, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> well, it's, it's been nice being here, Mr. Gildersleeve, and meeting Marjorie and little Leroy and Leela and all. I think Leela's going to make you very happy. Yeah, Throcky, she seems like a mighty nice gal. Well, I'm glad you both liked her. Well, goodbye, old chum. Thanks for the use of the den. Oh, yes, I hope you were very comfortable there. Oh, it was fine, but there's just one thing I'd suggest, Throcky. Huh? If you go to take a shower there, be careful. Why? You might cut your feet on my lawnmower. Oh! <laughs> Leroy! Good night. <laughs> Good night, all. Good night. Yeah. Harold McGee and Molly appeared on this program to the courtesy of the makers of Johnson's Wax. Original music was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the makers of Kraft Cheese and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Six o'clock, Mother's late. That means the family will have to wait for dinner. But they won't wait long if Mother's smart and knows the seven-minute way to make macaroni and cheese. The trick is performed with a product called Kraft Dinner. Yes, folks, that amazing food product called Kraft Dinner gives you delicious macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. A package of Kraft Dinner contains a special kind of macaroni that cooks up fluffy and tender extra fast. And the Kraft Dinner package also holds some Kraft Grated. This craft grated, sprinkled through and through the macaroni, gives it good cheese flavor in a twinkling. No time used up preparing a cheese sauce or baking the macaroni either. Keep craft dinner handy for luncheon or dinner emergencies. And folks, you can help your dealer with this problem of keeping in stock by ordering craft dinner early in the week. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. From New York City where we are playing to an audience of men on leave from the armed services and starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Dennis A. Rochester, yours truly, Don Wilson, and our guest conductor, Benny Goodman. It gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce the Bob Hope of the Great Not Place program, Jack Benny! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, what do you mean the Bob Hope of the Great Nuts Place program? I don't get it. 
Well, after all, Jack, there are a lot of similarities between you and Bob Hope. Aren't there, Mary? Of course there are. Oh, yeah? Name one. Well, for one thing, he's on the radio and you're on the radio. True, true. And he's a comedian and you're a comedian. Yes. And Hope started in Vaudeville and you started in Vaudeville. That's right. And Hope makes pictures at Paramount and Paramount kicks you out. <laughs> true. Now, wait a minute. I wasn't thrown out of Paramount. Then why did you leave? I asked them to put a shower in my dressing room. They punched holes in the roof. It didn't rain for 40 days, so I quit. <laughs> anyway, I made some swell pictures of Paramount, especially my last one, For Whom the Bell Told. Oh, now, hold on, Jack. Gary Cooper plays the lead in For Whom the Bell Told. Well, he might play the lead, but that bell doesn't ring by itself, brother. <laughs> I'm the guy, listen, Don, I'm I'm the guy that pulls that rope. <laughs> they had a rope at Paramount, they'd have hung you a long time ago. No, oh, what are you talking about? Say, Mr. Benny, I took your violin over to get oh, a new... hello. Hello, Dennis. Hello. Say, Mr. Benny, I took your violin over to get a new bridge put on it like you told me to. What did, what did you say, Dennis? I said I took your violin over to get a new bridge put on it like you told me to. Oh, a new bridge on my violin, eh? How does it look? Well, I think the man overdid it a little. There's water running under it. <laughs> water under the bridge? Let's see that violin. Well, I'll be darned. There is a that. Putting in the goldfish was my idea. <laughs> well, that's a fine fix you put me in. Now I'll have to use another fiddle for my performance tonight. You see, fellas, my agent booked me as the uh, guest violinist on a program later this evening. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, what program is it? Well, if they want Jack to play the fiddle, it must be a shortwave broadcast to Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> it is not. It's a coast-to-coast hookup. And as long as I've got that water under the bridge, I'm going to play the Blue Daniel. <laughs> and for a finish, you can eat the goldfish. <laughs> Just tune in to Fred Allen, sister. I'll do all right. I think Mr. Benny is one of the finest violinists I ever heard. Thanks, Dennis. I've got a job, and I'm going to keep it, by golly. <laughs> all right, kid. You gave me a beautiful compliment. Don't spoil it. Now, it's about time for your song, so let's have it. Okay. Say, Mr. Benny, I'll probably get slugged for this. Hmm. But when I got my check this week, there was something wrong with it. What do you mean there was something wrong with it? Well, I'll probably get slugged for this. Stop saying that. <laughs> what was wrong with your check? Well, you took 5% off. What was that for? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked me that, kid. I've been meaning to explain it to you. Uh, Mary and Don, you might as well listen to this, too. Uh, since January 1st, 5% of all salaries and wages have been uh, withheld at the source. This has been officially designated as the victory tax. Oh, I get it. You deduct the money from our salaries and send it to Washington. Exactly. Is that clear to you, Dennis? Well, I'll probably get slugged for this. Will you stop <laughs> saying that? Well, how do I know you turn this money into the government? I have to turn it in. That's the idea of it. And here's another important point for everybody. Patriotic Americans will not let this new and necessary tax interfere in any way with the commitments they have made for the regular purchase of war bonds. In Canada, folks should buy victory bonds and war-saving stamps. And now, Dennis, let's have your song. <laughs> Sir, that was Moonlight Becomes You, sung by Dennis Day, our own Irish Bluebird. And very good, Dennis. Irish Bluebird? Green is the color for the Irish, Mr. Benny. I know, I know. You know now. <laughs> I always did know. But if you want to be so technical, kid, you're an Irishman that's been out in the cold. You're a little blue. That makes you a blue blur. Well, speaking of birds, Jack, I have a very clever message which involves our feather dress. <laughs> Would you like to hear it? Why? I mean, why surely, Don? <laughs> Go ahead. Now, see how many different birds you can pick out. Different birds? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, you can always sparrow enough money for grape nuts flakes. As they are very pheasant, 
and easy to swallow. Well, they're sparrow, pheasant, and swallow. Go ahead. Whether you're a boy or a girl, you will eagerly await grape nut flakes each morning. Well, there's gull and eagle. Because they contain the cock. <laughs> because they contain iron, niacin, and vitamin B1. Well, that's very good, Don. Yes, considering I have a cold, cock a tooth. <laughs> You. And down that was swell. I thought everybody enjoyed it. <laughs> hey, I uh, I got a bird in there too. Here comes another one right from the Bronx. <laughs> Mary. And now, fellas, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll let you handle the rest of the program. I want to drop over and see Phil Baker at the hospital. Phil Baker? Oh, yes, I missed him on his program. What's he in the hospital for? Well, Phil went to the doctor to have his appendix examined. That's right. So he asked the doctor to take it or leave it, and he took it. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's exactly the way it happened, but he had his appendix out, and he's a pretty sick guy. Well, if he's so sick, this is no time to try and collect that $64 you didn't win when you were on his program. <laughs> Listen, Mary, technically, I did win. He didn't pay me, that's all. Well, I'll probably get slugged for this. There he goes. Well, I'll probably get slugged for this, but I don't understand what you're talking about. Now, look, kid, a few weeks ago, Phil Baker beat me out of $64. That I have to see. <laughs> well, he did. Now, wait a minute, Jack. I heard the program you were on. And when Phil asked you the $64 question, he gave the wrong answer. I gave the right answer. Phil asked me if I could name 37 composers who tried to finish Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. And I said, no, I couldn't. That's the right answer. <laughs> I'm going to the hospital now and straighten this thing out with Baker. Well, you'll never catch him when he's weaker. <laughs> That's a point in my favor. Can I come along with you, Mr. Benny? What do you want to go to the hospital for? Well, maybe Mr. Baker has a beautiful nurse and I'll fall madly in love with her and ask her to marry me and she'll turn me down and I'll commit suicide. <laughs> what an imagination. Well, all right, you can come with me, kid. Now, where's, uh, where's Benny Goodman? Right here, Jack. See, Jack, did you see my clarinet? Right now, it's right there behind your ear. He wears it like a pencil, folks. <laughs> uh, Benny, have you got a nice hot tune prepared for us? Yeah, I'm going to play one of the numbers I'm doing at the Paramount Theater this week. Oh, you had to give yourself a little plug, huh? <laughs> a little advertising, huh? Well, at least my hat stand doesn't say movie star on it like yours does. <laughs> All right. Trying to get the more... The more... He hasn't been more weak. He has Uh, very nice of you to call because I haven't seen Rochester in nearly a week. Do you happen to know where he is? Who? Rochester. Oh, that friend of mine. Yeah. Where has he been? That boy loves you, Mr. Benny. He really does. Uh-huh. Well, he went down to your hotel yesterday morning ready to work. That boy loves you. I know, I know. You said that random. Well, he's got right in front of your hotel ready to work. When he finally realized he'd forgotten his typewriter. His typewriter? What does he need a typewriter for? Doesn't he like your program? <laughs> no. Now listen, Mr. Brown, or Random, or Harvest, or whatever your name is, tell that boy that loves me to be at my hotel tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Okay. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye. Imagine making up such a ridiculous name as Random Harvest Brown. Fine chance he had to fool me. Come on, Dennis, let's go. Wait a minute, I'm going with you. All right, come on. Play, Benny.
be there pretty soon now. What hospital is Mr. Benny in, Mr. Baker? I'm Mr. Benny. Bill Baker's in the Northwest Side Hospital on 83rd Street. Oh. You know, Mary, if I collect that 64 bucks, you and I'll go out stepping. I love those nightclubs. You haven't been to a nightclub since the time you drank champagne out of Lillian Russell's slipper. <laughs> She had a small shoe, but I got loaded. <laughs> hey, hey, driver, step on it, will you? Your wish is my command. Well, well, polite fellow, isn't he? Can't understand why Baker's still in bed. Well, the operation was only two weeks ago. Look, when I had my tonsil taken out, I went home the next day. You never left the house. Why just took him out with a can opener? <laughs> He used regular instruments. Gee whiz, Mr. Benny, did Rochester really take your tonsils out? There was nothing to it. Snip, snip. Driver, a little faster, please. We want to get there. It is yours to request, mine to obey. <laughs> well, thanks. My, isn't he formal? Say, Jack, can't we stop at this little restaurant up here and get something to eat? I'm starving. Me too. We can eat at the hospital. Baker's room will be full of fruit and candy and nuts. <laughs> Hey, driver, that's the hospital right ahead, isn't it? It is mine to drive, yours to point out. Oh, stop. <laughs> this is it, all right. Well, here we are. How much do I owe you, driver? That'll be 65 cents, or one dollar, including tips. <laughs> Wait a minute, what makes you think I'm going to give you a 35-cent tip? It is mine to dream, yours to disillusion. <laughs> Just for that, here's a dollar. Goodbye, driver. Goodbye. If you like me, tell your friend. If not, not. <laughs> here's the main entrance. Let's go in. It's a beautiful hospital. Wow, what a big lobby. Wow, what a big lobby. That echo again. He's got a cold tonight. <laughs> I'm Jack Benny. I'm Jack Benny. You try it, Dennis. I'm Dennis Day. I'm Dennis Day. Now you, Mary. I'm Mary Livingston. With a cold like this, I got to do a bane. <laughs> Fine echo. <laughs> here's the uh, here's the information desk. I'll find out where to go. Say, Miss. Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell me what room Mr. Phil Baker's in? I'm Jack Benny. So I see by your hat band. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, now, what, uh, what's Phil Baker's room number? He's on the fourth floor, blue eyes. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, kids. Here's the elevator. Go on up. Step right in, please. Go on up. <laughs> Say, Jack, that guy sounds just like Rochester. Yeah, he does at that. What's your name, buddy? Brown. Brown of all the Brown. Well, I'll be darned. Second floor, sprained ankle, four larges, one on the knee, four That's not us. Go on up. I can't get over that boy. Say, Random, do you know a fellow named Rochester? That boy really loves you, Mr. Bill. <laughs> hmm, he knows me. Third floor, dog bite, frog bite, snake bite, mosquito bite, and finally Danny A to the bar. <laughs> I can't get over that boy. Oh, Positively amazing. I swear it was Rochester. All floors, scratches from cats, scratches from berry bushes, scratches from matches to mobile. <laughs> and the physics. That's a science operator. Oh, I don't have to read. I just run the elevator. <laughs> Hmm, I can't, I can't get over. Now, let's see, where's, uh, 
Where's Phil's room? Uh, it must be down this corridor. Oh, yes. Hmm? Dr. Jones reports surgery. Dr. Jones reports surgery. We finally located your glasses. Yep. Where they were. <laughs> This is uh, Phil Baker's room here with the star on the door. Boy, is he hammy. Now, Jack, for heaven's sake, don't mention the $64 right away. Don't worry. I know how to handle it. <laughs> well, hello, Phil. How are you? Hello, Phil. How are you, Mr. Baker? Hello, kids. Glad you dropped in. <laughs> Dennis, stop applauding. Well, Phil, uh... Phil, old boy. <laughs> well, Phil, uh, Phil, old boy, you're you're looking great. How do you feel? Well, I'll probably get slugged for this, but I feel fine. <laughs> Why should I slug you? I just came up to see how you were getting along. Wish you luck and uh, talk over a little matter of uh, sixty-four dollars. Well, that's sweet of you, Jack, but I don't need any money. <laughs> well, you see, Phil, I was talking to my lawyer last week, and he thinks I have a he thinks I have a pretty good case. Did you make off like you fell in the subway again? I thought you gave up that racket. <laughs> I'm not suing the subway. Now look, Phil, you owe me sixty four dollars and I want it right now. Now, come on, hand it over. Jack, will you please take your knee out of my incision? <laughs> oh, pardon me. Now, Phil, you give me that $64 or you'll be sorry. Get it? On your program, you'll be sorry. Oh, Jack, be more subtle. Subtle schmuckle. I want my money. <laughs> now, Phil... Pardon me, Mr. Baker. Did I give you three little white pills about an hour ago? Yes, you did. <laughs> hmm. Who's that? That's Miss Stewart, my nurse. She's awfully absent-minded. Yeah, she seems to be, huh? Eh? Yesterday, she poured alcohol on my pancakes and rubbed my back with maple syrup. <laughs> Alcohol on pancakes? I was so cocked I fell out of bed four times. <laughs> well, that's awful. She really is asking my This morning, she gave me a shot in the arm with a fountain pen. <laughs> a fountain pen? Never shot. <laughs> that he remembered. <laughs> Now, listen, Phil, speaking of $64... Who's speaking of $64? Look, Phil, I know you're a sick man and all that, but technically, I won $64 when I was on your program. Now, the least you can do is give me another chance and another question. Okay, answer this one for $64. Shoot. Who's the cheapest guy in the world? I am. Now, give me that $64. <laughs> you're wrong, because I am, I'm not going to pay you. <laughs> now, listen here, Phil. I'll see my doctor. Come in. Well, well, how's my patient today? What are you doing? I'll take you bad boy. <laughs> I'm not the patient. That's Baker lying right there. Oh, well, you look sicker than he does. you got to admit that. <laughs> I admit nothing. Say, Doc, can I get up today? I've got my own program to do. Well, I have to check on that. Open your mouth and say, ah, ah, my, my, they're healing up fine. Wait a minute, Doc, you took out my appendix, not my tonsils. Who was under that ether, you or me? <laughs> Wait a minute, you mean to say you took out his tonsils and his appendix? Yeah, that's a special I was running last week. <laughs> Tonsils 
appendix and a tour through Radio City, 1250. Oh, that's good value. Now, uh... uh, Mr. Baker, what you need is a little medicine. Take this pill and you'll feel fine. Okay. Well, where's the pill? It's right here, but I can't seem to get it off my finger. That's a wart. The pill's in the other hand. (laughs) Oh, yes. Well, here you are. Well... Good night, Mr. Baker. Sleep tight. <laughs> Sleep tight? Wait a minute, Doc. What kind of a pill was that you gave him? A strong sedative. He'll be in dreamland inside of a minute. <laughs> dreamland? I gotta work fast. Now, Phil, concentrate. Oh, Jack, let him alone. Phil needs rest. Well, he's going to sleep. When I, I need that $64. Now, Phil, Phil, open your eyes. Phil, listen to me. What do you want, nurse? I'm not your nurse. I'm Betty. Now, listen, Baker. My lawyer said that when I was on your program, I want $64. Now, I want that money right now. Kiss me good night, Miss Stewart. I'm not Miss Stewart. Now, I won't kiss you good night till I get that money. Now, give me, give me that check I filled out, Dennis. Here you are. You didn't take a pill. Wake up. Now, Phil, Phil, wake up. Baker, listen to me. Wake up. Now, Phil, when, when you ask me if I... amazing achievement. But I know of a record of growth that's every bit as amazing. It's the record of Dilly Night at the same time. And I'm very happy to announce that Bill Baker is feeling much better and will return to his own program this evening. and starring Fred Allen. This is Jimmy Wallington saying you're welcome for Texaco dealers from coast to coast. Car owners know that the purpose of national mileage rationing is to conserve not just gasoline, but tires, and to keep America's cars in service for essential transportation despite the rubber shortage. But... Your Texaco dealer reminds you, your car must be conserved also. Now more than ever, its vital parts must receive regular lubrication and maintenance for longer life. See your Texaco dealer regularly. His skilled, systematic service will help save both your tires and your car. And now, when every mile counts, remember that the big Texaco star also stands for famous Texaco fire chief and premium Texaco sky chief gasoline. Last week, ladies and gentlemen, the New York film critics selected as the best picture of the year, Noel Coward's dramatic masterpiece, In Which We Serve. Tonight, we bring you a man who couldn't even get in to see the picture all last week. And here he is, Fred Allen. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Jimmy, uh, you're wrong, I'm sorry to say. I finally did get in to see that Noel Coward picture. Well, how did you like it, Fred? Oh, it was wonderful, Jimmy. When I left the theater, tears were streaming down my cheeks. It was so emotional. No, not emotional. The woman sitting next to me was eating onions all through the place. <laughs> she was throwing herring bones under the seat and using the leg of my pants for a napkin. <laughs> You know, that's what I get for going into a theater so near Lindy's. They have the American plan audiences in there. It's no good. Well, Fred, you can have Noel Coward. I'll take Lana Turner. You'll take Lana Turner. You with that A card. How far can you take her? <laughs> Why, you couldn't probably... Yes, sir, Alan! Of course. Well, 
Well, Portland, did you see the Noel Coward picture that won the Critics Award? Yes, but we'd like the man who came to dinner. Mama and I saw it ten times. Oh, you liked the acting in the man who came to dinner? It wasn't that. No? Uh, what's that? In one scene, Mommy Wooly is eating. Yeah? And on the table, there's a whole pound of butter. Ooh, a whole pound of butter. Yeah, it would cost a fortune to shoot a scene like that in a picture today, wouldn't it? Uh-huh. And speaking of butter, we've got an egg to go with the <laughs> butter. <laughs> well, if we only had a certain pan I, I'm looking at, we'd be... Uh... <laughs> Speaking of butter, we've got to get down to Alan's Alley. Oh, what is your question tonight? Well, during the past month, uh, as you've probably seen in the pictures, in Boston and at Summit, New Jersey, meat dealers have started selling horse meat for human consumption. And so then our question tonight is, how do you feel about horse meat in your home? Let's go down to Alan's Alley. Well, here we are back in Allen's Alley, Portland. Can I knock on John Doe's door? Oh, sure. Go right ahead. Yeah? What is it, little girl? Are you recruiting for the wax? No. Mr. Allen wants to see you. Oh, that pest. Is he back again? Uh, yes, Mr. Doe. Do you, uh, uh, this is my survey tonight. Do you think eating horse meat will have any effect on the country? Well, uh, eating horses will put a lot of bookmakers out of work. That's true. That could happen. <laughs> It'll make a pedestrian out of Gene Autry. That's right. It'll do that. The horse show this year might win the good housekeeping seal of approval. <laughs> that could happen, too. Have you, uh, have you tried any horse meat yourself? Oh, I've been eating it the last three weeks. Well, tell me, uh, confidentially, has the horse meat had any effect on you? Well, uh, instead of having indigestion, once in a while I get the heat. <laughs> I see. And when I run for the train morning, yes, I can do a mile in 138. <laughs> Since they're eating horse meat, you can actually run a mile in 138? Yeah, but uh, i got to get down on all fours to do it. Oh, I see. Come so on. Well, that takes care of John Doe. Now, I'll see if Mrs. Nussbaum is in. No. Uh, <laughs> Good evening, Mrs. Nussbaum. How uh, how do you feel about eating horse meat? Even a horse, even a little pony, this I couldn't do. You couldn't? <laughs> well, why uh, why not, Mrs. Nussbaum? When I'm a little girl, a horse is saving my life. Really? What uh, what happened? Well, my mother said to me to my delicatessen. I see. She's giving me a pickle I shall keep in quiet. Giving you a pickle to keep quiet, huh? Well, Mom, dear, feeling the pumpernickel of the loaf should not be from yesterday. Yes? I am on the sidewalk with the pickle creeping. Uh-huh. I'm crawling off the sidewalk, head and heels over pickle. Oh, God. Don Valencia says it's coming. Look at those spittle up at wagon. The horses were running away, and you, a little baby, were in the middle of the street. With my pickle, I am sleepy. Oh, yes? People is all together drinking. Yes! Yes? And the brewery wagon is coming almost on me. The brewery wagon is almost on you? One horse is bending down. Yes? By the bloomers, he's taking me in the teeth. And? Quickly turning the head. The horse is swinging me back into the delicatessen. The horse... The horse flung you back into the delicatessen. Then he is stooping down and flinging in the pickle also. <laughs> and that is why... <laughs> that is why you won't... Exactly. If I am eating horse meat, someday I might eating up the horse that is saving my life. I see. This, to me, is gratitude. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to ask Mrs. Nussbaum what became of the pickle. Oh, well, another day for that. Let's see if Socrates Mulligan is in. Uh, well, Socrates, what's cooking? Uh, well, away. So long. <laughs> well, that brings us to the last house in Allen's Alley. I'll see what's going on in here. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe. Falstaff's here to talk for Joe. Now, 
please, uh, you have a frog in your throat. Uh, good, I have an introduction. Yes. <clears throat> oh, uh, happy to know you. The frog is an Afro member, I hope. Now, look, Falstaff, let us ration your poems tonight. I have been composing like a beaver. Well, look, I'm really... Have you heard, I knew that all would not be well when that skunk climbed aboard the carousel? No, I don't think so. There was fire in her eyes the night we met. She peeked at me through her crepe Suzette. No. Just because you're a wave, mother, you don't have to go out with the tide. No. You're upsetting everything. Tonight, tonight we have been discussing horse meat. Precisely why I'm in your presence. I have written a poem. Well, what is your horse poem called? Recipe for Horse. Oh, recipe for horse. How does it go? Since folks around the country are starting to endorse the old gray mare for dinner, here's my recipe for horse. To prepare a horse for cooking, you'll find the taste improved if before you roast your stallion, the harness is removed. <laughs> then back into the oven and on the hour base and with salt and pepper season the horse to suit your taste. And when old Dobbin's medium rare, the hostess who is smart will do as Emily Post suggests. Serve her horse meat a la carte. Thank you very much, Paul. And now, Jimmy Wallington with just a word to the wise. Each one of you car owners, ladies and gentlemen, is the custodian of a vital unit in America's transportation system. Every ounce of your car's rubber, every one of its parts, and the gasoline it uses are necessary to America's war effort. National mileage rationing conserves rubber and gasoline. But the con conservation of the mechanical parts of your car is your responsibility. Keep your car in condition for your essential wartime driving by seeing that it gets regular service from your neighborhood technical dealer. His Marfax chassis lubrication protects 40 vital points of the chassis against excessive wear with Marfax, the super tough lubricant that resists the washing out effect of slush, snow, and rain. His insulated Haviland motor oil, insulated against breaking down under extremes of temperature, protects your motor hot or cold. And all of his many other technical products and services are planned to make your car last. Care for your car for your country. See your neighborhood Texaco dealer regularly. <laughs> Anchors Away, played by Al Goodman and his Chamber Music Society of Lower Canal Street Orchestra. And now, uh, yes, Portland? I don't think it's fair. No? What, what isn't fair? Making fun of Mr. Goodman and his orchestra. Oh, Mr. Goodman doesn't mind. But you're always picking on him, and he never says a word. Well, why should Goodman hire an interpreter for one word? <laughs> Give Mr. Goodman a chance. You should have more music on your program. Good music, yes. And tonight we're going to hear some good music, Portland. Our sponsors, the Texas Company, uh, like good music. Don't forget, they sponsor the Metropolitan Opera broadcast every Saturday afternoon. Is your program going to be high class, too? For one night only. Our guest tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is Michelle Piastro, the eminent artist, violin soloist, and concert master of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. It is indeed an honor at this time to present Michelle Piastro. Oh, this, is this is horrible, Mr. Allen. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Is something wrong, Mr. Piastro? I'm not Mr. Piastro. Mr. Piastro isn't here. Mr. Piastro is... Well, who are you? I'm Mr. Flugelman, Mr. Piastro's manager. I can't imagine what's keeping Michelle. Yeah, what a mess. This is a radio program, Mr. Flugelman. Now, we just can't hang around here waiting for Mr. Piastro. As his manager, you're responsible. I have announced a violinist. Well, fortunately, I have a standby violinist with me. A standby? <laughs> Who is he? Well, his name won't mean anything to you. No, why? But uh, we around the Steinway building feel he has possibilities. <laughs> 
have to have somebody, Mr. Flugelman. Where is this guy? Uh, Yasha, Yasha! I'm, I'm coming, Mr. Flugelman. Mr. Allen, this is Yasha Benny. Thank you. Yasha will play for you, Mr. Allen. This is Yasha, Yasha Benny, and this is the biggest crowd you've ever had. Look, look. Look, Mr. Flugelman, this uh, is standby also ad libs, I understand. <laughs> look, Mr. Flugelman, perhaps if we could wait just a little longer, Mr. Piastro will get here. You have your violin, Yasha? Yes, it's right here, Mr. Flugelman. You didn't bring the one that lights up. <laughs> No, I blew a fuse at town hall last night. I'm ready. Now, uh, who'll uh, turn my music? Who has a wet finger? Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Look, fellas, can't we, can't we wait just a little longer? Remember, Yasha, this is a concert date, so none of that trick playing with a bow in your teeth. <laughs> well, can I do that one where I stand on my head, hold the violin between my knees, and pluck it with my big toe? <laughs> no big toe. The little toe? No little toe. Oh, shoot, I washed my foot for nothing. <laughs> no going off tonight, Yasha. Just straight play. I'll go out and see what happened to Miss Elfie All right, Mr. Allen, shall I play my solo now? Well, let's not rush into this thing, Mr. Benny. This, uh, as you know, is a high-class program. I'm taking an awful chance letting an unknown play here tonight. I'm not completely unknown, Mr. Allen. Who knows you? Well, I'm very popular in St. Joe. Oh, in the West. <laughs> well, will you, uh, will you step just a little closer to the microphone, Mr. Benny, if you okay. will? Just a little. This is so different from concert work. <laughs> You, uh, you don't use the microphone? No, no, no. In concert, I merely stamp twice with my foot, and away I go. Oh, you do. <laughs> when you have the foot for it, I must say, Mr. Benny. I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Benny, if we knew a little more about your musical background, it might help. Are you, uh, are you new at the game? No, no. I've been playing the violin for 17 years. Oh, I see. I started playing when I was five years old. Oh, <laughs> You've been playing 17 years. That would make your age about uh, 22. Uh, 22, give or take a year. Oh, well, <laughs> well, I must say, Mr. Benny, you are the first young violinist I have ever seen who has more hair on his bow than he has on his head. I, <laughs> I have more hair, Mr. Allen. I just didn't happen to bring it with me. <laughs> I see. I have hair I haven't even parted yet. Now, no. Uh, uh, you're, uh, you're a little too close to the microphone now, Mr. Benny, if you don't mind. Would you just step back a trifle? Oh, little little all so new to me, I don't seem to get the hang of it. You are slow catching on, I must say. Well, tell me, uh, tell me, Mr. Benny, how did you first become interested in the violin? Well, when I was a little boy, I had a big Adam's apple. Uh -huh. I had to have something to rest it on, so I took up the violin. Oh, I... <laughs> well, how did you learn to play? Did you uh, did you get a transfusion from Heifetz? Is that how you learned? No, no, I studied at Professor Hollister's Institute for Boys with Rich Parents and Symphonic Ambitions. Oh, in Washington? Yeah, there were such folks. Yeah. And you, uh, you finished school? No, no, in my sophomore year, I was snapped up by a talent scout for manual chili bowls. Manual chili bowl. That was Walt Egan's hot spot. Oh, I see. <laughs> you order the Mexican boiled dinner, I'd come to your table personally and play. Or with the boiled dinner yes. only. You were you were sort of a vitamin virtuoso. Well, after you had ruined the business at Manual Chili <laughs> After you, uh, now you're hoping someone in the audience will give you better lines. I'm afraid you're out of luck. <laughs> Mr. Allen, I got five more gray hairs at rehearsal. After you, after you ruined the business at Manuel's Chili Bowl, what happened? Well, when I was 18, I became second violinist with the Waukegan Philharmonic. Oh, the Waukegan Philharmonic. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, you specialized in chamber music, did you? We had our own chairs. We could play any place. <laughs> You say you were 
you're the second violinist with this versatile group. Yes, sir. Well, what is the difference between a first and second violinist, Mr. Benny? In Waukegan, four dollars a week. <laughs> that, uh, that was the scale. Heavens no. I'd never write a thing like that in my script. Heavens no. <laughs> Believe me, for Waukegan Philharmonic, if you could play the scale, you could name your own product. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. I Benny. I killed that gag, and I'm very happy about it. <laughs> well, why don't you lie down with it if it's dead? As the, second, as the second violinist in the Waukegan Philharmonic, were you kept pretty busy? Yes, you see, our first violinist only had one finger on his left hand. Oh, I see. He used to uh, miss half the notes. And uh, after he had given the violin part the finger... I would follow through. Oh, <laughs> well, are you still playing with this outfit? No, no, Mr. Allen. In 1937, I came east with Phil Spitalny. Oh, Phil Spitalny. <laughs> Well, isn't, uh, isn't that an all-girl orchestra? Yes, but where I sat, nobody could tell the difference. <laughs> With your big blue eyes, I suppose. Now, if you don't mind, Mr. Allen, I'd like to play my solo. Well, in just a minute, Mr. Benny, we must have a few more facts. Facts? Look, Allen, I'm not marrying your sister. I just came here to play my violin. Well, I know. <laughs> I know, but we advertise Michelle Piast- uh, Piastro tonight, Mr. Benny. We can't put on any broken-down schnook who shows up here with a fist. <laughs> Fortunately for you, Mr. Allen, I happen to be a schnook, or you'd have a libel suit, I guess. <laughs> Uh, not raise our voices, Mr. Benny. What about the rest of your musical career? Have you uh, have you done any uh, recording work? Yes, yes, I've made a few records for Victor. Oh, Victor Records? No, this was Victor Hershkowitz. <laughs> a uh, much smaller outfit. Oh, I see. You've seen that record, Cohen on the Telephone. Yes. I'm on the other side. Oh. <laughs> Remind, Remind me not, not to turn, turn it, it over. over. I know. Well, I guess that's about all the information we'll need, Mr. Benny. I should hope so. I didn't have half this trouble getting a C-card here. Well, it, it looks as though I'm stuck and stuck good. Now, you can go ahead with your solo. It's about time. I'll tune up with you. Uh, and, uh, oh, before you start, Mr. Benny, what is your number? I think you'd better announce it. We, uh, we don't want people phoning in here after you're through playing. We'd like to have it. Well, I'll take care of that, Mr. Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, my first violin selection... Will be the... uh, hold it. Uh-uh, hold it, Mr. Benny. Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen. Mr. Flugelman, you're back. Hey, everything is all right. He's here. Who is here? Michelle Piastro. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Piastro. Gosh, it's good to see you, Michelle. I'm sorry I'm so late, sir. Ah, uh, but better late than what we almost got into, Michelle. <laughs> Mr. Piastro is ready for his solo, Mr. Allen. I'll get out your violin, Michelle. Uh, but Mr. Fogelman, I'm all ready to play. Who needs you anymore? You can go, Yasha. Here's your violin, Michelle. But, but Mr. Fogelman. Oh, wait, Yasha. An artist is here. I'll I'll hold your mittens, Michelle. Here's the rosin for your bow. But, but Mr. Fogelman. I told you you're through. Now go. Here's your music, Michelle. Did this music stand right? But Mr. Fogelman. You'll get paid. You'll get paid. Go. Get out. See me at the office. Are we ready, Michelle? Uh, yes, Mr. Piastro. What is your solo? I'm going to play the third movement of Together Widen by Pablo de Sarasate. That's the same number I was going to. <laughs> Mr. Benny, sit down. Sit down, will you, Mr. Benny? And now at long last, ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Piastro. A uh, Mr. Flogoma! <laughs> Thank you. 
was wonderful, Michelle. Thank you, Fred. And uh, now, Mr. Benny, we, we haven't forgotten you. You can go right ahead with your solo, if you will. I wish I was dead. <laughs> but we're waiting for you. Why don't you play? Well, it wouldn't be ethical. Look, would Heifetz play after Ben Burney? <laughs> What are you afraid of? You have ten fingers and a violin. That's all Mr. Piastro But well, he played my number. Oh, fine. If I play Sagina Wisely again, it'll sound like Piastro's playing an encore. He'll get all the credit. Say, Fred, I have to leave now. If you will excuse me. Now, Jack, before you go, Michelle, I'd like to have you meet Jack Benny. How do you do, Mr. Benny? Hello, Miss. <laughs> Mish, then you know Mr. Piastro. Oh, yeah, Mish and I are buddies from way back, eh, Mish? I'm sorry, Mr. Benny. I don't seem to remember you. Well, I, uh, I met you at Carnegie Hall. Mr. Papini introduced us. Mr. Papini? Oh, yes, he's the janitor at Carnegie Hall. Well, he is the janitor, but it's a much bigger job now. They've converted to coal. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Benny uh, here is also a violinist. Mr. Benny has been playing the violin for 17 years. You've been playing longer than I have, Mr. Benny. Well, that's the way it goes. Uh, what uh, key What key do you play in, Michelle? I play in any key. Oh, I stick to the key of C myself. I <laughs> got to like it as a boy. <laughs> you know how it is. Huh? As a violinist, Mr. Benny, how did you like my solo tonight? Well... Frankly, Michelle. Did you notice I had a little difficulty in the eighth variation of the third movement? Well, I didn't want to say anything, but since you brought it up, uh, Michelle, you want the truth, of course. Yes, of course. Well, I thought your Andante was beautifully done. It sparkled. Thank you. I thought your Rondo was exciting, if not altogether brilliant. And your Vibrato was adequate, but your Pizzicato was, shall we say, Lauzo? <laughs> I appreciate your opinion, Mr. Benny. If anyone is an authority on Lowes, you are the man. Perhaps Mr. Benny will play something for you, Michelle. Yes, by all means, you must play, Mr. Benny. Well, I'd love to, Miss, but it wouldn't be fair to you. After all, if I play after your solo, it'll only invite comparison. Well, of all the nerve, Benny, you have the audacity to compare yourself with Michelle Piastro. Why, when you play the violin, it sounds like the mating call of a pair of corduroy pants. <laughs> Well, let me tell you, Alan, I'll bet $5,000 that if Michelle plays a number, I can play the same number and nobody can tell the difference. You play and Michelle plays and no one can tell the difference? You heard me, brother. For $5,000? I get $6,000 and a case of grape nuts flake. All right. <laughs> Michelle? Certainly. Fine. I'll play the banjo to give the number a little substance, a little background. All right, Mr. Goodman, will you give us an introduction? Gad, what a night for music lovers. <laughs> And we bring you the most sensational symphonic competition of the season. During the next two choruses, Michelle Piastro will play half of each chorus, and Jack Benny will play the other half. Mr. Benny will pay $6,000 in the case of Grape Nuts Flakes to anyone who cannot tell the difference. Let's go.
Before we close, before we close the Texas Coast Star Theater, I want to thank Jack Benny and Michelle Piastro for joining us here tonight. Next week, our guest will be George E. Jessel. And now, Jimmy, if, you, uh, if you'd like to add a footnote. Thank you, Fred. I just want to remind motorists that their tires must be inspected at an official tire inspection station before January 31st. Many Texaco dealers have been appointed official tire inspectors. We suggest you check with the Texaco dealer in your neighborhood. And remember, mileage rationing saves your tires. Complete the job and save your car with your Texaco dealer's tow service. This is Fred Allen speaking for Texaco dealers from coast to coast and inviting you to drive in regularly. Remember, you're welcome. World News Today, brought to you by the Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations, as well as leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's Doug Edwards. The Allied Fifth Army in Italy has thrown back German counterattacks and has cut deeper into the enemy defense lines around Casino, the strategic town guarding the road to Rome. In Russia, Soviet armies have smashed within striking distance of three German escape railroads, and the fall of Sarny in old Poland appears imminent. British mosquito bombers were over German targets again last night, and in the far Pacific, marine jungle fighters on New Britain Island have made new gains in the face of strong Jap opposition. Now for our first news direct from overseas, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Algiers, Winston Burdett reporting. regret that we are not able to make contact with Columbia's correspondent in North Africa. However, for home front news, Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Washington, Don Pryor reporting. Congress goes back to work tomorrow. You can't escape the feeling that it's going to be a tremendously important session. Certainly it will be racked with controversy because all the pent-up wartime pressures of the nation will be focused on Capitol Hill. Here are some of the issues that are, that are, that are waiting to be solved. Taxes. A bill providing a little over $2 billion, one-fifth as much as the Treasury asked for, is awaiting action in the Senate. Subsidies. By February 17th, there will have to be a showdown on the whole question of using subsidies to hold down the prices of food. The argument was postponed a bit by stopgap legislation adopted just before Congress went home for the holidays. Wages. The Senate has passed and the House is all ready to act on legislation which will give the non-operating railroad employees an arbitrary eight cents an hour increase in wages. And then there's the red-hot question of labor policy in general. The recent steel strike and the threatened railroad strike are certain to lead to demands for more stringent labor legislation. There will also have to be strong movement in favor of national service legislation, which in effect would be a labor draft. Last night, Major General Hershey of Selective Service announced that occupational deferments for men over under 22, whether they are fathers or not, will be curtailed sharply after the first of next month. War Mobilization Director Burns has announced the adoption of a uniform clause for war contracts to cover their termination. It's the first big step of the new Baruch organization in preparing for demobilization when the war is over. President Roosevelt's annual message is expected to go to Capitol Hill day after tomorrow, but we still don't know whether the president 
available to whoever in person. That's up to his personal physician, Rear Admiral McIntyre. I return you to Admiral Radio in New York. More news in just a moment, but first here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Here in America, when a man's work is done, he can sit leisurely by his radio, perhaps an Admiral Radio, and listen with complete enjoyment to his favorite program. But not so with the oppressed peoples of Europe, with Pierre the Frenchman, for example, who lives under the heel of the Nazi boot. Pierre must wait for darkness. In the dead of night, he steals down into the cellar, through the secret door, and there he is, underground. That's where his radio is. There, underground, at the risk of his life, he gets information which tells him when the long-awaited invasion is coming, and how to aid by destroying enemy installations, rails, bridges, factories. Through radio, underground, the oppressed learn the truth, learn of the coming invasion that will crush the heart of the enemy. To coordinate an invasion from the sea, on land, in the air, and yes, even underground, it takes radio. Admiral Radio is proud to be part of the coming invasion, just as Admiral was proud in pre-war days of its leadership as the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers. The entire production facilities of Admiral's two great plants are devoted to victory. But Admiral gives you this assurance, when victory is ours, the skill and precision now going into weapons of war will be found in your new and better Admiral, America's smart set. Now, here once again is Doug Edwards. Massive Russian spearheads are pushing steadily forward today against retreating German troops in the southwestern Ukraine and in old Poland. Red armies have smashed within striking distance of three German escape railroads. Pushing on rapidly from captured Ilyensi, 40 miles east of Zemerinka, one of General Vatutin's spearheads has brought the Odessa to Warsaw Railroad under attack. The cutting of this vital line of communication would force the Germans in the south to depend on secondary long way around railroads through Romania. Another Red Army group is less than 11 miles northeast of the junction town of Maranovka on the Belaya Sirkov to Smeria Railroad. And in addition, the Tutin's advance units have practically made the east-west railway from Smeria to the Odessa to Warsaw line useless. Red Army troops are only 11 miles north of this line, which is the main German escape route across the southern Ukraine. Meanwhile, General Konev is developing his drive from captured Kirovograd. He's smashing at the rear of the German forces in the deeper bend and increasing the threat to Krivoy Rog and Nikopol, the iron, coal, and manganese centers in the southeast. Red Army observers report that roads in the captured Kiravagrad area are covered with smashed enemy guns, lorries, and crippled automobiles. To the northwest, Soviet columns in Old Poland are reported five miles east of the town of Sarny, capture of which would cut a fourth vital rail line, which links the German armies to the north and south. American and British troops in the Allied Fifth Army in Italy have beaten off German counterattacks and reached a point within four miles of Casino, the important town which guards the road to Rome. Reports from the front say terrific mountain battles are now underway, battles unlike anything seen in this war since the Greeks fought Italians in Albania two years ago. American troops fighting with bayonets and hand grenades pushed the Germans out of their strong positions in the village of Justo, and they've now driven into the heights closer to Casino. Allied planes continue to hammer the continent. For this news and an interview with one of our fighting men, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS London, Larry Lesser reporting. In the past few months, this great aircraft carrier called Britain has become a concentration point for the fighting men of the United Nations. Sunburned men who conquered Africa confer over the map of Europe with those who drove out the Japs from the Aleutians. And here's a man who has seen the war in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. 32-year-old Colonel William J. Cummings of Lawrence, Kansas. He's better known to his boys in the 8th Air Force Fighter Command as Wild Bill Cummings when he leads his Thunderbolt group over Europe. Cummings now escorts all liberators and fortresses to Germany in daylight. But not so long ago, he was fighting Japanese zeroes in the Pacific. Colonel Cummings, which do you consider the toughest theater of war, the Atlantic or the Pacific? Well, as an airman, there's not much doubt that the war is tougher here in Europe than it was out in the Pacific. The German planes are just as good, if not better, than the old Jap Zero. And I think the German pilot is more resolute. The Jap fights very hard on the ground, but in the air, the Jap will bluff out just as soon as anyone else. I'm glad to hear that. But 
Colonel Cummings, I understand that although you're a fighter pilot, you've also fought on the ground against the Japs. How was that? Well, you remember when the Japs attacked the Philippines, we were pretty short of planes. By the time we were driven to Bataan, we only had a few left. We kept passing them and shoving back and forth to men and hour, bringing in supplies and ammunition. After a while, all our planes were out of action and my squadron became infantrymen. We had rifles and pistols and we fought skirmishes with the Jap infantry closing in on our soldiers in Bataan. Things went from bad to worse. Everybody had malaria, dysentery, and dengue fever. Then one day a liberator came from Australia and 35 of us piled into it and we flew to safety on the mainland. You were one of the lucky ones, weren't you? How many of your squadron got out of there, Colonel Cummings? Just nine out of the original 40. The rest of my friends are dead or prisoners of war. Some were killed on the ground, some were hit with bombs, some were shot down, and the rest are in prison camps. You can eat rest after that experience, Colonel Cummings. Yes, after making a few missions over New Guinea, gas Japanese Zero, as I went back to America. Joined a new fighter squadron and sent me over here. Oh, well, where would you rather be? Here or in the Pacific? Living conditions are better over here, aren't they? Yes, they are, except for the cold. <laughs> well, how about food? That's better over here, isn't it, Colonel Cummings? For all the time, we had two meals a day, rice and sometimes a little canned salmon. Over here, it's spam and Brussels sprouts. Well, I guess you settle for a steak and French fries. Sure would, Larry. But when this is over, I want to get back and fight the Japs. After you've been strafed and bombed and seen your friends die alongside you, war becomes very personal. I left a lot of good friends back there. Yes, I guess the war is more impersonal for our boys here in Europe. Most of them have never seen a German. They've never seen the cities their bombs destroy. Have you ever been in Europe yourself, Colonel Cummings? No, I never have. I don't think it'll be long now. The Germans are almost in the same position as we were in the Pacific two years ago. They're on a defensive. Yep, I guess they are. I hope you'll keep them on the defensive for a long, long time. Thank you very much, Colonel Cummings. We'll be turning now to CBS New York. Here at home, our Army Air Force mechanics are now inspecting a captured German medium bomber, the famed Junker 88. For a report on just how this ship stacks up against our planes, Admiral Radio takes you to right field. Bill Slocum, Jr., reporting. Sitting here on the flight line at Wright Field is an interesting testimony to our rationalized powers of persuasion. It is a JU-88, a German twin-engine airplane that not too long ago sat on a flight line somewhere in Romania. A young Nazi aviator owned that JU-88, and after giving much thought to the certain basic inconsistencies of the master race doctrine, he came to a decision which was, in effect, nuts to this. He therefore promptly climbed into his plane and flew to Allied territory surrendering himself and his plane intact. Being a very observing young Nazi, he was smart enough to surrender to the British, even though they were farther away than the Russians. This plane is now at Wright Field, headquarters of the Air Force's Materiel Command, where daring young American test pilots are learning exactly what makes it click. It is long and anemic looking except for its head, which is fairly large. It looks like a garden snake trying to swallow a golf ball. Three or four Germans get into that bulbous nose up front, but it's a cinch two of them must be junior Germans. Captain Gus Lundquist, a young man from Chicago, has with several other test pilots at Wright Field been flying this plane. The captain's passion for the JU-88 is somewhat restrained, but he did consent to talk about it with me today. Captain, what do you think of it? Confidentially, Mr. Slocum, it isn't a very good airplane. As an all-purpose plane, it's good. It can be used as a bomber, a fighter, a reconnaissance job, or a dive bomber. But, and this is the important but, she isn't any too good in any one phase of the different types of... Uh, How about the gadgets on her, Captain? She carries good instruments and a couple of buttons that are something. One button, when pushed, sets off a charge that destroys the bomb bay mechanism. How'd you find out about that button? The hard way, Mr. Slope. We pushed it. One of the boys got a hurt a little bit. How about the other button? That blows off the entire tail assembly. We discovered that right after we found out about the bomb bays, but not by pushing anything, so the tail's still on. What do we have that's like the JU-88? Our A-20 is something like her, but the A-20 
only is faster, better armed and armored, and carries more bombs. Anything the Junkers can do, we have one or more planes that can do it better. You and the Nazi pilot who surrendered her seem to have basically the same opinions of the 88. Could you say a kind word about her at all? Well, Mr. Slocum, she flew across the Atlantic. Well, that is a thought, Captain Lundquist. Thanks for helping us give a picture of the German Ju-88, now close to obsolescence. But as any merchant mariner or Navy man can tell you, she was a great gal when she had it, and she really had it. Now back to Admiral Radio in New York. This week, the Germans made little effort to minimize the disaster of facing their troops in Russia and their troubles at home. For a direct report from one of Europe's listening posts, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Madrid, Glenn Stadler reporting. As Nazi Marshal Rommel ranges up and down the Channel Coast checking his anti-invasion preparations, all of Europe, and especially Holland, Belgium, and France, became visibly more restless. This condition is everywhere reflected in the German-controlled newspapers. Notices of executions of patriots are increasing daily. A typical one from the Journal of Lyon announces that three Frenchmen were shot by a Gestapo firing squad on December 28th. The charge was favoring the enemy. But despite reprisals and 3,000 arrests each week in France alone, anti-Nazi groups become larger, better organized, and more daring. In Valenciennes, a dozen armed men led by a man brandishing a gun in each hand broke into the jail, took 50,000 francs, and liberated five companions. In a running gun battle, one was killed. The others escaped, some on bicycles. Thus having failed to quell resistance, the Nazis have reverted again to what they must think is a clever trick, but has had little or no success. It's a periodic appeal to surrender firearms and promises immunity from punishment, even though possession of guns and explosives is illegal. The catch is, of course, that the minute someone is foolish enough to comply, he's arrested. <clears throat> yes, they promise immunity, but only for the period specified. The person is guilty of having the arms in the previous overlapping period covered by an identical law prescribing the death penalty. German papers carry none of this type of news because the propaganda ministry believes that people might get the wrong idea about life in the occupied countries. Hitler's own Focus your Beobachter features blasts of the Allies and, laborious, and laboriously written explanations on why the Red Army is in Poland now. The Nazi journals, however, do carry hundreds of death notices daily, and there obviously is a large backlog because many are dated as of six months ago. One recently announced the death on the Russian front of a soldier named John Dillinger. Another in Black Border and Big Type bore only the name Adolf. This is Van Savern Madrid, returning you to Admiral radio in New York. Our Pacific forces continue to strike hard at the enemy in the central and southern area. For a summary of the latest developments in that war zone, Admiral Radio takes you after a brief pause to CBS Pearl Harbor, Webley Edwards reporting. In the Pacific, United States Marines on New Britain have pushed a mile and three quarters south of City Mighty Point. There's heavy fighting. Rubble has been raided for the sixth time in six days. Australians are driving up the Juan Peninsula and are close to a juncture with United States forces who last week landed at Sidor. The marshals have been bombed again. I'm now able to tell you that I have just spent some time with the Marines of Tarawa. Earlier, I flew to a Pacific island and, to my surprise, landed squarely in the midst of them, just as their convoys were arriving. I say to my surprise because outside of official circles, nobody knew where they were. And there had been considerable speculation as to where the Marines would be taken for rest and rehabilitation after their occupation of Tarawa. That arrival of the Marines, back from one of the grimmest, bloodiest actions of all the history of this fighting corps, was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. They came off their troop ships in every stage of disarray. They still wore their muddled camouflage fighting outfits, those who still had them, but many were in shorts, old suits of underwear, and some wore improvised wraparounds. They brought much of their equipment back with them, and it had the look of well-worn battle gear. Only equipment that's been in real fighting can have quite that appearance. They had some of their wounded with them, and some who had died on the way home. They were tough, hard-bitten, and soberly serious. They were men who learned about war at Guadalcanal before they found out about hell at Tarawa. And yet, being Marines, there was a jauntiness about them that even their disheveled clothing could not hide. This was no gala landing, nor was there any of the spick and span parade ground stuff about this homecoming. But even so, as they poured down the gangways and stepped again on solid earth, the Marines raised their heads and straightened their shoulders and looked just square in the eyes as if to say, well, that was that. They had trophies. 
it naturally. Bundles of Jap paper, money, Jap flags, and all the dozens of things that training men pick up on battlefields to take back to the girlfriend of the family. They went to a plane in a higher region of the island and set about making themselves a great camp. It's a real undertaking to set up a camp for as many men as they had and do it from the ground up, but they thought nothing of it. They're there now, getting some rest. They are restless, though, and I think they would welcome action at once if they could get it. When you have seen the Marines back from Tarawa, it makes you glad they are on our side. It would be very unpleasant to have to meet these Marines in battle anywhere. This is Webley Edwards at Pearl Harbor, returning you to Admiral Radio in New York. Two Army nurses who helped care for our wounded soldiers in the South Pacific are now back in this country. For their story, Admiral Radio again takes you to CBS Washington, Don Pryor reporting. I met a couple of girls yesterday out at the Army's Walter Reed General Hospital. They had a story to tell, so here they are. They are Lieutenant Marguerite Cooney of Worcester, Massachusetts, and Lieutenant Helen Burns of Wallingford, Connecticut, both Army nurses. They just got back to the States after 22 months abroad. How'd you happen to get in the Army, girls? We both joined for the Red Cross in 1940. We volunteered for one year. That was Lieutenant Burns. You say you volunteered for one year, but it's well over three years now. Well, the war changed things. We got our riders to sail right after Pearl Harbor, January 1942. Well, did you know where you were going? Incidentally, that was Lieutenant Cooney that time. No, we didn't know. Well, most of us guessed that we were going to Australia. That seemed like the most logical place. And you were right? Yes, but we only stayed there a week, and then we went to New Caledonia. Had you ever heard of New Caledonia? Before. No, we didn't know there was such a place in the world until we set foot in it. Uh, had you, uh, uh, was it exciting after you got there? It was at first. We were expecting trouble when we landed. We went ashore in fatigue uniforms with tin helmets and everything, but nothing happened. Uh, where were you, in a city? I wouldn't call it that. We were in Numea for a while. That's the biggest town on the island, but it's just a dirty little village. We stayed there a few weeks, though, and then our whole outfit moved to 120 miles north, and that was some ride. It took us 10 hours in a truck. Where was that? What town? No town at all. We were right out in the woods. How about living accommodations? We lived in tents for eight months. Our hospital was a tent, too, and we had to carry all our water from a brook. We bathed in the brook, too, and we had a little pool there screened off with tenting. Sort of rugged, but it does sound like fun. It was, but of course we got pretty homesick now and then. After the first eight months, we got the natives to build us some grass houses. You could have a house built for about $25. They were all right, too, until I got too full of rats and mice and things. Did you handle very many casualties? Not for quite a while. Finally, all the boys who were with us at first were sent to Guadalcanal, but we had plenty of casualties later. After 14 months, we moved again, not far from Numea. We received many from the New Georgia and Russell Islands. Were they good patients, mostly? Most of them were very good and very appreciated. Speaking of uh, getting back in the States now, after 22 months, how did it feel to get back? Wonderful. It's funny how the little things impress you most, like bathtubs and being able to walk into a store and buy something. But the thing that surprised me most was the fact that rationing wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it would be. My friends had written about how terrible the shortages were. <laughs> and how about you, Lieutenant Cooney? What impressed you most? Women running streetcars, buses, and so many of them in work clothes. I heard about all those things, but I really wasn't prepared for it. Uh, do you want to go back out there? Yes, I do. I was terribly anxious to get back here, but now I feel kind of restless and lost. I suppose I'll get used to it after a while. Yes, I suppose you will after a while. That was Lieutenant Marguerite Cooney and Lieutenant Helen Burns, Army nurses just back from the South Pacific. I return you to Admiral Radio in New York. The Chung King Radio has broadcast a note to Jap Premier Tojo to keep him up to date on the latest figures on American airplane production. Dear Tojo, the broadcast said, for your information, for your for further information, the United States produced a bombing plane every four minutes, every day, 24 hours a day during December. And then the broadcast gave the figures. A record number of 8,800 planes in December to bring the American total for the year to almost 86,000 planes. The Chinese broadcast concluded, start counting, Sojo. 
And now, once again, here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Does your radio give you the same flawless reception and carefree enjoyment it did when new? If not, the trouble may be some easily made adjustment that you can do yourself. To conserve your busy Admiral dealer's time, Admiral has prepared a clearly illustrated home checkout chart showing you how to correct minor difficulties in reception. For example, here is one of the 20 suggestions made. Make sure your antenna lead-in wire hasn't become frayed by rubbing. The exposed wire, when wet by rain, sleet, or snow, and blown against the building, may be grounded in poor reception results. The Admiral Home Checkup Chart is designed purely as an aid and time saver for your Admiral dealer and will not help you to correct major troubles or structural failures. Your Admiral dealer is the man to call in such cases because of his knowledge and equipment. But for your copy of the Admiral Home Checkup Chart, ask your dealer or address a card or letter to Admiral Radio in care of this station. Thanks to huge increases in farm production, America has enough food to satisfy the basic requirements of good health and sound nutrition and still meet the food demands of war. But we do not have all the food we want and can afford. Rationing is the democratic way to share and share alike. It is a vital wartime necessity, but rationing is not enough. Prices must be kept from skyrocketing. Black markets must be stamped out. Fifteen million Americans have signed a home front pledge, which is, I will pay no more than top legal prices. I will not accept rationed goods without giving up ration points. Living up to this pledge will assure a fair share for all. And that's the right way, the democratic way. Remember, food fights for freedom. The appearance of Army personnel on this program does not constitute an endorsement of our product for the Army, as the Army does not endorse any product. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by the Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. This is Warren Sweeney speaking coast to coast for the Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago 11. Soldiers of the Press. This week, bombers over Haiphong. Operational for Sunday. Order issued from Bomber Command to 15th Bombardment Group. To all staff and squadron commanders. A raid in force will be made on the Japanese-held port of Haiphong. Clearing airdrome at 0700. Signed, Brigadier General Claire Cheneau. That operational was of exceptional interest to United Press Staff Correspondent Robert P. Martin, assigned to a U.S. Army Bomber Command Headquarters base in China. This is his eyewitness account of the first great raid on Haiphong, the strongest naval base in Jap-held Indochina. From an advanced base in Yunnan, I flew with a group of American bombers when they sank their first ocean-going Japanese vessel from this base and then plastered the entire waterfront of Haiphong. It was 0600 when we piled out of bed for the final briefing. Six o'clock in the morning. We had to feel our way into the blacked out headquarters building where the last discussion of the raid was to be held. I just barely managed to get a cup of coffee under my belt before the briefing started. You awake yet, Bob? Just about. I don't see why you guys can't arrange to hold this war to more civilized hour. <laughs> I'll speak to the general about it. I better grab yourself a seat. We're going to start. All right, gentlemen. All right, gentlemen, we'll start now. Be seated. Ta-da! <laughs> I'll have to presume that most of you are awake. I don't hear any snoring. <laughs> but just to make certain that you stay awake, I'll ask you to take notes. Now, we discussed the preliminary details last night, so I needn't go over the formation again. However, let me review briefly. The first squadron will form the leading element of the group formation. The Hellcat squadron will form the second element. And the Top Hat squadron will form the rear element. That's you, Hank. No roving around looking for a fight. <laughs> now, combat orders. Group assembly after takeoff will be over reference point H at 5,000 feet. Wedge formation at 0, 0,710. The route out will be direct. Route back direct. Method of attack will be plan A. Base your altitude and command. Maneuver after attack. All squadrons turn right and assemble on group commander. 
Any questions? What do we do if we get separated? I'll get to that in a minute, Jinx. Now about the anti-aircraft evasive tactics. We can expect a certain amount of flag over such a... The briefing went on for about half hour or so, and various reports kept coming in while we all sat there eating our breakfast with one hand and taking notes with the other. It's really amazing how much preparation and planning goes into a bomber raid, but it all pays off. Our bombers and their crews keep coming home as a result. Finally, the briefing was over. We knew when the commander said, Check your watches. In exactly 15 seconds, it'll be 0650. In 10 seconds. In 5 seconds. Check. All right. Good hunting. Good hunting. Good hunting. Let's go. Good hunting. Good hunting. Good hunting. I was assigned to the big bomber of Lieutenant C.H. Hagen of Jacksonville, Florida. We had a brief conversation before going out in the flying field, and he told me what to watch for on our way to the target and during the bombing. Then we went aboard the bomber, and I was given a pair of earphones and allowed to plug in on the plane's interphone and radio circuit while the pilots warmed up the motors. Radio testing. Army 49607 testing. Army 49607 testing. Can you hear me, Tower? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you, 49607. I hear you very well. That frequency is very good. Okay, thank you. Radio's hot, Skipper. Any time now. Okay, Vince. Pilot to navigator. Everybody aboard? Yes, Skipper. Check off everybody. Front to rear. I'm going to hear, sir. All right, you got to hear, sir. Navigator present. Radio here, sir. They've got a report, sir. How about the press? You all set, Martin? All set here. Okay, thank you. Ready, co-pilot? Ready. Oil pressure is up on both. Okay. Unlock tailwheel. Stand by brakes. Pilot to radio. Transmit me. Go ahead. Control tower from Army 49607. Tower from Army 49607. Request taxi and takeoff clearance. Acknowledge. Army 49607 from tower. Clear to taxi to number one runway. Take off when ready. Clear to taxi and take off. Go ahead. We'll go. Roger. Hang on to your hat, Martin. We're on our way to Haifang. It was a wonderful day for bombing Japs. The sunshine was brilliant. The sky was blue as it only can be over the arid China mountains. The drone of the motors and the dull, endless landscape made me very drowsy. I must have been asleep for quite a while when the sound of voices in my earphones woke me up. Pilot to navigator, how are we doing? Okay, right on course. Wind remains constant. Compass heading 22. No perceptible drift. ETA, 20 minutes. Right. The estimated time of arrival was 20 minutes. The bomber crew began to sit up and take notice. So did I. I moved over just below Gunner Sergeant Ed Rhodes of Kansas City and watched him checking over his machine guns. He handled them like a mother with a two-week-old baby. Then he draped 50-pound belts of machine gun bullets around his neck like a pearl necklace. I had to move away because the loose ends kept swinging into my face. Pilot here. Keep a sharp watch for fighter opposition, everybody. Let me know if you see anything. I went back and watched the navigator, Lieutenant Olson Edgar Peck of Georgetown, Texas. He was putting away his instruments and settling behind another machine gun. He winked at me and patted the belts of ammunition. Holy Joe on a fish. Over my earphones, I could Why hear the I rear gunner swearing to himself from time to time. So I gathered that he also was trying to get comfortable behind a machine gun. Right about then, I began wishing I had a machine gun myself. Two gangsters coming in fast from 6 o'clock. Underneath, watch them, Charlie. I'll watch them. Tally-ho! Gangsters are Jap pursuit ships. An angle 6 o'clock is directly astern. I flopped down in the passageway like a ton of brick and tried to remember if my insurance policy covered things like this. Here he comes, Charlie. Give him a good one. I'm on him. Come on, Tojo. Come and get it. He's coming up to you. Hit him. Right. Left, pilot. Left a little. There, you son of a... Right in the kisses. There he goes. Looks very discouraged from here. Where's the other one, Charlie? He went further down the line, I think. Yeah, they got him. All clear, Skipper. Nice work, you guys. We're coming in now. We'll be bombing from 20,000, so you better take some oxygen. Hey, Martin, is the United Press still with us? Yep. Yeah, I'm still here. Anybody want to trade a machine gun for a portable typewriter? <laughs> in college, they always told me words were bullets. Better put on your oxygen mask now. We're going up, and you'll need some lung juice in your blood if we have to bail out. Okay, but give me a couple of weeks' notice before I have to jump, will you? I'll try. Stand by, everybody. I went back and stood by the bomb compartment so that I could look down and see what was underneath when the bomb doors opened. Pilot to Bombardier. Leading element is moving to the left. They must be on. Can you see anything yet? 
Yes, yeah, Skipper, I can see the high form waterworks about three miles ahead and to the left. Better get set. Okay, take over. Bomb doors open. The heavy bomb doors swung open slowly. From there, far below, I could see the waterfront of high form. Then suddenly, the air was filled with little black puffs of smoke that went slowly drifting by. I realized the anti-aircraft flak batteries of the Japanese had gone into action. API is on. How do you want it, Bombardier? As she goes. Altitude 20,000, check. 20,000, check. Ground speed 170, check. 170, check. It's all yours. By now, the flak had become very thick, although I couldn't hear it at all. It looked as though it was quite far down and harmless. Now and then, brilliant tracer bullets went past silently like red ribbons in the sky. I could see that we were getting over the busiest part of the harbor. Left one, two degrees, Skipper. Like that, that's fine. Steady. Right a trifle. Good. Steady. Steady. Bombs away. I stood there beside the bomb racks and watched the big 500-pounders go streaming out silently and deadly. They almost seemed suspended in the air. I could see the little propeller on the tip of each bomb wind itself off the shaft thus arming the bomb to explode on contact. For a while, they drifted along under the plane like little fish swimming in a bowl. Finally, I couldn't see them anymore. Then suddenly, there were great mushrooms of fire and smoke everywhere on the docks below. Then a roaring burst of flame and oily black smoke seemed to come almost up to our plane itself. And the concussion rattled us around like peas in a pod. Must have been an oil tank. Nice shooting, Bombardier. All bombs gone? All gone, Skipper. Then what do you say we go down and shoot them up a bit? How about it, Gunners? That's for me, Skipper. Oh, boy. Okay, hang on. Here we go. I'd already had all the fun I wanted for one day, but the boys wanted to show me a good time. So we went down to a couple of hundred feet off the ground, went roaring up and down the waterfront, shooting everything in sight. I'm forever going. with you. Okay, no skin off my back. Went on like that for 20 minutes or so. By the time we got through, there wasn't much Jap equipment left in Haiphong Harbor without bullet holes in it. Finally, the ammunition began to run low and the bombers headed for home. We were still 20 minutes away from our base when the starboard engine began to sputter. I'd been writing up my notes on the raid, but I suddenly decided to pay more attention to what was going on at the moment. Pilot here. Stand by, everybody. We may be running into trouble. Radio, transmit me. Go ahead, Skipper. Red leader from Army 49607. Red leader from Army 49607, acknowledge. Army 49607 from Red leader. Go ahead. My number one engine is failing. Can't keep up with the formation. We'll try to come in, but may have to make emergency landing. See you later. Okay, Army 49607. Keep horsing it. Good luck. Thank you. With that, we sparred off and went out of the formation. A mighty lonely feeling to see the other bombers gradually pull out of sight ahead. A fierce tropical storm shut down all around us. We were alone somewhere over North China, the most desolate country in the world. Pilot here, all hands put on parachutes and stand by to abandon ship. The gas gauges weren't working properly. The engines might cut out at any moment. We were flying blind by this time, and the ship was rocking from side to side in sudden flurries of rain and wind. No one said anything, but none of us felt too happy about the idea of jumping out in the gray blank that was everywhere below us. Pilot here, I'm going down and try to find a hole in these cloud banks. I'll level off at 12,000 or less. And if we hit a clear spot, I'll try for an emergency. If I can't make it, I'll give you the word and you'll bail out. The newspaper man goes first. Good luck, everybody. Good luck, sir. We went down slowly, trying not to lose any more altitude than we had to. The navigator helped me on with my parachute and checked the fastenings, then gave me quick instructions on what to do when I jumped. We shook hands. Pilot here. Looks like a break in the clouds up ahead. Keep a sharp lookout, everybody. I'm going through. Navigator to pilot. Hello, Skipper. See anything, Oli? Yeah, I think so, Skipper. That crooked map. Isn't that our Andro landmark, the May West? I think it is. Sure it is. We're home. Hallelujah! In a few moments, we could make out our base. We managed to get in before the gas ran out and the motors conked out completely. Hagen made a perfect landing, and when we crawled out of the ship, the boys who had gotten in ahead of us gathered around a wisecrack about walking home and to pound us on the back as a sign that they were glad to see us again. 
Before I started writing my account of the raid, I looked in on General Cheneau in operations headquarters. He told me... Every plane returned safely from Haiphong. We hit the shipping where it hurt. It was a good show, Martin. And it was a good story, too. Altogether, the bomber flight rained 14 tons of demolition bombs and incendiaries over the shipping and dock installations. One bomber, piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Morgan of Freedom, Pennsylvania, sank a 15,000-ton Jap ship. And between us, the rest of the flight managed to sink or damage several smaller ships. When we left Haiphong, we could see the fires we had started until we were 80 miles away. Yes, it was a good show. I'm glad I went along. I'll have to confess I'm also pretty well pleased about getting back. Like Robert P. Martin, many United Press correspondents on every fighting front are braving gunfire or capture, facing tension, hardship, and danger. They carry no rifles or machine guns, these U.P. men, but their duty is as great and honorable as that of the fighting men they accompany. For their task is to get the news and send it back to their countrymen. We will be back soon with another story of these soldiers of the press. Be sure to listen. And meantime, listen for United Press News on the air. Look for United Press dispatches in your favorite newspaper. It is your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from another world who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend the steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. But before we join Superman, here is an important message. Say, hey, fellas and girls, ever try one of those quiz games in your gang? My pal Jerry Link and I started one the other day with his best friend, and we sure had a busy time of it. Okay, Tommy, it's your turn. What's a catafighter? <laughs> uh, no, no, no fair telling him. Now, come on, Tommy, what's a catafighter? Give up? Yeah, I give up. All right, Jerry, you tell him. Oh, that's easy. A catafighter is one of those little planes a merchant ship carries. They launch it by catapult. Only you can't get a catafighter back aboard because those ships don't carry hoisting equipment. It stays right in the sea and the crew gets picked up by boat. Good for you, Mr. King. Oh, now, here's yours. What country invented dive bombers? Oh, that's easy. Germany. No, no, no you're wrong. Gee, are you dumb? The United States Navy invented dive bombing. Uh-oh. Okay, Jerry, if you're so smart, see if you can answer this one. What is a vitamin? Hmm? A uh, vitamin. A uh, vitamin. <laughs> Well, uh, a vitamin is a... Well, it's a... Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, gang, I can tell you right now, very few people actually know just exactly what a vitamin is. But we do know what vitamins can do for us. You see, it's this way. None of you can expect to grow up really strong and husky unless you eat right. And eating right includes getting all your vitamins. And I can't think of a better way to start getting two mighty important vitamins, B1 and D than by ducking into a swell, big bowl full of delicious Kellogg's Pep for breakfast. Yes, sir, it's that easy. And gosh, anybody who's lucky enough to have had a taste of crisp, crunchy Pep knows what a super delicious cereal it really is. So how's about doing yourself a double favor, hey, gang? Just ask your mother to get you a package of delicious Kellogg's Pep tomorrow and start right now having a mighty swell-tasting breakfast that's mighty swell for you. Remember the name now, Pep, P-E-P. Pep is made by Kellogg's in Battle Creek, Michigan. And now, the adventures of Superman. As you know, Dr. Leander Cameron, eccentric scientist, believing there are possibilities in the mechanical man, has set about building one with the financial backing of the Daily Planet. Unknown to Dr. Cameron and his friends, Clark Kent, Lois Lane, and Editor Perry White, dark forces are already at work planning to seize the mechanical man when it's completed. As we resume our story, we find ourselves in a lavish penthouse apartment in a very fashionable part of Metropolis. In the apartment, we see a tall, thin man dressed in a jet-black dressing gown who is seated before an open fireplace. 
He has a hawk-like face with a sharp nose and small beady eyes set deep in his head. At this moment, he is engaged in cleaning and polishing a beautiful pearl-handled revolver. An oak panel door opens somewhere in the room behind him. Yes, gentlemen? The gentleman who called is here, sir. Excellent. Show him in. Very good, sir. Will you follow me, sir? Sure. You are James Mansfield Blood? That's right. And you are the vulture? Yes. Sit down, Mr. Blood. Thanks. Nice layout you got here, vulture. Thank you. I am fond of elegant surroundings. Yeah, so I see. Pretty flossy, I'd say. Well, everybody to his own taste. Now, look. Before I hire you for this job I want done, I'd like to know if you can do like you say you can do. You mean procure the model of the mechanical man for you? Yeah, that's right. I have no doubt about that. I am not the head of my profession for nothing, Mr. Flood. There isn't anything I cannot accomplish. The vulture always finds a way. Well, that's what they tell me. You're kind of a jack of all trades, ain't you? I prefer to think of myself as a master of all trades, Mr. Blood. You sound okay to me. I say okay. Probably the finest actor and disguise artist in the world. I've always considered myself as great an artist in the matter of escape. As Houdini him, I never had the opportunity to match my ability against his. Well, I'm sure glad to have you working for me. If you help me, I can't miss. If you help me, I can't miss. In that, you are perfectly right. But let's get back to the mechanical man you want me to secure for you. Right. But it's... Secure for you. Right. But it's... Secure for you. Right. Just the model. There's a wacky old scientist named Dr. Leander Cameron who's working on it. This mechanical man is supposed to be able to see, talk, walk, and actually think. Sounds incredible. Are you sure? If what I've heard is true, yes. Dr. Cameron, they tell me, never takes on a job unless he's sure he can do it. He promised Editor Perry White of the Daily Planet that he would invent this mechanical wonder, and I'm sure he will. Interesting. A mechanical man who can walk, talk, see, and think. Positively intriguing. To say nothing of its value in hard coin of the realm. I'm told millions could be made out of such an invention. There isn't a government in the world who wouldn't pay plenty to possess the plans of such a device. By George, we could sell it to the highest bidder. We? <laughs> you mean I could. Remember about you. You're working for me. Oh, yes. I am working for you. I had forgotten for the moment. Uh, where is Dr. Cameron's laboratory located? All the dope is on this sheet of paper. I wrote it out for you so you wouldn't forget. Excellent. I shall begin at once to make inquiries as to the progress of the mechanical man. Within a short time after it is completed, it will be in my hands, never fear. Great. Then you can turn it over to me and collect your dough for doing the job. I'm afraid we're going to have a little difficulty about that, Mr. Blood. What do you mean? I've done very well at my business, Mr. Blood, as you can see. I haven't reached this position of comfort and financial security by working for others. I work for myself, Mr. Blood, and I work alone. Now, just a minute, Vulture. You've been very helpful in putting me onto this excellent opportunity. I'm grateful to you. However, business is business, and so... That revolver. Why are you pointing at me? Wait. No. You rang, sir? Yes, Judson. The gentleman seems to have overstayed his welcome. Take him away. And so enters our story, The Vulture, a villain destined to play an important role in the lives of our friends, especially in the life of Superman. Our scene now changes to the laboratory of Dr. Leander Cameron. Dr. Cameron is seated before a workbench on which stands a foot-high replica of the mechanical man. With several long instruments that look like needles, he is fitting something into the head of the mechanism. Nicodemus, Dr. Cameron's helper, stands by. Listen. Uh, uh, Nicodemus, hand me that tiny screw. Ask for a polite, you don't get it. Nicodemus, I cannot hold this piece of mechanism in place without that screw. Hand it to me. Not until you ask like I was a human being and not a slave. Very well, very well. Will you please hand me that screw, Nicodemus? Happy to, Doctor. Here you are. Thank you, Nicodemus. Thank you. You're welcome, Doctor. Hey, how's the mechanical man coming? You think you'll be able to perfect it? I should know in a few moments. I've only to put this part in place, and the mechanical man, that is, this model on the table before me, will be ready to perform. 
If it does as I expect it to do, I shall have been successful. The long screwdriver handed to me, Nicodemus. Please. Please. Yeah, there's the signal now. I'll go to the door. Ask who's there first. I'm expecting Clark Kent to watch my demonstration, but be sure before you admit him. Okay. Yeah, who's there? Clark Kent, Nicodemus. It's Kent, all right, Doc. I'll open up. Oh, Nicodemus. Hello, Mr. Clark. That's Cameron. Uh, you're a half hour early. I didn't expect you before 3.30. Oh, well, I had nothing particular to do this afternoon, Doctor. Thought I'd drop over earlier. Well, Kent, as it happens, you're just in time. Uh, there. That completes it. You mean your mechanical man is ready to be tested, Doctor? Yes, that is. The model is ready for testing. Uh, Nicodemus, bring me the control mechanism. If you please. <laughs> Good thing you went that. Oh, Kent, I'm terribly excited. Terribly excited. This little mechanical man standing on my workbench may be the forerunner of thousands like him. Mechanical men who can fly our planes, drive our tanks, march into battle against the enemy, an indestructible force against which Hitler and his satellites will be helpless. Uh, yes, 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 indeed, Doctor. You're quite right. Exactly, exactly. Uh, here's the control box. Ah, uh, thank you, Nicodemus, thank you. Now then, I will just plug it in here. So... And now, gentlemen, we are ready. As soon as the eyes of the mechanical man begin to shine, I shall give it certain commands. If it obeys them... Duck, they're shining now. It yeah. certainly look eerie. Two green lights shining in that square metal head. We are ready for the experiment. Now, my little man, I command you, walk toward me. Well, it's walking. Coming straight toward you. Jesus. Stop. I command you, Stop. Doctor, that's terrific. Congratulations, Doc. You've done it again. Ah, oh, gentlemen, let's not be premature. No, indeed, never be premature. Let us see now if the little man will talk. Repeat after me. I am a mechanical man. I am a mechanical man. Great heavens, Doctor. That's astounding. A simple scientific achievement, actually, Kent. The reaction of sound waves on a mechanism similar to a talking machine, but... Come, come, I'm anxious to see if the mechanism can think for itself. As you see, I have erected a difficult obstacle. I'll tell the mechanical man to walk to the other end of the table. Let us see if he has the brain power to overcome the obstacle. Little man, walk to that end of the table. Amazing, simply amazing. Yes, by heavens, he's walking toward the obstacle. He's reached the obstacle and stopped. Now let us see what he does. Look, he's moving around it. He's turned to the side and moved right around it. There, he stopped. Brother, that's thing. Doc, you've really done it again. That mechanism can see, talk, walk, and think for itself. What you looking so funny about, Doc? A man of metal that can think for itself. I hope, gentlemen, we've not invented something we shall not be able to control. In the hands of the wrong people, this invention could do as much harm as good. We must guard it carefully, gentlemen, most carefully. And don't worry about that, Doc. Matter of fact, you can forget the mechanical man altogether. I'm taking over from here. What's that, Kent? Kent, that pearl-handled revolver in your hand. You're pointing it straight at me. Kent, what's the meaning of this? What's the big idea? For well, one thing, I want that model of the mechanical man. For another thing... I am not careful, Nicodemus. Shelter and Juniper, now that I really look at him, that man is not Clark Kent. No. No, I see that now myself. He's wearing a clever disguise. But if you're not Clark Kent, who are you? I, Dr. Cameron, am called the Vulture. Shocked into speechlessness, Dr. Cameron and Nicodemus can only stand and stare at the strange-looking individual who only a moment ago had appeared to be Clark Kent. In just a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Superman. But right now, here is another important message. Say, gang, how many of you are lucky enough to have a dog at your house? Well, I'll bet you take just about the finest care in the world of him, and you make sure he gets plenty of the right kind of husky. And you know, the same thing applies to every one of us, too. Well, you can't expect to be a really strong, sturdy fellow or girl unless you eat right, which includes getting all your vitamins. And say, when you start the day with a bowl full of super delicious Kellogg's Pep for breakfast, you're on the way to getting two mighty important vitamins, B1 and D. So don't waste any time treating yourself to one of the best doggone breakfast cereals you ever put a spoon to. Ask your mother to get you a package of delicious Kellogg's Pep tomorrow. And remember, 
Pep, pep. Get in step. Make your cereal Kellogg Pep. And now, back to Superman. With a sinister evil grin on his face, the vulture snatches up the model of Dr. Cameron's perfected mechanical man. To what nefarious ends will the vulture turn Dr. Cameron's amazing invention? And will Superman be able to prevent the impending catastrophe? Well, be sure to be with us tomorrow and every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station. Tune in and follow The Adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look! Look in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Follow the adventures of Superman every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station. Superman is directed by George Lothar and is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. This is Mutual. Speed of light, the cloud of dust, and a hearty hi Silver, the Lone Ranger. Faithful Indian companion Tonto, the masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. The stories of his strength and courage, his daring and resourcefulness, have come down to us through the generations. And nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoof beats of the great horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver! Faster, boy, faster! Daniel, the 14-year-old boy who had proved to be his nephew, was a source of great satisfaction to the Lone Ranger. He admired Dan's quick thinking, courage, and eagerness to learn. Consequently, the three horsemen were now inseparable. The Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Dan riding the wild trails of the high border country. They made camp a short distance from the small mining town of Spearhead. Tonto and Dan had visited the post office to pick up a letter addressed to the Lone Ranger. That errand accomplished, they walked toward the hitch rack where their horses were waiting. As they passed the Rainbow Cafe, something in the window caught Dan's eye. Oh, wait a minute, Tonto. Look, here in the window. I've never seen such a big collection of holsters and gun belts. Golly, look at them. Uh... This Rainbow Cafe, man who own this place, buy and sell plenty gun belts all time. Look at that one over in the corner, the one with the fancy beadwork on it. Oh, that looked like Indian make it. That plenty good belt. Gee, 
I'd like to have a belt like that. Wonder how much it is. Um, do not know. Well, I've got almost six dollars. Let's go and see if that'll buy it. Ah. What'll it be, Jids? Thirsty or hungry? Well, neither one. You've got a lot of gun belts in the window. Are they for sale? Oh, sure, Sonny. It's the finest collection of hardware harness in the whole Northwest. Some of them used and some brand new. Well, how much are they? Oh, different prices. You asking about any one special? Well, there's a belt and holster hanging over on the right side. There, that one right there, with the beadwork on it. Oh, you mean this one? Yeah. Yeah, this is one of the fanciest rigs in the layout. Not brand new. In fact, it's second hand, but it's a real bargain. Well, how much? Fifteen dollars. Oh. Well, I didn't think it would be that much. This is a fine piece of leather, son. Look at that beadwork. Somebody put in a lot of hours making this. Oh, yeah, I like it, but the price is too high. Well, not for this rig. There's quite a history behind it. Is that so? Son, this outfit used to belong to Trigger Trenton, one of the toughest outlaws who ever thumbed the hammer of a forty-five. Trigger Trenton? Oh, well, he's dead, isn't he? Yeah, might as well be. He's doing life in the territorial prison. Yes, sir, this holster and belt used to belong to Trigger. Well, even so, the price is still more than I want to spend. I really don't want the whole thing anyway. I don't carry a gun. The part I'm interested in is a belt. Only want the belt, eh? Well, maybe we can make a deal. Oh, I'll give you six dollars for it. Cash. Sold. You speak right up, son. That's the way I like to do business. Oh, here's your money. And here's your belt. Anything else? No, that's all. Come on, Tano. Uh-huh. Gee, this is a fine belt. Oh, uh-huh, you like it? Steady, boy. It's the best one I ever owned. You think it really used to belong to Trigger Trenton? No, me not know. Sometimes man who want to sell tell plenty big lie. Oh, I don't care who used <laughs> to own it. It's mine now. Get that boy. Get him up, Scout. <laughs> Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Oh, 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 you two are back early. Ah, uh, uh, me get letter. Ah, uh, yeah. Thanks, Tutter. I got something, too, while we were in town. You did? What is it, Dan? Look, gun belt with beadwork on it. Hmm, that is pretty fancy, isn't it? Where's the holster that goes with it? Oh, I just bought the belt. I don't need a holster. It's a fine piece of leather, Dan. Where'd you get it? At the Rainbow Cafe. There are a lot of them in the window. Yes, I've noticed that. Excuse me a minute, this letter may be important. Strange. Bad news? Not exactly. It's from the warden of the territorial prison. He's a friend of mine. Territorial prison? Where's that? Many miles east of here, Dan. I have to start right away. Well, why are we going there? We aren't going. I'll ride alone. You and Tonto wait for me here. Oh, but I thought it's a I... a question of time. One man rides faster than three. Here, Silver. Here, I'll read you this letter from the warden. That explains it. He says, Convict Flint Crawford is near death. He wants to see you. Claims he has vital information to get off his conscience. Maybe something about the disappearance of money from that express robbery five years ago. I suggest you come as soon as possible. Well, what's it all mean? Well, Dan, it all goes back about five years. Todd and I were able to help a sheriff trap an outlaw who had just completed a $50,000 express robbery. You remember that, Todd? Ah. Uh-huh. The outlaw was captured all right. The money has never been found. Oh, then this Flint Crawford the warden has written about it. That outlaw. He received a life sentence. Now, he's evidently ill and near death. Well, you think he's going to tell you where the money is? Steady, Silver. <laughs> I don't know, Dan. At the time of his capture, he swore he'd kill me. But sometimes crooks change their minds, especially in prison. Well, when will you be back? It shouldn't take me over four or five days at the most. Now, this is a good camp here. Oh, we'll be all right. Uh, Dan Tonto, get along plenty fine. Good. I'll see you both later. Adios. Come on, Silver. Two days later, when the Lone Ranger arrived at the territorial prison, the warden took him directly to the cell block that housed the dying convict named Flint Crawford. As they reached an inner door, the warden called to a trusty who seemed to be waiting for them. Warren. Tom Warren. Yes, sir. Take this man to Flint Crawford's cell. Yes, sir. I'll wait for you in the office. Sir. Crawford wants to talk to you alone. Thanks, warden. And don't worry about your guide here. He's Tom Warren, one of my trustees. I'm sure we'll get along. Yes, sir. I'll take you to Flint's cell. Just follow me. Flint. Yes. 
There's a masked man here to see you. Warden said to bring him in. Oh, yes. Thanks, Tom. I'll wait here in the hall. Well, Crawford, I've come a long way in answer to your request. <coughs> I don't think you got here any too soon. I'm just about to cash in my chips. The warden said you wanted to see me about something special. Yes. I've been doing a lot of thinking since I've been in here. Most men do. I was quite an odd hoot before the law caught up with me. It was really you who finally nailed me. It was bound to happen sometime. <laughs> now I'm going to die. They wanted to tell you I don't hold any grudges. I'm glad to hear it. There's something else. Remember that gold from the express robbery? Nobody's ever found it, have they? Not that I know of. I knew they wouldn't. Not where I've got it hid. But I can't take it with me, so I'm going to tell you where it is. The express company will be very grateful. <laughs> Listen. Bend over close. I can't talk loud, because one of the Ketch gang might hear me. You mean Tom and Floyd Ketch? I, uh, I thought they were outlaw friends of yours. They used to be. Before that last job. Then they double-crossed me, so I took the money and lit out. That was just before you caught me. I understand. There's no danger they catch brothers over hearing you here. I ain't so sure of that. I think one of them is doing time in here under another name. Have you ever seen him? No. But I've been flat my back here in this cell. He could be here and I'd never see him. What did you want to tell me about the money? Well, it's like this. I don't hate you anymore. And I want it to be you who delivers the gold back to its rightful owner. Where is it? <laughs> I can't talk much. I'm getting weak. Just before you nailed me, I had a gun belt in the holster that used to belong to Trigger Tread. Well, about the gold, I wrote it all out. Two pieces of paper. Put one of them in the belt... One in the holster. Get that outfit. You'll find the whole story. Where is this gun belt now? I sold it to Leif Keller. He runs a cafe in Spearhead. Yes? I figured nobody had ever traced it that way. Directions to the gold's hiding place are written on two pieces of paper. And they're in the gun belt and holster that used to belong to Trigger Trenton. That's right. I'll find it. You'll go after it personally? Yes. Thanks. It's all I wanted to know. Now I can do it without me. I wonder what that is. Sounds like a break. Gordon, what's wrong? The prisoner just went over the wall. I'm sending a posse right out. The middle of the day is an odd time for prison break. Which convict was it, do you know? Well, that's the worst part. It's the trustee who brought you in here. Trustee? You mean Tom Warren? Yes, but I've discovered something else. He was serving time here under an alias. His real name was Tom Ketch. Ketch? Did you say Tom Ketch? Yes. Did you know who he was? No, but I know why he made the break. You heard what I told the Lone Ranger. He's going after that gold. So am I. What's this all about? I'll tell you later, Warden. I hope you get there first. Honest, I do. <laughs> well, that's the end of Flint Crawford. He's dead. Yes, Warden. But he told me how to find the express company's gold, and I'm going after it. The Lone Ranger rode day and night to reach Spearhead in as short a time as possible. It was midnight of the second day before he arrived at the camp where Tonto and Dan were waiting. He told them what had happened at the territorial prison and gave Dan definite instructions. Sometime later, a grim-faced rider dressed in the gray denim of a prisoner flung himself from the back of an exhausted horse and knocked at the rear door of the Rainbow Cafe. Kitch! Tom Ketch. I thought you were. Never prison. mind what you thought. I'm in a hurry. Listen, someplace among that leather junk you've got in the window there is a belt and holster that used to belong to Trigger Trenton. Uh, not anymore. What do you mean? Well, the holster's there, but I sold the belt. Sold it? Sold it to a kid about four days ago. Why? That holster and belt have got the answer to where Flint Crawford hid that express money. Fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. Hurry up. Go in there and get me that holster. Tell me why I can find the kid who has a belt. But I don't, don't know. Don't argue. Hurry. Split the money 50-50. Hey, wait here. 
So Crawford thought he was turning it all over to that master hombre. <laughs> well, well, here's the horse, Tom. I had to sneak it out real fast. What do you mean? This is your place, ain't it? Oh, yeah, but I didn't want to act suspicious. About what? The kid that bought the belt. He's standing out there right now. Wants to buy this holster to match it. What? Hey, you're packing a gun. Give it to me. What do you want it for? Give me that gun. Oh, open that door. Not far. Just enough so I can get a line on that kid. Well, Tom, you can't do that. The cafe's full of people. What do I care? I'll blast the kid and you grab the belt off of him. Tom, I can't. Open that door. Uh, which one is he? Up there in front. Standing by that engine. All right. I'll throw a slug into his back. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. from the gun of Tom Ketch missed Dan by a fraction of an inch. The killer was about to fire again, but the first shot had thrown the crowded cafe into a panic, and in the confusion, Tonto signaled to Dan. Dan! Say, I think that shot was aimed at Come, me. Come, we leave plenty fast. Quick, horse it over here. Steady, boy. There must be some reason for no, shooting. No talk. Right, tell Lone Ranger. Get up, tell him boy. Get up. missed him. Who is that kid? Do you know? I never saw him till four days ago when he walked in here and bought that belt. I'll find him. It won't take long. So I've had the way to find $50,000 in gold all this time. Laying in the window in that old belt and holster. Yeah. And we're the only two that know about it? Are you sure? Crawford knew. He's dead by now. Well, that leaves just you and me. 25000 apiece. No. You're wrong, Leif. I've been thinking it over. It doesn't leave you and me... It just leaves me. No. No, Tom, no. No, no, Tom, no, no. Now, if I can find that kid, it's all mine. Did you see who was doing the shooting? No. We not see Plenty people in cafe. When we first went in, the man that sold me my belt took a holster out of the window and went in the back room. Was it the beaded holster we're looking for? Well, I couldn't tell he moved so fast. The first thing we'll do is look into that back room at the Rainbow Cafe. Come on, Zulu. Get up, boy. Come. There's a door over there. Come on. Uh. Whoever shot at me has the holster. It's no good without the belt. That's a dangerous part of it. Quiet. Well, I'll try this door. This must be the back room. Oh, you can hear the people in the cafe. Uh, wait. I'll light a match. Oh, there's nothing here. Look. Oh, man on the floor. He's been shot. What's oh, the man who sold me my belt? Then he isn't the one who tried to kill you, Dan. You're right. The first one of the moves gets just what Leif gets. Oh, it's... A man I met at the prison, Dan. His name is Ketch. Tom Ketch. Before that match burns out, reach over and light the lamp. Good idea. 
Yes, ma'am. So you found the kid with the belt, huh? We've known each other for quite a while. I'm giving you just three counts to hand it over. One, two... Give him the belt, Dan. Give him the belt? There's nothing in it worth risking your life for. Oh, but Hand I... it over. Here. Now you're starting to get smart. Stand where you are. Don't move. Any of you. Oh, now he's got them both. The belt and the holster. We follow Crook? Yes, Toto. That's as soon as we can. Hey, Lave. The men in the cafe. Lave! Lave! Quick, you and Toto get to the horses. I'll handle this. Lave, what's wrong? Open up! Shot. Mass man, you killed him. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't kill this man. It's cold blooded murder. Arrest him, Sheriff. Stranger, you better. Keep your guns in leather. I'll shoot the first man that draws. Now, listen, all of you. Leif Keller was dead when I came through the back door a few minutes ago. I didn't kill him. He's lying. Do your duty, Sheriff. But I know who did kill him. And I'm going after that man. Watch out, Sheriff. He's edging towards the door. You better not try it. I can't get away while the lamp's burning. I'll try it in the dark. <laughs> We got away, Sheriff. Come on, men. Saddle your horses. We'll trail that critter. Knowing that Tom Ketch would follow the directions of the note hidden in the belt, the Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Dan headed straight for Sunburst Basin. It was really a broad hollow of volcanic rock that nestled at the base of high mountain peaks. Under the bright rays of the morning sun, each separate rock formation sparkled and shone like a giant jewel. Although the hollow was nothing but wasteland, it was in truth sunburst basin. The masked man, Tonto and Dan, reined up their horses sharply at the edge of a winding trail. Oh, gosh, no sign of Tom Ketch. We'll find him. We know he's looking for an abandoned gold mine somewhere in the northeast corner of this basin. Sheriff's posse on our trail. Me hear him. I know it, Tonto. We've got to find Ketch before the posse finds us. Well, how can we the find... The biggest thing in our favor, Dan, is the basin. Hoof marks are almost impossible to follow on this hard ground. You hear him? Yes, it's a posse, all right. It's our signal to get out of sight. Come on, Silver. Get him up, Scott. Get up, boy. <laughs> In the meantime, Tom Ketch had split open the beaded holster and belt and pieced the note together. Following the instructions, he had arrived at a small clearing a few hundred feet from the abandoned gold mine. There he dismounted and read the note again to be sure he had made no mistake. Yeah, let's see. Go to the northeast corner of Sunburst Basin. There's an abandoned gold mine. Right by the tool shed, you'll find a scrub pine tree. Take a 45 and draw a bead between the window of the tool shed and the trees. If you shoot straight, you'll drill a hole in the wall of the shed that will show you the way to the gold. Signed, Flint Crawford. <laughs> that Crawford was a pretty slick hombre. <laughs> Somebody coming. It's that mass critter with the engine and the kid. Come on, horse. You and me will duck out of sight in one of these gullies. There's the mine and the tool shed. Uh, Ketch isn't here. I wonder if... Maybe he couldn't find the place. I doubt it, Dan. Tom Ketch worked this country as an outlaw, and he'd be able to find... Anything. Even a meddling critter like you. Ketch. Put up your hands and keep them there. So you were here ahead of us. This is the second time you've tried to grab something that belongs to me. You're talking about the gold that Flint Crawford buried up here. I think the express company has first claim to it. It's mine, and I'm taking it. Your hands up, all of you. There's a posse headed this way, Ketch. Posse? You're lying. The sheriff broke into the back room of the cafe just after you left. They're looking for the man who murdered Leif Keller. Looking for the... And they think it's you, don't they? <laughs> well, it's good. Maybe. Walk over here. Keep reaching. You make one move toward that hard or I'll blast you. Now... Yeah, just take these two guns of yours and drop them. I'll feel better with them out of your reach. Yeah. Now, you're not going to be around very long, so you might as well know that I know who you are. Is that so? Sure. You're the Lone Ranger. You're the one who helped the lawman catch Flint Crawford. At least your facts are right. The only thing I can't figure out is why he turned soft and called you in to tell about that gold. What do you intend to do with us? First... 
Just so you'll know what you missed, I want you to read both pieces of Flint's note. Yeah. Go on, pick it up and read it. Hmm. Take a forty-five and draw a bead between the window of the tool shed and the tree. If you shoot straight, you'll drill a hole that will show you the weight of the gold. Same, Flint Crawford. <laughs> See what you missed out on? What do you need us for? I don't. So I'm going to march you right over to that ledge the other side of the shed. Then, as soon as I dig up the gold, I've got a lead slug for each one of you. All right. Keep your hands up and start walking. Move. Say, I know this place. I've been up here a lot of times. What's that, Dan? Oh, I didn't recognize it from the way we came up. Is it really an abandoned mine? Yes, but that tool shed is talking Shut about... Shut up! Any chance of you hombres getting away, so stop talking about it. Keep moving. See? Look at it. It isn't an ordinary tool shed. The bottom part is made of stone. I see. Mm, yes. Yes, I think I understand. What's that you're blabbing about? I think I understand now why Crawford wrote out those instructions. And why he was so anxious for me to get the gold. Yeah? Well, thinking so, all you're going to get out of it. All right. Stop right here. There's something you should know, Ketch. Don't fire that gun, because if you do... Never you're... mind the palaver. But I'm trying to help you. Shut I up, wanna... or I'll drill you now. Now I'm going back and put a hole through that tool shed. But in the meantime, I've got you critters pushed up here in plain sight. You make a move over here, I'll plug, you understand? Perfectly. And don't think you can run faster than I can shoot. I'll have my eye on you. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, I do, Dan. Look at Ketch. If he draws a bead on that shed while he's standing by the pine tree, you'll have to shoot down. Hunter's not savvy. There isn't time to explain, Tonto. Just hug the ground. Look, he's going to shoot. Three men watched intently as Tom Ketch stood by the distant pine tree and leveled his gun according to the instructions of Flint Crawford's note. They noticed he was careful to keep one eye on them, although it wasn't necessary. They waited on the ledge and made no attempt to escape. Suddenly, as they watched, flames spat from Ketch's 45. Dan was right, Tato. That was a powder shed, not a tool shed. Come on. I'm glad our horses were far enough back to keep away from the blast. Yes. Look at this. Oh, that plenty big hole in ground. There must have been 200 pounds of blasting powder stored in the bottom of that shed. Oh, gee, we were really lucky. Suppose we'd got here first and fired that bullet instead of catch. We would have no, been... No, Dan, you'd have recognized the shed. Oh, look here. Side of hole. There's a big box here. Bound with iron. Why, look... Yes, it says Wells Fargo Express Company. And the stolen gold is probably inside. Why, then Flint Crawford did bury it here. Yes, Dan. And he planned that I would be the one to fire that bullet. Golly. Well, that's Sheriff's posse. They finally pick up trail. Shall we go? Just stay where you are, Dan. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, sir, Sheriff. Masked man, the engine, and the cage. Put up your hands. It must have been them who set off the blast. You're wrong. The man who set off this blast is lying right over there against that rock. Dead. There is a critter over there, Sheriff. The same man who murdered Leif Keller last night. Tom Ketch. Tom Ketch? You don't mean the outlaw who escaped? Go over and take a look. He's right, Sheriff. It is Ketch. And right beside that hole is a strong box stolen from the express company five years ago. Well, I'll be... Get my guns, Tonto, and bring the horses. Uh -huh. Me get them. Ketch escaped from territorial prison three days ago, Sheriff. Will you write the warden and tell him what happened? Why, sure, but why... Our you... job is done. Thanks, Tonto. Come on, Dan. He's a big fella. Steady, boy. <laughs> Be ready. Now, will you take that gold back to Spearhead and turn it over to the express company? I'll take care of it. Come on, Silver. Hit him up. Come Get up, boy. Are you letting him get away, Sheriff? Sure, I'm letting him get away. I thought I recognized that masked man, and I just remembered who he is. I'm Silver!
you have just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont. Tonight we bring you a story based on facts of our Navy in action with Edwin Jerome of the Cavalcade Players in the role of the submarine commander in Diary on a Pig Boat, an original Saturday evening post story by Frederick C. Painton, made into a radio play for Cavalcade by Stuart Hawkins. Ralph Bellamy, who was to have been with us tonight, will be Cavalcade star January 25th. As a special guest tonight, we will present at the close of our play, Lieutenant Commander Willard A. Saunders, who recently was awarded the Navy Cross for distinguished service. In accordance with naval regulations, all names of ships, places, and individuals mentioned in this broadcast are fictitious. The technical references and operational details are authentic, but are so employed as not to give aid or comfort to the enemy. Starring Edwin Jerome in Diary on a Pig Boat on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont. Zero, 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 zero to zero, four, zero, zero hours. Sea calm. Slight ground swell. Wind force zero. Barometric pressure 3010. Air temperature 78.5. Water temperature 80 zero. Course 165. Cruising on service. That's the terse, prosaic way the Navy describes a calm and beautiful night in the Western Pacific. And through the darkness, a long, low sliver of steel slides leisurely along. Its narrow deck awash. Only its conning tower clear of the water. Night is a respite for this ship. From dawn to dusk she must prowl below the surface. For she is on offensive patrol in enemy waters. And is the hunted as well as the hunter. On the conning tower bridge, young Ensign Waller is watch officer. What time is it, quartermaster? 4.47, sir. Not long till dawn. The sky's beginning to lighten a bit in the east already. You better call the skipper. Yes, sir. No need of that, Mr. Waller. I'm up already. Morning, sir. Morning. You didn't get much sleep, did you? Oh, enough. Excited anything? Nothing, sir. The ocean's been empty as a church on a Monday morning. Hmm. How's she heading, Franklin? 165 on the nose, sir. Right. No trouble holding her on the mouth tonight, eh? No, sir. Easy as steering a baby buggy this weather. What do you know about baby buggies? You're not married, are you, Franklin? No, sir. But my sister's got a set of twins. I helped her wheel them when I was home last time. Oh, twins, eh? I thought I was the only man on board who'd wheeled a set of twins. Well, yours are your own, sir. Franklin's only a twin's uncle. Yes. I expect mine have about outgrown that double-barreled pram by now. Well, kids can do a lot of growing in a year, I guess. Mm, they sure can. You'll see when you get one of your own. Oh, I won't worry about that till I've found out who's going to be its mother. That's still unsettled. This is well for you and her, too, until this business is over. I'm going below to the control room. Keep her on the same course and speed until we submerge at sunrise, Mr. Waller. Yes, sir. Same course and speed until we submerge. Morning, Gallagher. What's that I smell? Coffee? The cook would just do with a fresh pot, sir. Hey, Walsh! Walsh, come on back with that jamoke. The captain wants some. Yeah, I'll be right there in a minute. We'll be right here, sir. No hurry. <laughs> Three enemy destroyers, three points forward on the starboard beam. Five thousand miles away, heading straight for us, sir. Very well, Mr. Wallen. <laughs> Steering transferred to control, sir. Diesel stop. All ventilators closed, sir. Bridge secure, sir. Power hatch closed, sir. All ballast vents open, sir. Pressure in the boat. Take it to 60 feet, Mr. Mead. Full dive on the bow diving plane. Full dive on the bow plane. Aye, aye, sir. Ten degrees on the stern diving plane. Ten degrees on the stern plane. Aye, aye, sir. Motors ahead, 2,000 aside. Motors ahead, 2,000 aside, sir. Submerged, sir. 
There were just three destroyers, Mr. Waller? Uh, yes, sir. Headed right for us. But it was still too dark for them to have seen us. I mean, I, I think it was. Forty-five feet. All ahead normal. All ahead normal, sir. Propeller sounds. Bearing 7-4, sir. They're coming fast. Fifty feet. Fifty-five feet. Level off. Sixty feet. Sixty feet. Sixty feet. She's heavy forward. Pump from the forward to the aft trim tanks. Aye, aye, sir. That'll do. Final trim, sir. Level at 60. Propeller sounds. Bearing 8-1 now, sir. Closing in fast, too. I don't think they could have seen us. Bearing 8-4 now, sir. Looks like they'll go right over us. Maybe they've got better eyes than you think, Mark. No need to detect them here now. Whatever they had in their minds, it was us, Mr. Waller. Uh, I didn't think they saw us. Hey, Red. Red Franklin. Yeah. Didn't that note remind you of the Times Square subway station? Honest, Gallagher. More things can remind you of Times Square. Propeller sounds bearing 266. Receding. Those destroyers are in awful hurry, Captain. Just what I was thinking. They're the advance guard for something. And something rather important, I should say. Oh, whatever it is, we're inside the guard ring now. Stop all motors. Aye, aye, sir. All motors stop, sir. Listen all round, Tom. Destroyer propellers still bearing 266. But much fainter, sir. No. No, nothing but those destroyers, sir. Well, it's almost sunrise, topside. A few minutes more, it'll be light enough up there to use the periscope, Mr. Mead. Nothing on the sound detector, sir. Not even the destroyers now. Very well. All ahead, normal. Aye, aye, sir. All ahead, normal, sir. Take her up to periscope depth, Mr. Mead. We'll rise on the bow plane. We'll rise on the bow plane, sir. Level at periscope, yes, sir. Up periscope. Up periscope. Aye, aye. Light enough to see anything yet, Captain? Yeah. If there's anything to see. Don't look like he's fine enough. Quiet, Gallagher. Ah. He spotted something. Quiet. Enemy cruiser bearing 075 relative. Looks like a big one. Down periscope. The silhouette book, Mr. Wallace. Here you are, sir. Hmm. No. Ah, this is it. Japanese heavy cruiser over the Hura Tiger class. One of their newest. And biggest. Hot doggy. Up periscope. That's her, all right. Angle on the bow, 15 starboard. 10,000 yards. Mark. Mark. Bearing 232 true. Course 040 true. You are 2600 from the track. Enemy cruiser speed 20. Enemy cruiser speed 20. Down periscope. Aye, aye, sir. What do you make it, Mr. Mead? You've got 12 minutes to approach for a bow shot. A bow shot? Oh, baby. Hmm. I shall fire within 1,000 yards, Mr. Mead. Right, sir. All ahead, 3,000 aside. 20 degrees right rudder. To course 310. Aye, aye, sir. A bow shot to less than 1,000. Boy, this is going to be good. <laughs> You are listening to Diary on a Pig Boat, starring Edwin Jerome on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont. As our play continues, ten minutes have elapsed since Commander Haas has sighted a Japanese cruiser and has ordered his men to make ready for attack. All tubes ready for firing, sir. Very well, Waller. Enemy propeller sounds, bearing zero 08. Up periscope. Aye, aye, sir. Come right to course 315. Down periscope. Right to course 315, sir. Hold her on it. Slow to 1500 aside. 1500 aside, sir. Up periscope. Steady as she goes. Steady as she goes, sir. Stand by. Fire one. One fired, sir. Fire two. Two fired, sir. Fire three. Three fired, sir. Fire four. Four fired, sir. Down periscope. Full left rudder. Full left rudder, sir. Take her down to 100 feet, Mr. Mead. 
Full dive on the bow plane. All ahead, 3,000 to sight. Full dive on the bow plane, sir. 3,000 to sight, sir. And watch out. Them pencils don't slide off the chart table, Lieutenant. Yeah, I got them. How'd you look, Captain? Big as a house. If I didn't miss completely, we were hearing something at 55 seconds. <laughs> 50 seconds now. 50 feet. 55. 60 feet. All ahead normal. All ahead normal, sir. 80 feet. 85. 90. Check it with the bow plane. Aye, sir. 95. 98. Level off. Aye, aye, sir. 100. 100. 100. Final trim at 100 feet, Captain. Nice dive, Mr. Mead. Stop all motors. All motors stop, sir. Listen all around, Thompson. Cruiser propeller sounds. Speed unchanged, sir. Sure is warming up in here. Quiet. Any second now. Hot doggy. Two explosions on the starboard beam, sir. We heard him, you lug. Quiet. Only two, I guess. Two out of four isn't so bad, Skipper. Wow, what was that? That wasn't no torpedo. That must have been our magazines blowing up. Gallagher's right. You got to wear it hurts, Skipper. <laughs> Enemy propeller sounds of sea, sir. Yippee! Honorable Jaffe, don't feel happy. Pipe down. Those destroyers will be back here looking for us in a hurry now. All ahead, normal. All ahead, normal. Aye, aye, sir. In the logbook, the entry reads... Two explosions heard at 0544 hours. Another louder explosion, believed to be cruiser's magazines, heard at 0556. Believe enemy cruiser badly damaged or sunk. As enemy propeller sounds ceased with last explosion. Propeller sounds approaching, sir. Bearing 276. Stop all motors. There's more than one ship. Coming in fast. About 35 knots. The destroyer's all right. Rig for depth charge, Mr. Waller. Rig for depth charge. Pass the word to all compartments. Rig for depth charge. Rig for depth charge. Rig for depth charge. Get them watertight doors closed. Lively there. Franklin, pass out cotton for the men to put in their ears and see that they do it. Aye, aye, sir. All men not needed, lie down and brace yourselves. Get hold of something and hang on. We may be shaken up a bit. All watertight doors closed and down securely, sir. All right, Gallagher. Stuff that cotton in your ears or you'll be minus your hearing. Aye. Franklin, Boyd, Gallagher at your stations. Aye, 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 and sir. Thompson, of course. Yes, sir. Everybody else lie down. Rig for depth charge, sir. Very well. Enemy propellers within a thousand yards, sir. Speed and bearing unchanged. Hey, Red. See what I mean about Times Square subway station? All right, hang on, boys. They started laying their eggs. Don't remind me of Times Square at all, Gallagher. There go the lights. Just made them flicker, that's all. Right. Hang on. She'll ride herself. Ride on, cowboy. Oh, uh, I the lights again. Gallagher, switch on the battle lantern. Aye, sir. Oh, it's hurt, sir. He was thrown against the regulator valve. I ain't hurt. A little whack on the cog. They're moving away. How about those main lights? Main lighting circuit dead, sir. 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 We're below test step, sir. Blew us down a bit, didn't they? All ahead, normal. Aye, sir. What's the matter, Gallagher? No power on the starboard motor, sir. Only the port side's working. No power on the steering motor, sir. Shift to hand steering. Call the motor room, Gallagher. Aye, sir. Shifted to hand steering, sir. Shifted to hand control of both diving planes, sir. Main motor contactor panel on the starboard motor is broken, sir. Pressure hull is beginning to crumble, sir. We're well below test. We'll have to take a chance on the hearing us. Take us up away, Mr. Mead. We'll raise that on the port motor. We'll rise on the bow planes. Aye, sir. We'll rise on the bow planes, sir. Cripes, is that depth needle stuck there? Beginning to rise, sir. Level off at 160 feet, Mr. Mead. A flashlight on chart table, Mr. Waller. Right here, sir. I thought so. Deep water here, but there's bottom at 180 feet, about 12 miles west. If we can get over there, we got a chance. Uh, we'll level off at uh, 160, Mr. Mead. Enemy propeller sounds returning, sir. What's our depth? 170, sir. 168. Stop the motor. 
Listen all round. Enemy propeller sounds approaching. Bearing 182 relative. Distance now about... Enemy propeller sounds stopped, sir. I thought he'd stop to listen pretty soon. Well, we'll outweigh him, that's all. We won't be able to control our depth very long without headway, sir. Long enough, I hope, Mr. Meade. How'd you cut your hand, Mr. Waller? Oh, it's nothing at all, sir. I must have scraped it against the aft elevator chain and we were being bounced around. You better have the pharmacist's mate look at it as soon as we're secure. Yes, sir. No propeller sound, sir. Depth 180, sir. 182. Losing steerage way, sir. No propeller sound, sir. Very well. 190. 193. Losing control of depth, sir. Very well. No propeller sound, sir. Ain't them guys going to start up their engines? Low test step, sir. Settling fast. So I see. Propeller sound, sir. Bearing 185 degrees and going away. Mm-hmm. Full rear stat on the port motor. Take her up to 100 feet, Mr. Meade. Step bombs. Bearing 185. Going away, sir. Those rats seem to be on the wrong scent now. Pass the word to secure from depth charge, Mr. Well. But in the logbook, it only says... Attacked by two enemy destroyers at 0628 hours. Three depth charges moderately close. No casualties. Lighting and electrical control systems damaged by shock. Main motor contactor panel on starboard motor out of order. Attack ended 0652 hours. We should be over the shallow bottom now. Take it down easy, Mr. Mead. Stop the motor. Half dive on the bow plane. Aye, sir. Half dive on the bow plane, sir. We should find bottom at 180 feet. Yes, sir. Depth 175. As soon as we're on bottom, see that the men are fed, Mr. Waller. Yes, sir. 180. 184. 186. Looks like the charts are wrong, Skipper. Our dead reckoning may be out of it. 190. Where the heck is that bottom? 193. We're down. Blood the regulator. Pass the word on the bottom. Mr. Mead, detail your repair crew. All others will lie down and stay quiet to conserve oxygen. say get that motor panel fixed. You've been here long enough for my money. Hey, boy. Got any gum? Uh, only what I'm chewing. Beginning to feel sort of sick. So hot in the air. Thought some chewing gum might help my stomach. What's the... What's the temperature reading now, Mr. Waller? 155. Huh. That all it is. We used to get it 120 back in Kansas, but it never felt like this. Uh, light a match, please, Mr. Waller. Look at that. Barely glowed for a second or two and went right out. Spread the CO2 absorbent powder. Bleed all oxygen bottles for 30 seconds, Mr. Waller. Yes, sir. Thank you. Boyd? Yes, sir. All right, sir. Oh, that helps a little. Four hours. Six hours. Nine hours. Still on the bottom. The air is so thick you can cut it into chunks. The heat under the pressure at this depth is like an oven. Men lie inert, stirring only when one of them coughs the queer straining cough. That's the prelude to nausea. And the hours drag on. And the repair crew works doggedly, speaking in hoarse whispers that are queerly audible through the five compartments of the silent tortured ship. And the logbook merely says... Still on bottom affecting repairs. Lead oxygen bottles at 1805 hours. One eight zero five hours. That's five minutes past 6 p.m. And still they're there. 6.30. 7 o'clock. The sun has set up above. Down here there's only heat and silence... 
and heads that ache from the closeness of the air. It's taking them so long in that motor room anyhow. Maybe Gallagher is daydreaming about Times Square as we're getting to work. Ah, no. <coughs> Fix him. Panel's his only chance of getting back to Times Square. He's working all right. He could be on the surface now if they'd snap out of it. <clears throat> the fresh air coming down that hatch. The stars winking. Hi, damn it. Hey, hey, lights. lights. I got them fixed anyhow. Lights, huh? fellas. All right. All right, Skipper. Oh. Lighting, electrical control, circuits repaired. And so is the main motor panel. Very well. Stand by to surface. Stand by to surface. All hands to stations. Snap into it, men. Oh, Here we go, boys. Express to the roof, huh? Depth 40 feet, sir. Stop. All motors. Aye, right, sir. Listen all round. What the heck? It's dark topside now. What's the delay about? Yeah? Suppose we should pop up in the middle of a Jap convoy. You want to breathe fresh air, not shell fire, don't you? No propeller sound, sir. All ahead, normal. Oh, number one tank. On the surface, sir. Open the conning tower hatch, Frankie. Yes, sir. Amy, you can taste the air. So fresh and cool. Transport to the bridge, Mr. Waller. Let the men off watch go topside by threes. Aye, sir. Smoking lamps lit for ten minutes below decks. Captain Ah, sir. Yes? What is it, Franklin? A fling debris on the port side, sir. The Japanese seaman's captain, a lot of junk that must be off that cruiser. The water's lousy with it. Hey, nice shooting, Skipper. It's midnight again. On the bridge, the skipper has the watch and is starting the new day's page of the logbook. He writes carefully, neatly. See, calm. Wind force, two. Barometric pressure, 3015. Air temperature, 76. Water temperature, 78. Another nice night tonight, eh, Gallagher? Yes, sir. We've sure been lucky in the weather this trip. A real nice run, I call it. Thank you, Edwin Jerome. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, Mr. Jerome will return to the microphone to introduce our special guest of the evening... Lieutenant Commander Willard Saunders of the United States Navy. Before we hear from him, we have a story of chemistry in today's world. Army Navy E for Excellence awards have now been announced for 17 DuPont plants in every part of the country for their performance in turning out many different kinds of war materials. The latest presentation, made a few days ago, is so extraordinary that we think you'd like to hear the story. The latest Army-Navy E went to the DuPont Company's Nylon Research Laboratory and Pilot Plant, one of very few awards made to a research group. These DuPont men and women aren't manufacturing tanks or planes on a production line. They're working with laboratory and research equipment, using their brains, their technical know-how, exploring the complicated process known as polymerization to increase constantly the military uses of nylon, now most widely used in parachutes. What the Army and Navy think of this kind of brain work as a contribution to winning the war is revealed by the words of Brigadier General Benjamin W. Chidlaw, who presented the award. Standing in the research laboratory where Nylon was born, General Chidlaw said, The production of new equipment must keep ahead of the needs of the armed forces. The weapons must be ready and waiting for the man, not the man for the weapons. Thus, in a very real sense, the research laboratory is the first line of defense, the first front the point where victory begins. General Chidlaw went on, in presenting to the men and women of this company the Army Navy E, both services are bestowing on you an official citation for distinguished service on that first line. And in concluding, the general said, here you have created and developed nylon. 
Here and in other DuPont plants, you manufacture it. The Army and the Navy need it. They need it quickly and in large quantities. It has been and will continue to be tremendously important to our Air Forces as a replacement for no longer available silk. The Armed Forces gratefully acknowledge this fact. Our millions of men in khaki and blue look to you for equipment to be used on the battlefronts, land, sea, and air, and they are thankful to you for your efforts, unquote. With this Nylon Award, 17 Army-Navy pennants now fly over DuPont plants. These pennants are symbolic of the wartime performance records of the DuPont Company, peacetime maker of better things for better living through chemistry. And now our star of the evening, Edwin Jerome. Ladies and gentlemen, we of the Cavalcade Players have great pleasure in welcoming tonight and now in presenting to you a young naval officer who has himself commanded a submarine. Lieutenant Commander Willard A. Saunders, United States Navy. Lieutenant Commander Saunders was awarded last November the coveted Navy Cross for Distinguished Service. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Commander Saunders. Thank you. Our submarine service has long been known as the silent service. That is... We're not given to saying much about ourselves, and we don't have a great deal of publicity. <clears throat> Tonight you have heard that silent service speak through the actors in this dramatization. Of course, they cannot really convey to you all that takes place, nor all that passes through our minds as we cruise beneath the surface. But this play has struck me as realistic and gripping. After hearing it, you will agree with me, I think, that too much credit cannot be given to the officers and enlisted men who are backing up the captain all the time. Their fighting spirit can't be beaten. Our submarines, and incidentally, because the public has clung to the name Pig Boat, don't think they are not clean, powerful, large, and pretty comfortable, for they are. Our submarines are carrying the war right to the enemy. They are continually on the offensive and getting results. This story tonight has shown you that our subs are sinking the rising sun. Ladies and gentlemen, before telling you of next week's program, I want to give a special message to young women between the ages of 18 and 35. Nursing is one of the critical woman power shortages of the war. 15,000 nurses have been taken from our hospitals into the Army and Navy Nurse Corps since Pearl Harbor. Thousands more are needed, both at home and in the field. If you are a citizen and have graduated from high school, won't you join the fight to help people keep well and get well? Next week, ladies and gentlemen, Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, presents Soldiers of the Tide, a story of the United States Marines on Guadalcanal. Our star will be the popular screen actor, Dennis Morgan. Don't forget next week, Dennis Morgan in Soldiers of the Tide, an exciting story of the fighting Marines on an island in the Pacific. The orchestra and original score on tonight's program were under the direction of Don Voorhees. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from DuPont. The appearance on this program of Lieutenant Commander Saunders does not necessarily constitute an endorsement of the sponsor's product by the Navy Department. The program came from New York... This is the National Broadcasting Company. Army Flash. One. Single. Low. Scene. Five, Paul, three. Overhead. South. Fighter.
Fighter Command of the United States Army Air Forces, in cooperation with West Coast radio stations, dedicates this official weekly radio program to the 150,000 volunteer civilian observers and filter center workers whose round-the-clock vigilance keeps watchful guard of the Pacific Coast against attack by enemy planes. Night and day, the help This is Ken Carpenter speaking. Tonight, the 22nd gala performance of Eyes Aloft. And tonight, we introduce two new features, which we're sure you're going to enjoy. First, a weekly contest called Why Do I Come Here? Through this contest, you may be the lucky winner of war stamps, as well as winning a useful gift for your post. Our second new feature, which we inaugurate tonight, Filter Centered News, compiled, edited, and presented by the noted radio news editor, Sam Hayes. There'll be the music of Gordon Jenkins and his orchestra, the Airman Quartet. The weekly presentation of the Handsome Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award. And tonight, as special guests, Father Daryl Finnegan and Father Leo Lanfear of the Alma College Observation Post. And now, here's our Eyes Aloft narrator, Gain Whitman. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? First, may we tell you about our new contest, Why Do I Come Here?, Starting next week, you ground observers and filter center workers have the opportunity of writing a 100-word explanation of why you continue to serve your nation and the Army through the Aircraft Warning Service. Everyone has a reason, and this is your opportunity to tell it. Just write down on a piece of paper in approximately 100 words why you continue to serve at your post or filter center. Merely answer the question, why do I come here? Starting next week, we will present on the air the weekly prize-winning statement. The prizes... Well, the person who writes the weekly winner will receive a Treasury Department war savings stamp book with $5 worth of war stamps. Also, the winner's post or filter center will be awarded a handsome clock. Each week's 100-word Why Do I Come Here statement will be presented on the air with an original orchestral background score composed by Gordon Jenkins. Here now is an example of what some observer or filter center worker might write and submit. This is an example of the way we will present them each week. Why do I come here? This week's winner, Mr. John Doe, 101 America Street, Freeville. Why do I come here? I run a grocery in a small town. Three months ago, my clerk joined the Marines. Days, I run the store alone. Nights, I do the book work. For nearly a year, I served one night out of ten at our observation post. Now, I go two nights every week, 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. Every time I report a plane, I think, what if that's a Jap trying to slip in and bomb a lumber mill or a railroad yard or an army air base? Well, so long as I'm needed, I'll go to the post and share the watches. When the war is over... Maybe I'll feel I help in some small way to win it. Yeah, that's why I come here. There, an example of what might be contributed to our Why Do I Come Here contest. Nothing flowery, just simple, sincere statements. Why don't you try to win one of the weekly $5 war stamp prizes, as well as a handsome clock? for your post or filter center. Statements will be judged on the basis of originality and sincerity. Decision of the judges is final. Duplicate prizes will be awarded in the case of tie. Send your entry to Eyes Aloft, Hollywood, California. We repeat, send your entry to Eyes Aloft, Hollywood, California. Maybe you will be one of the many who will win. Here now we present another of our new program features. The noted news editor, Sam Hayes, has accepted the 4th Fighter Command's invitation to bring you each week the latest news of the Pacific Coast Filter Centers. Presenting Sam Hayes. And uh, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Sam Hayes joining the Eyes Loft radio staff and ready to bring you concise news items and personal comments about the personnel of the Pacific Coast Filter Centers from border to border. 
Seattle, Washington. Silver Room volunteers Florence Latimer and Jane Belland are real pioneers of the Signal Corps. They served with the first women's unit in the Army in World War I, an outfit known as Army Signal Corps Telephone Unit. For 18 months, Florence Latimer was attached to General Pershing's staff headquarters at Chaumont, France. It was 23 years ago to the day when she began her recent volunteer work with Seattle Air Defense Wing. <laughs> Bakersfield, California. Betty Brennan, Group 6B, expects a blessed event around Easter. <laughs> Portland, Oregon. Mother and daughter teams are popular at the Portland Information Center. Mother Fanny Brenner and daughters Ina and Edna May give 80 hours a month. Six other mother-daughter combinations at this center include Mildred and Jane Noreen, Blanche and Mildred Calhoun, Maud and Irene Hibb, Aideen and Ruth Albright, Alice and Kathleen Wallace, and Helen Ass and Helen C. Scott. Another Portland item. When Edith Johnson isn't working at the center, she's helping the war effort by cooking on a Portland tugboat to cheat. Mrs. Johnson is 20 days at sea, 10 days in town. The only woman aboard, she cooks for the eight hands who operate the boat. Olympia, Washington. Big plans are brewing for a military ball to be held February 11th at the Evergreen Ballroom. Ranking officers of the Seattle Air Defense Wing will attend. Los Angeles. Women volunteers of the Los Angeles Information Centers staged a war bond rally in Pershing Square Saturday, January 9th, selling $69,128 worth of stamps and bonds. Music was furnished by the Marchfield Band. The rally was organized by volunteer Esther Schack and Jimmy Vanderver. Port Angeles, Washington. Jerry Dunmire worked on the filter board seven hours every fourth day and four hours every third day, which means that one day a week, Jerry works a continuous 11-hour shift, and she says she loved it. San Francisco. Miss Petite Crowell of Shift 2 became Mrs. Robert Zwebel on January 2nd. The wedding was held at Old St. Mary's Church. Miss Nancy Haywood, her maid of honor, is also a volunteer on Shift 2. Bellingham, Washington. Nine volunteers at Filter Center have given well over 1,000 hours to the AWS. Mrs. Delta Booth tops the list with over 3,000 hours. Evelyn Christie, Bernie Tick, Lucy Sturig, Sybil Roberts, Pat Beach, Dora Fisher, Jean Tussing, and Lola Fletcher each have served more than 1,000 hours and are still on duty. Eugene Oregon. Miss Jean Lewis, Section 8, has announced her engagement to Southern Pacific brakeman, Russell Hayes. Miss Lewis has served 400 hours at the Silver Center and will continue work there after her wedding on January 31st. San Diego. Mrs. Mary Alice Haggard, prominent San Diego executive secretary, was on Team 1B at a birthday January 6th. She refuses to commit herself as to whether she is still in her 20s. San Diego. Mrs. Virginia Smith of Team 2A and C is ferrying army cars from Los Angeles to San Diego between her ships at the Silver Center. Sacramento, California Filter Center. The center's first midnight shift made up entirely of men starts January 11th. The Masonic Lodge will be responsible for one midnight to 6 a.m. shift each week. North Coast Filter Center. Supervisor Ernestine Bergstrom of Team 3 recently distinguished herself as an active member of the Red Cross Speakers Bureau and of the Fighting French. Redding, California Filter Center. Lieutenant Jack L. Dyer and Miss Grace Bracey, both of Texas, were married January 2nd. Reverend Don N. Chase officiated. Dr. and Mrs. O.J. Hansen entertained with a supper after, the affair being attended by many Redding Filter Center personnel. And so we close tonight's Filter Center News with this week's nomination to the Honor Roll of Service. We select Mrs. May Steele, volunteer chairman of the Olympia Washington Filter Center, who has served the aircraft warning service for 1,800 hours. This is your Eyes Aloft news reporter, Sam Hayes, bidding you one and all a good, good evening. Gordon Jenkins Orchestra and the Airmen Quartet join the official Eyes Aloft theme song with the thrilling new fighting song of the Navy, Fighting Sons of the Navy Blue. Take a hand for the 
my sea was once a seminal cry, but a modern 20th century Paul Revere must watch the sky by the law. Night and day, we'll help protect the USA. We've got the will to fight for what we know is right, the leader to a cause that's true. From California to the rugged, rocky coast of Maine, we're fighting sons of the Navy Blue. The ship of state sails on with battle flags and furl. The stars and stripes come into view. We hold the beacon light of liberty for all the world. We're fighting sons of the Navy Blue. Beware, you pirates and buccaneers. We'll sail forever we please. For Uncle Sam will never rest Until he's won the freedom of the sea But if it's war they want We've got to what it takes To make democracy come true We've got the ships, we've got the guns We've got the courage too We're fighting sons of the Navy blue Wanna fly land and go up by sea Was once a seminal cry But a modern 20th century Paul Revere Must watch the sky by the law This evening, we are honored to have us here on our program two young men who have journeyed from their Alma College School for Training Jesuit Priests in the Santa Cruz Mountains in Northern California. Here is Ken Carpenter, who will chat with Father Darrell Finnegan and Father Leo Lanfear about their most unusual aircraft warning service observation post at Alma College. Ken? Okay, Gain. Well, Father Lanfear, Father Finnegan, it's a real pleasure for us to have you with us tonight. It's a real pleasure for us to be here. This trip south has an added pleasure for me. You see, when I was a boy, Hollywood was my home. My parents still live here. Now I've had a chance to visit them. Mm -hmm. Well, how long has it been, Father Finnegan, since you've been home? This is my second visit in 12 years. That's quite a little time. Where is your home, Father Lanfear? Uh, Butte, Montana. I spent some time teaching at Gonzaga University in Spokane. Oh, you are from the same town as my good friend and radio playmate, Ben Crosby. Yes, please, Gonzaga boy. He's done a great deal for his old school, you know. Yes. Uh, well, let's see now. Your college, Alma College, is strictly a training school for priests. For Jesuit priests, Mr. Carpenter. Oh, I see. Well, tell me, how long does a man have to study to prepare himself for priesthood in the Society of Jesus? Fourteen years. We prepare at other schools for ten years, then comes to Alma College for our last four years of intense study. How much longer do you have, Father Finnegan? I hope to be ordained in 18 months. And you, Father Lanfear? Well, I have approximately two more years. Many of the fellows uh, wish they could be finishing now. Oh, I don't quite understand, Father Lanfear. Well, I mean they're anxious to be ordained so they could go into the Army or the Navy and serve as chaplains. I guess we'd all like to help out in this war. Yes, indeed. Well, you men are already very active there at your school in all manner of civilian defense, I believe. Yes. We're like most everyone else. Some way or other, we manage to find time to take first aid courses, learn to be air raid wardens, and, of course, to run our observation post. Well, excuse me, Father Cunningham, but isn't that one of the Red Cross bronze buttons of blood donors in your buttonhole? Yes. Last week, about 20 of our men went to San Jose to donate a pint of blood when the Red Cross mobile unit was there. And then, just last spring, some 20 others of our school went to the county hospital for the Santa Clara County Blood Bank. Well, you men are indeed active in every civilian branch of war service. I understand you have a very famous observation post there at Alma, Father Finnegan. Well, since it was instrumental in saving that lost Navy plane last August, there's been considerable attention paid to our little post. How many observers do you have? I should judge that about 85 of the student priests share the watches. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty healthy post. Uh, how do you manage about classes and the observer schedule? Well, I guess that does present quite a problem for Father Gruy, our chief observer, to work out at times. But he manages. He's a good organizer. He must be. But he has other difficulties besides classes, Mr. Carpenter. When we were organizing our post, one of our most disconcerting problems was how the men on the late watches could serve and still hear early morning mass. Oh, well, um, how'd you work that out? I think we'd better explain that our little observation shack is built out on the roof of one of the main buildings. Yes? Well, just inside the building, up there in what you might call the attic, we have a small altar. We have a long telephone cord which reaches inside. When early morning mass is said, we can be present and still be on guard to watch constantly for planes. Well, that's really great. And I must say that with such earnestness and purpose, no wonder Alma College Post has an outstanding record for efficiency. And thank you, Father Finnegan and Father Lanzer, for coming here. We're both delighted. 
And now we'll hear the real story of how your post saved that Navy bomber last summer. We present this week's prize-winning new and true great American story. This radio dramatization of an actual incident was written for the Eyes Aloft program by Father Leo F. Lanthier of Alma College. Nestled on a high and small plateau of the rugged Santa Cruz Mountains is picturesque Alma College, seminary for young men of Catholic faith who have taken the vows of the Society of Jesus and are training for the priesthood. Rambling buildings of redwood set among wide lawns, small lakes, flower gardens, all surrounded by wooded hills. It is a place of peace and quiet where men may study and contemplate the Word of God. Yet, it is a most practical institution, keenly attuned to all the problems of a modern war-torn world. When war was declared in December of 1941, Father Rudolph, formerly president of Santa Clara University, and now rector of Alma College, was approached by an officer of the 4th Fighter Command. Chair, Captain Underwood. Well, thank you, Father. <laughs> I received your letter. They're most interested in any need of the Army. Before you arrived, I have taken the opportunity of learning about this new work of the Aircraft Warning Service. Then I needn't explain. The Army is building up a chain of lookout stations up and down the Pacific coast? We call them ground observation posts. I see. And you need a unit, a post in this territory? We have already established others in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I've heard about that. Your location here at Alma College could be of great use to us. I have already talked to some of my young men. They've suggested building a small shack on top of our main hall. And you're agreeable to the Army locating a post on your grounds? We must all do what we are asked. Most certainly we want to help the war effort any way we can, Captain. Good. Now, uh, when do you suppose we can activate this Alma College post? Mm, within a week, perhaps within a few days. Whenever you say, Captain. The sooner the better. I think you can probably get your telephone extension in and operating by Thursday. Very good. I'll have my students select their own leader. They'll be ready to serve the Army Thursday. Thank you, Father Rudolph. Your cooperation is deeply appreciated. Seems little enough that any of us can do in these trying days, Captain. Count on Alma College for any service we can render. Soon the observation post, built by the student priests, began to rise from the top of the faculty building. Work on it was enthusiastically driven ahead by the Rev. Reverend Francis J. Seliger, Society of Jesus, head of all the California Jesuits. Within but a matter of days, Alma College observation post was in operation. 24 hours a day and night, young earnest men in black robes climbed to the rooftop and watched the skies for planes, reported all they saw to the Army. Time rolled along, winter of 1941 to spring of 1942, then summer. Life of a student priest is strenuous. Day after tiring day, they spend their youthful energy in the classroom. This afternoon, we'll use English instead of the customary Latin as we take up the treatise on the moral principles of international... Hours the student priests spend in their chapel. desires right counsels and just works, give to thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts being devoted to the keeping of thy commandments and the fear of enemies removed, our times by thy protection may be peaceful, Christ our Lord. Amen. And in these days of war, the lives of students at Alma College are also concerned with civilian defense. Uh, quiet, men. I have an announcement to make. <coughs> Certificates of instruction for all those who have completed their course for the Citizens' Defense Corps will be given out this evening. <laughs> the Certificates of instruction for all those who have completed their first aid training course will be given out this evening. The official emblems for the Chief Observer of the Aircraft Warning Service and his two first assistants will be given out this evening. <laughs> Strange defense fighters, these theological students of Alma College, already well on their march to someday serve as chaplains in the armed forces of America. 
During the months that rolled along, the young priests-to-be not only carried on for the army, but of course met their daily routines as students of divinity in the halls of Alma. Late one summer's afternoon, they were just leaving chapel. Yeah. Well, hiya, Father Fred. What's doing, Father Jack? Oh, Father Fred, Father Jack. Want to walk down to the lake? Yes. yes. Father Red. Father Red. What? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Father Red, just a minute. I have to see you. <laughs> What's all the excitement? I'm out of breath. <sighs> Would you do me a big favor tonight? <laughs> you don't want me to write another term paper for you, do you? Oh, no. Uh, Aldercroft Heights just telephoned. They want Father Frank and me to start their first aid course for them this evening at 8.30. Well, why don't you go start it for them? Oh, don't you realize? I'm on watch tonight up at the observation post. Oh, oh, yes. Look, uh, would you sub for me? I mean, would you go teach the first aid class? Well, now, that chaplain from Fort Ord is coming tonight to lecture, and I certainly wanted to hear him. Oh, of course. You can't skip that observation watch thing? Oh, no. I have to be there on duty tonight, or if I'm not, somebody has to be. Well, what about the first aid instruction at Aldercroft Heights tonight? Well, I'll skip it. I have to be here at the post. All right, then I'll go take your first aid class. Oh, but you want to hear the chaplain from Fort Ord. Oh, I'll find out what he says from somebody else. I'll go take your first aid class. You stay here and keep your observation post watch. You know what to do. You're trained. Afraid if I stayed, I might make a mistake reporting a plane. <laughs> I would like to be here on my regular watch. Well, you stay, Father Paul. I can see that's more important. On that same night, on the fog-heavy evening of August 4th, 1942... The alertness, the diligent watchfulness of the men at Alma College came to mean more than mere passive observation. In fact, it meant the saving of the lives of a crew of a giant Navy patrol bomber. The murky summer night of August 4th, above the Santa Cruz Mountains. Visibility is worse. Gas almost gone. How much flying time of gas left? 20, 25 minutes at the most. Where are we? I don't know. Lost over mountains. Check the radio again. Okay. Check the radio. On that night of August 4th, a Navy bomber had gotten off the course and was lost in the treacherous passes of the Santa Cruz Mountains. In the little shack atop the Alma College building that night, two observers were on watch. Two o'clock in the morning. They were talking, though listening. Of course, the real advantage is that our lectures and textbooks are in Latin. Oh, I admit it's ideal for study of some of those involved passages in Scripture. You know, I'll be glad to finish up here at Alma. Oh? I'd like to go out and join them. Them? Be a chaplain. Get into this war. Help out. Yes, I know. Well, I, I think I'll call over the roof and go on inside, wake Father Earl for our mass. I'll go get the little altar ready. Good enough. I'll stay here and keep watch. You go ahead. I was hoping the stairs don't creak and wake up the hole. Hey, wait a minute. What? I thought I heard a plane. I, I don't see any lights of a plane out the window. Wait a minute. I'll open the door. Why, oh, yes. I hear it. Motor's missing. Where is it? Can't see. Maybe over back of the hill. But I can hear it plain enough. Yeah. <laughs> down below there somewhere. Where? I saw it. Now it's gone. How's our gas now? Fifteen minutes or less. Oh, uh, there was just some break in the fog below. There isn't. Hey, wait. What? I saw the light. The port. Almost directly below. Yeah, I caught it. We'll circle. Maybe they'll see it. Maybe they'll report it. Maybe something will come to help. At Nomen Domini in Vocabo, and Domini non sum dignus, that enters the to me in Satanic Verbo, Tsunami Divine Lamea. And Domini non sum dignus, that enters the to me in Satanic Verbo, Tsunami Divine Lamea. And Domini non sum dignus, that enters the to me in Satanic Verbo, Tsunami Divine Lamea. It's coming back, the plane. I hear it. It's a. Not like a bimotor. There, look. Yes. Now I see its riding lights. I see it's down here. Look, it's starting to circle. It's in trouble. We'd better call in right away. Yes, I'll make the call. Hello? Hello? Get them? Yeah, they're on the line now. Army flash. One. By motor. Very low. Scene. 24 grade three. Overhead. Circling. Hello? Hello? What are you doing? Pardon me, this is irregular, but there's a plane circling over us. It must be lost. Uh, I think it's out of gas. Someone should be notified. Yes? Yes, this is 24 grade three. Yes. Well, thanks very much. Yes, goodbye. What happened? The Army thanked us for the definite information. They've already had some herd reports. They'll take care of it. The Father Ed? Yes? You... 
You don't suppose that's a Jap plane? Well, I don't think so. It sounds like an American motor. Sounds like somebody in trouble. I can't hear it now. Oh, circled off to the north, back over the hills. Oh, I think it's one of our own planes in real trouble. <laughs> It's working now. What do they say? Who is it? Let me listen. Uh -huh. Yeah. Call it from San Francisco. San Francisco? But where are we? Did they say what they're going Wait. to do? Well, what is it? There's zero five. Find the 4,000. Somebody reported it. Oh, thank heavens. Maybe it was those people down at those lights we just circled. Maybe. Anyway, San Francisco just gave me course to field 43. Hey, look, there's a hole in the fog down there. Let's try for it. How's the gas now? Just about enough. And thank goodness the radio cleared up in time. Yeah. Thank God above for whoever saw and reported it. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the malice and snares of the devil. We humbly beseech God to command him and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power thrust into hell Satan and the other evil spirits who roam through the world. Amen. Amen. Student priests of Alma College Observation Post reported on the night of August 4th, 1942, a lost Navy bomber. Other posts had made reports of having heard the plane, but this scene report from Alma completed the picture. Under guidance of ground observers through the San Francisco Information Center and then by radio, the plane landed safely at Field 43. Not only a valuable American plane was saved from destruction, but more important, the precious lives of its crew were spared. Each week, we present the National Broadcasting Company's handsome Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award to some outstanding post or filter center. Here now is Major Russell Z. Smith to make this week's presentation. One of the most unique observation posts in the entire aircraft warning system is a station at Elma College. Though their prime interest is to study and learn the messages of God, they also have time to serve their community and their nation through the Aircraft Warning Service. In the case of the Alma College Observation Post, the men who continue to serve have already helped to save one American plane from destroying itself and its crew. We honor the Jesuit students of Alma College and present the Observation Post for men with the Distinguished Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award. This is Jane Whitman saying good night for the 150,000 civilian volunteer filter center workers and ground observers who serve to guard the Pacific coast from invasion by enemy planes. Good night. Don't forget, write or mail at once your 100-word entry in our new Why Do I Come Here contest. Tell why you continue to serve the AWS. Send your entry to Eyes Aloft, Hollywood, California. You may win one of the weekly prizes. Eyes Aloft is written and directed by Robert L. Redd. Music is composed and conducted by Gordon Jenkins. This is Ken Carpenter charging you to always remember... Eyes Aloft! Eyes Aloft! Watching the sky! Watching the plane! Eyes Aloft comes to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Esther presents the Screen Guild Players. The Screen Guild Play tonight, Holiday Inn. The starring players... This is Bing Crosby. And this is Dinah Shore. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in musical highlights from Paramount Pictures' tuneful film, 
Holiday Inn, starring Bing Crosby as Jim Hardy and Diana Shore as Linda Mason. This is the story of Jim Hardy, a man with an idea. Oh, pardon me, Brother Bradley. A man with three ideas. Three? Yep. The first one came to me when Lila Dixon and Ted Hanover and myself, we were doing a song and dance act in a New York nightclub. Uh-huh. I had an idea that I would marry Lila, quit show business, and settle down on a farm in Connecticut. Well, sounds great. How'd the idea work out? Didn't work. Just when I felt sorry for Ted because Lila was marrying me and... We'd leave him looking for two new partners. Ted gave Lila a quick fireside chat. Mm -hmm. He sold her on staying in the act with him, and when I walked out to go to the farm, I walked out alone. I've had better ideas, I think. Well, uh, tell me, Jim, what was the next idea? Holiday Inn. See, it didn't take me too long to learn that a farm was no place for a lazy boy. So I decided to change the farmhouse into a roadside nightclub, open on holidays only and featuring shows built around each particular holiday. I even had a show planned for uh, Hitler's funeral. Huh? Yeah. Uh, what made you think Hitler would be buried on a holiday? Oh, brother, any day he's buried will be a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote special songs for all the holidays, and then I began looking for some talent. I see. I was planning to open on Christmas Eve, but the game was called off on account of no one showing up. Not even performers. Boy, I was really feeling feeling sorry for myself on Christmas Day. And then Santa Claus brought me Linda Mason. And when I saw Linda, well, I began to get another idea. See, I can still remember the first day when, when she came up to the farm and she asked me for a job. Could you use me in your show, Mr. Hardy? Well, I don't know. I might find a spot for you somewhere. What can you do? Oh, I'd dance a little and sing. Gee, I couldn't guarantee any salary at first. Right now, I've got the ledger in an iron lung. Oh, I don't care if you pay me off in eggs. Pay off in eggs? Lady, you've either got me mixed up with Bob Hope or some millionaire. (laughs) Please give me a chance. Well, we'll see what you can do here. Uh, You know, this uh, sort of gives me a chance to keep a little promise I made to myself. I swore I was going to sing this song here at the inn tonight. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas Just like the ones I used to know Where the treetops glisten And children listen Hear Sleigh bells in the snow A quiet Christmas With every Christmas card I write May your days be merry and bright And may all your I'll pitch you the word. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Just like the ones I used to know. Just like the ones I used to know. Where the treetops glisten. Where the treetops glisten. And children listen. And children listen. To hear sleigh bells in the snow I'm dreaming of a white Christmas With every Christmas card I write May your day be merry 
Thanks a lot, Mr. Hardy. I want to tell you, though, there's a, there's a string tied to it. Oh, I was afraid it was too good to be true. Yep. From now on, you've got to start calling me Jim. <laughs> well, between this here and that there, Brother B, I want to tell you, Linda and I managed to talk enough musicians and entertainers into taking a chance with us to... Let us open Holiday Inn on New Year's Eve. Mm. Ah, the joint was packed. I was standing in the corner, pounding myself on the back for having hit the jackpot, when the lights went off again all over the world. Just to give everything a nice, ironic touch, Linda was singing Happy Holiday when trouble staggered in. Happy Holiday! Happy Holiday! While the merry bells keep ringing, may your every wish come true. Happy holiday, happy holiday. May the calendar keep ringing happy holidays to you. If you're burdened down with trouble, if your nerves are wearing thin, pack your load down the road and come to Holiday Inn. If the traffic noise affects you like a squeaky violin, kick your cares down the stairs, come on to Holiday Inn. If you can't find someone who will set your heart a whirl, take your car and motor to the home of boy meets girl. If you're laid up with a breakdown, throw away your vitamins. Don't get worse. Just get your hold of your nurse and come to Holiday Inn. Happy Holiday. Happy Holiday. May the calendar keep ringing. Happy Holiday. Oh, I want to tell you, Brother B, that gal could really sing the socks off. Yes, indeed. Well, no one's going to argue with you about that, Jim, but, uh, well, if I'm not being too obtrusive, let's get back to the trouble you said staggered into Holiday Inn. Oh, yes, the trouble. Yes, the trouble. Well, it was my former partner and throat cutter, Dick Ted Hanover. Uh (laughs) Ted staggered in with a compound alcoholic fracture. (laughs) This boy was loaded. There was nothing wrong with his propensity for grabbing my girls. He walked right over to Linda and began dancing with her, and just watching them dance together, I had a hunch that my days with Linda were numbered. The next morning, though, when I went into the room where I had put Ted to sort of sleep it off, I began to think I had a chance to, uh... Good morning, Ted. Got a little head, huh? Oh. Say, where... where am I? You're in Holiday Inn. Well, how'd I get here? Who brought me? Haven't you heard about the stork? This is no time for your alleged comedy. Lila left me. What? Yeah, I got a wire from her at the theater telling me she was quitting me. Going to marry some Texas millionaire or something. Uh Uh-oh. Uh, then I had a drink. A drink? Brother, you couldn't hit the floor with a handful of hominy. (laughs) Say, uh, I seem to remember dancing with some girl after I got here last night. Girl? Girl? Yeah, yeah. I'm beginning to remember a few things. Gee, she was a perfect partner for me. Now that Lila's left me, I have to get a new partner. And that girl, she's just the girl for me. Oh, no, Ted. I think you're, you're much better off doing a single. You're huh? a born soloist, you know, old boy. Oh, no, 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 Jim. No, sir. I've got to get that girl for a partner. Gee, if I could only remember what she looked like. You don't remember? No, no. I Say, wait a minute. You saw her. Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, describe her. Oh, well, uh... I wasn't watching very closely, you know. She was, uh, oh, I would say she was a medium, medium built sort of a girl with a medium face. <laughs> she had a, she had a nice evening gown on with a, with a sort of a Balmacan back. 
You're a great help, you are. Thanks a lot. Oh, it's really nothing at all. Happy to do it for you. Uh, just the same, I got a hunch. I'm going to find that girl, and believe me, she's worth waiting for. Hmm, well, where are you going to find her? Uh, right here. I have a hunch she'll be back here for the next holiday. Well, how do you like that for a guy moving in on me, Brother B? Well, Jim, couldn't you have told him she was your girl and asked him to keep away from her? Oh, you can't be that naive. True, old boy. Don't you remember Lila? Ted made a habit of stealing my girls away from Mm. me. My only chance to hang on to Linda was to keep her out of Ted's sight. Until I had enough cabbage in the bank to ask her to marry me. And for the next holiday, Lincoln's birthday, I decided that Linda and I, we're going to work in Blackface to keep Ted from discovering her. Oh, she wasn't too happy either when I broke the idea to her about it. Oh, Jim, I look terrible in that stuff. No, you won't. I don't even know how to put it on. I'll put it on for you. I'm an old boot black, you know. (laughs) Well, let's see. Here we go now. Oh... For a month and a half, I've been dreaming about how pretty I was going to look tonight. Well, you'll have plenty of times to be pretty. Say, you know, I was just going to ask you if you'd like to be in the rest of the shows out here. You were? Will you? Will I? I just wish I didn't have to work in that florist shop all the other days in the year to make these few possible. Hmm, Well, maybe a little later on when we start doing better, we... Well, you can stay out here all the time. Did you hear what you just said? I just caught the last part of it there. <laughs> Was it a proposal? Well, it sure will be when I get a few bucks in the bank. Gosh, you're a strange duck. You don't even give me a chance to say darling and throw my arms around you. Oh, you'd better wait until you see my bank book. Well, I guess I'm sort of engaged. Yes, and I guess we'd better sort of start the show, too. Come on, we can't just uh, sing here in the dressing room. <laughs> On a February morn, a tiny baby boy was born, Abraham, Abraham. When he grew up, this tiny babe, the folks all called him Honest Abe, Abraham. He was a great man, Abraham. 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 In 1860, he became the 16th president. And now he's in the Hall of Fame, a most respected gem. And that is why we celebrate this blessed February day. Abraham, Abraham. USA's United Thanks to one whose name was Nancy Hanks. Abraham, Abraham. She gave this land its finest son, who ever went to Washington. Abraham, Abraham. When somebody told him General Grant was drinking every night, he answered, go see if you can, get all my generals tied. That's why we celebrate blessed that. Just a moment with the second half of our musical highlight from Holiday Inn. But first, a word from our hostess, Lady Esther. I've received so many letters lately from women living in Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Chicago, and other cities where there are numerous defense plants and where the air is filled with smoke and flying dust. They tell me what a problem it is to keep their skin really clean these days. And many of them tell me they began to notice their skin getting dull and muddy looking they began to notice blemishes here and there. But what a difference, they tell me, since they began using Lady Esther for purpose face cream. Many of them tell me their skin never looked cleaner and fresher, never looked smoother. Now, I wish I could read you these hundreds of enthusiastic letters because they prove that Lady Esther for purpose face cream does far more for your skin than just an ordinary cleansing cream. But I want to do more than that. I want to send you a generous tube of Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream free so that you can try it on your own skin and see the thrilling results for yourself. After all, what better proof can there be than to see a thing with your own eyes? If your skin is taking a lot of extra punishment these days 
especially if it's being exposed more than usual and getting a little dry and rough, a little muddy looking, you'll want to take advantage of my offer. I'll send you enough cream for a whole week's trial, and you can see for yourself how Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream not only thoroughly cleans your skin, but softens it, helps nature refine the pores, and even leaves a smooth, flattering base for powder. Just send me your name and address on the back of a penny postcard. By return mail, you'll receive your gift tube of Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream and the nine different shades of Lady Esther Face Powder. All the address you need is Lady Esther, Chicago. And now we raise the curtain again on Holiday Inn, starring Dinah Shore as Linda Mason and Bing Crosby as Jim Hardy. Uh, go on to the story of Holiday Inn, Jim. Tell me, uh, did the blackface disguise keep Ted from discovering Linda? Yeah, but uh, he came back like gangbusters. He promised <laughs> to come uh, two days later for Valentine's Day, yeah. and even I couldn't figure out a legitimate excuse for, for putting Linda in blackface on Valentine's uh -huh. Day. So I decided to take Cupid right by the bowstrings and set myself solid with Linda. Now, I had a special song all whipped up for her when she came back for rehearsal. I called it, uh, Be Careful, It's My Heart. I wasn't kidding either. Be careful, it's my heart. It's not my watch. You're holding, it's my heart It's not the note I sent you That you quickly burned It's not the book I lent you That you never returned Remember, it's my heart The heart with which so willingly I part It's yours to take, to keep or break But please, before you start Be careful It's my heart Jim, from where I'm standing, that certainly should have set you in pretty solid with Linda. Well, I thought it was pretty beamy, you know, nice low key and everything, but yeah. nothing happened. While I was singing, <laughs> Ted finally found Linda, and he moved right in. Back in. Oh, he moved in with a crash. He set himself up in business at Holiday Inn, dancing with uh, Linda, you know, on the holiday shows, yeah. and dividing the rest of his time between making love to her and trying to sell her on leaving me in Holiday Inn to head for the big time as his dancing partner. Mm. Now, I managed to... Come out of my corner punch, you know, I was swinging, swinging right from China. And on Easter Sunday, I was sure I had Ted on the run when Linda joined me in the, the big Easter parade. In your Easter bonnet With all the frills upon it You'll be the grandest lady In the Easter parade And when the look us over We'll be the proudest couple In the Easter parade On the avenue Up the avenue uh -huh. The photographers will snap us and you'll find that you're in the road of gravure. Oh, I'll try to about your Easter box and all the girl I'm taking to 
Jim, that, huh? that really should have eliminated Hanover, huh? Well, I thought he'd take a fast count, but Ted promoted a couple of Hollywood talent scouts to come out to the inn. A couple of boys from Hollywood and signed Linda and himself up. Uh, they got a picture contract, yep. huh? That's what they did in a little epic titled Holiday Inn. Now, wait. You mean they stole your idea and made it into a picture? Well, no. When Ted stole my girl, I gave him the idea for the picture. And that was the end of everything, huh? Practically. I closed up Holiday Inn after Ted and Linda left, and I just sat around feeling sorry for myself. On Thanksgiving Day, I read in the gossip columns that they were going to be married as soon as they finished the picture. Well, then I was really ready for the river. And then Mamie, my housekeeper, she took me in hand and gave me sort of a chalk talk on chickadees and their chicaneries. Closing up the inn and setting around like a jellyfish. Just cause a slicker stole your gal and you ain't got fight enough to get her back. I tried to keep her here, Mamie. What kind of keeping was that? Nothing but tricks. If you hadn't made Miss Linda mad, hiring that driver to keep her away from the end the night them Hollywood scouts was here, and then acting like she couldn't be trusted to stay with you in the face of temptation, she'd still be here. Why, right now, if you went to Hollywood and told Miss Linda how much you love her and misses her, that is, if you told her the way a lady likes to hear it, huh, I'll bet you she'd be the quickest ex-movie star that ever exed. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just what do you have in mind? Grab yourself a handful of train and get on out to Hollywood. Well, and then what? See, after all, I can't just walk up to a girl I'm in love with and I haven't seen her in several months and say, uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume, or something. Well, now, see here, Mr. Jim. I can tell you to get out to Hollywood and I can also advise you to take Miss Linda in your arms and crush her. But after that, Mr. Jim, you got to put the pressure on yourself. Look well, well, did you take Mamie's advice, Jim? Well, I had nothing to lose, Brad. I, I walked onto the lot where they were making the movie version of Holiday Inn. Just as they were about to shoot the last scene of the picture. Mm. And I want to tell you, it gave me a, something of a start. Because that movie set looked exactly like my Connecticut farmhouse. The artificial snow coming down from above, it really took me back to that Christmas day when Linda showed up at Holiday Inn looking for a job. And then Linda began singing White Christmas, and well, I mustered up enough nerve to walk right into the scene. When it was all over, Ted Hanover was looking for a new partner, and Linda and I were off to see a man about a license. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas Just like the ones I used to know Where the treetops glisten And children listen To hear sleigh bells in the snow I'm dreaming of a white Christmas And may all your Christmases be white. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas with every Christmas card I write. May your days be merry. Thank you, Bing Crosby and Dinah Shore for your wonderful singing of the musical highlights from Paramount Pictures' Holiday Inn. It was a real musical treat. 
One that we of the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will long, long remember. Well, it's nice to hear you say that, Truman. But I know somebody who'll remember the program longer than anyone. Really, Dana? Friend of yours? Well, in a way. Her name's Dana Shore. I've always wanted to sing with Bing the King. Well, that makes it a standoff then, Dinah, because Crosby has always wanted to sing with Dinah and the Dixie Diva. <laughs> <laughs> well, we couldn't have found a better place to do it, Bing, right on this program for the benefit of the Motion Picture Relief Fund. Anything you'd like to add, sir? Well, I was going to say something about uh, next week's program, but I guess it can wait, Dinah. All right. I'd like to ask you all to listen to an interesting free offer from one of our best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Shore. Perhaps many of you listening to me tonight have promised yourself at one time or another to try Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream. Perhaps you've wanted to see for yourself if it really does four important things for your skin, but you never actually got around to trying it. Well, here's your chance to try it without buying it. Here's all I ask you to do. Just send your name and address on the back of a penny postcard. As soon as that postcard arrives here, I'll see that a generous tube of my Four Purpose Face Cream... Also, my nine exciting shades of Lady Esther face powder are put into the mail and start on their journey to you. Now, there will be enough Lady Esther four-purpose face cream for at least a week's trial. And during that period, I'd like you to watch your skin and see how my cream does these four things. One, how it thoroughly cleans your skin. Two, how it softens your skin and relieves dryness. Three, how it helps nature refine the pores. And four, how it leaves a perfect base for powder. You see, if you really want to try my four-purpose face cream, here's your chance. Write your postcard tonight or first thing tomorrow and just address it to Lady Esther, Chicago. I'm sorry, but this offer is for residents of the United States only. Wartime restrictions prevent me from extending the offer to residents of Canada. And now, here is Bing Crosby. Your Uncle Sam has asked me to say something tonight to every young woman listening to our program. Your uncle has an urgent and vital need for thousands of student nurses to keep America fighting and working. To win this war, we must keep well, and it's up to you to keep us that way. All you healthy girls between 18 and 35 who are citizens and high school graduates, please write immediately to Student Nurses, Box 88, New York City. Now about next week's Lady Esther program, it's a, it's a rib-tickling comedy about a ham actor who got mixed up with the Nazis. It's called To Be or Not to Be, and it stars Sig Ruman, John Hall, and Mr. and Mrs. William Powell. Next week, then, Mr. and Mrs. William Powell, John Hall, and Sig Ruman in To Be or Not to Be, a laugh a minute for 30 minutes. Bing Crosby of the Kraft Music Hall is soon to be seen in Paramount's all-star production, Star Spangled Rhythm. Diana Shore will soon be seen in Thank Your Lucky Stars, and can now be heard on the Eddie Cantor and her own programs. Music on tonight's show was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Our radio adaptation was by Bill Hampton. The Screen Guild players are presented every Monday night by courtesy of Lady Esther. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther, saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Avro Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas capitals, as well as the leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's John Daly. On all the far-flung battlefronts of this war, initiative from the Axis powers. Land forces of the United Nations no longer dive instinctively for the foxholes when planes roar overhead, for most of them are allied planes. This single factor, perhaps more than any other, has put the United Nations on the offensive. In North Africa, in both Libya and Tunisia, the story of the fighting is principally the story of air fighting, of allied planes methodically hammering at Axis supply ports and Axis supply lines. American bombers from Tunisia have made their first attack on the Axis held area of Tripoli in Libya today. They bombed an airfield 10 miles west of the enemy base and scored direct hits. That pain
pays back the British 8th Army in Libya for some of the attacks it has been making on Axis bases in Tunisia. It also reveals again the cooperation between the Allied forces in the East and West. Both, of course, are working with a common objective, to drive the Axis from all North Africa, and first, to drive them from the air. Allied air power in the last few days also has won and is still winning important decisions in the Pacific. And for a report direct from that area, Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. This is Honolulu. The mopping up on the Papua Peninsula of New Guinea has forced the Jap back some 150 miles to his bases at Lai in Salomoa. This, however, is not so much of a retreat by him as it is a nipping off and destroying of his advanced base by the Allied forces. There were hardly any survivors to retreat. In a broader sense, the Japs have not even started to retreat in the Pacific. They've been stopped, yet even now they're preparing to strike again. The latest reports are that our planes carried out a continuous night and day attack on a Jap convoy in the Hawaiian Gulf area of northeastern New Guinea, hitting two transports, one of which was burning the other beach, shooting down or destroying on the ground 43 fighter planes, and damaging a bomber and six fighters, in addition probably shooting 17 other Jap fighters out of the sky. Also an additional seven out of 15 Jap fighter planes that attacked our planes on a return flight from bombing a Jap airdrome at Madan. But reinforcements were believed landed by the Japs in the Hawaiian Gulf area. The Solomon is well set out. American forces hold their precious ground and its priceless airfield. Land fighting continues, but patrol action. Up north, at the other end of the vast Pacific front, the action is by sea and air, rather by land. The picture out here, then, is one of continuous bombing by air of Jap bases by our forces. Bombing that also extends into the reaches of the sea, seeking out Jap transports, carrying reinforcement troops for New Guinea in the south. Despite our thinking of substantial portions of the convoys and the probable death of thousands of Jap troops aboard, the enemy is believed to have been able to strengthen his forces, protecting his airfields in the New Guinea, at Rabaul in New Britain, and the Rekita Bay areas in Santa Isabel of the Solomons. Some of us out here consider the optimistic statement of Admiral William F. Halsey as probably the most unhalsey-like statement that great fighter ever made. He predicted complete, absolute defeat for the Axis powers, specifically including Japan, in this coming year. That is a large order, even for so great and successful a fighter as Admiral Halsey. If he can justify it, then he has information that many of the rest of us out here would like to have. There's not only one reporter speaking, but one who saw so many men who've been fighting and who've been observing on the long line from the Aleutians to New Guinea. Almost to a man, they predict a long war out here. They resigned to a holding war with offensive, yes, but still a war of holding until the European deal is closed, and then still a long, hard battle before we give our men liberty in the city of Tokyo. Meanwhile, they're fighting fiercely in the most difficult theater of war with tremendous courage and inspiring success. This is Bobby Edwards speaking from Pearl Harbor. We return you to CBS in New York. And now, before we get more reports from CBS correspondents abroad, here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Wherever America's fighting sons are serving, whether as advanced scouts on the desert wastes of Africa or as snipers in the foxholes of the Solomons, one ever faithful friend is always at their side. That friend is their radio, built by Admiral. America's fighting sons spent many happy hours listening to their Admiral Radio in the living room back home. Now they find it's an Admiral Belt Radio that fights with them on the field of battle. And the meeting of so dependable an old friend out there is a heartwarming experience. Knowing this, knowing the confidence these fighting men have in Admiral, inspires every worker in Admiral's two great plants with a desire to produce the best radio equipment possible as fast as possible. And all they produce goes to help America's armed services attain victory. When victory is won, Admiral will again and build fine radios and radio phonograph combinations for home use, and thus serve these fighting sons a third time. For as victors, they will want to take into their own homes the familiar friend of pre-war days, the dependable partner of the battlefield, a radio built by Admiro, the only radio known as America's smart set. Now, here again is John Daly. Now across the Atlantic for the news of European developments, Admiral 
Royal Radio turns now to CBS London, Bob Trout reporting. In London, for some weeks, war correspondents who specialize in reporting air operations have been arguing about the absence of an all-out air offensive against the Germans on the continent during the past few months. Some say the comparative lull has been due to Allied operations on other fronts, which required planes that would otherwise have gone to Royal Air Force's bomber command on this island. Others insist it's just been the weather. But the lull has been only comparative. Last night's Royal Air Force attack on targets in the German city of Essen was the fifth raid on the Ruhr in seven nights. Seven bombers are missing from this raid and mine laying operations. The Air Ministry says good results from the British 4,000 pound bombs were seen at Essen. The weather over the targets was clear last night. While we cannot give weather details in wartime, everyone knows that Britain's weather has little in common with the weather in many American areas where new United States Army pilots are thought to fly. British fogs and rain are as much of a military factor as Tunisia's mark. Today, the London Sunday Express's columnist, Matt Gubbins, says only the British could survive food and fuel rationing and a wet northeast wind. The Huns, he says, might stand two winters in Russia, but I doubt if they'd stand one in England. Today's German High Command communique was read with some interest in London, where it was noticed that the German communique today speaks of the German garrison at Veliki Luki, heroically resisting strong Russian attacks. For days, the Germans have been keeping up the pretense that they still hold Veliki Luki, possibly counting on recapturing this strong point and then claiming that they have never lost it. Perhaps that word heroically in today's communique means the German High Command is losing hope of recapturing Veliki Luki. For the last time, a German communique spoke of Germans fighting heroically was in making a half-hearted admission of the Russian breakthrough on the middle down front. Also in today's German communique, all the fighting on what the German High Command yesterday so vaguely described as the Don region and between the Don and the Caucasus is now described as the defense battle in the south. This is said to be going on with unabated violence, all Russian attacks having been repelled. Britain's Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison, today made a speech at Newcastle dealing with the post-war future of the British Commonwealth. I want it to last, he said, not because it's British, but because it's good and will be better yet. Without it, the world would lose a great factor of stability and progress just when those things are most needed. Mr. Morrison said, it's not enough for our friends or critics abroad to pay lip service to the self-governing empire. It's necessary that they understand it. Other people may think there must be a catch in it somewhere. Well, there is no catch. The freedom and independence of the dominions are real. The proof is Hera, Southern Ireland, which decided to stay out of the war and was left free to do so to the great hurt of the empire's cause and with little advantage to her reputation. Britain's own secretary had something to say about worldwide peace and worldwide security, not just freedom from want and freedom from fear in Britain alone. And he had a good deal to say about the future of the empire's colonies, those territories which have not yet attained the status of dominions. It's impossible to cover in this report the points which Herbert Morrison covered or touched on. I suggest that you read the speech, not because you'll necessarily like it, but as long as this transatlantic controversy is going on, the criticisms might just as well be based on the facts. If there has to be an argument, it always helps a little when both sides talk about the same thing. London has reports from the Middle East of increasingly heavy blows by Allied air forces against the enemy in North Africa, especially in the past 48 hours, the range and number of Royal Air Force night operations have been increased, and Royal Air Force and United States Army Air Force bombers coming from east and west have now met for the first time in a sort of air pincers attack on the German bases in Tripolitania. Next to CBS Cairo and the report of Columbia's correspondent in Cairo. Good Morrison in Cairo. Nothing you would call news is coming through the evil weather that now blankets the front in Libya. But the front that 10 weeks ago was 150 miles from Cairo is now 1,500 miles away 
and getting there is proportionately difficult. Let me tell you instead what goes on here. A year ago, an American in this city was almost a rarity. Now even the shoeshine boys have learned to spot American insignia and even to identify an American in civilian clothes. The other night in the lobby of Shepherd's Hotel, I heard the unmistakable accent of Indiana cutting through the murmur of lobby conversation. It was the voice of an American girl in the blue uniform of the Army nurses. Yes, I heard her say to an English captain, yes, I know, I'm a pretty girl, but right now I'm hungry, and what are we going to do about that? I see Americans everywhere now, all of them doing something, all learning the terrible importance of this front, and as I watch them, I think that perhaps the reason the shoeshine boys can spot them is their air of brisk freshness. Listening to my countrymen here is like attending a continuous performance of Gone with the Wind. So many of them are from the South. But today I was talking to a Yankee from Cambridge, Massachusetts. He told me the leaves turned red and yellow last fall, as though nothing were more important. He said there was snow now in the little street, and that the subject there to Boston is still a dime. And as we talked, I remembered a Yorkshireman. He told me the leaves turned red and yellow last fall, as though nothing were more important. He said there was snow now in the little street, and that the subject there to Boston is still a dime. And as we talked, I remembered a Yorkshireman who told me all one night about his own village of Putsy. And I realized that there must be thousands of conversations like this. People here don't talk about war. War to us has become not a crusade, but a job to be finished. People here talk about home and about tomorrow. They have ideas about the world tomorrow. And if the ideas crystallize and have effect, tomorrow's will be a better world. This is Chester Morrison returning you to CBS New York. That was Chester Morrison of the Chicago Sun reporting from Cairo. 1,500 miles to the north in Russia, the Red Army is still advancing. But the midday communique from Moscow makes it clear that the Nazis are counterattacking desperately. So far, the counterattacks seem to have done little good, since even the German communique claims only that the Nazi armies are fighting defensively. On the other hand, the Russian noon communique said that the Red Army had occupied 30 inhabited localities in the Caucasus region, and press dispatches indicate that the important Nazi held railway junction, Georgievsk, is practically surrounded with Russian troops within 10 miles of the city. In the Don area, where the Nazi counterattacks were the heaviest, the Russians claimed new gains and said the Germans suffered a serious defeat and heavy losses of equipment. Thus, at weeks beginning, with at least five Red Armies driving directly or indirectly on Rostov, the Russians appear to have a reasonable chance to cut off the Axis armies in the Caucasus. Next, to our own hemisphere, for news from Latin America, Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Chile, Charles Griffin reporting. The resolution will come, it is expected, towards the end of next week or soon afterwards, when the Senate is informed of the latest developments by means of the exposition, to be read out on Tuesday the 12th by the Ferry Minister. The Minister of Interior, Senor Raul Morales, delivered a report of his recently completed official mission to the United States last night, and President Rio, accompanied by Foreign Minister Senor Joaquin Fernandez and a number of experts, is devoting the weekend in the summer residence at Inga del Mar to give the finishing touches to the proposal for an early break off of the axis it is affirmed. The Foreign Minister denied the report that the President of Chile and Argentina contemplated meeting soon on the border. That was Charles Griffin reporting from Chile. One of Colombia's reporters is today in one of the famous bombers that gave Tokyo the first taste of American bombs. Admiral Radio switches now to a microphone aboard a B-25 somewhere over the Gulf of Mexico and Bill Slocum Jr. ready to report from one of America's most efficient fighting weapons. It's purely coincidental because I am now laying on my stomach in a B-25. A vicious big piece of fighting machinery built to carry bombs and more bombs and a minimum of human cargo. This B-25 is the same model that Jimmy Doolittle and some other ambitious young Americans took off from Shangri-La for a little farming job in and around Tokyo.
radio. The P-25 is also the ship that is making clay pigeons out of Axis boats and supply depots in North Africa. It is really quite a ship. And restrictions permitting, I'd like to tell you how this dynamite-spitting gadget works. It's a two-motor job and it carries, in addition to bombs, heavy and well-distributed machine gun emplacements. Its normal crew consists of six men, but if Shangri-La happens to be some distance away, it can function with pure. At the controls of this B-25 is Lieutenant J.B.'s Richard of Great Neck, Long Island, a schoolmate of mine and once something of the town's problem child. Today he's operations officer at Southeast Training Center of the Flying Training Command's Tyndall Field and a very serious young man indeed. Lieutenant Richard, you've been finding my ear about B-25s for two days now. Would you repeat some of that briefly for the listeners? takes you next to CBS Washington, Lee White reporting. Washington this week has come to a sort of turning point. Except for the rumpus over Ed Flynn's hopes of becoming a diplomat after resigning as chairman of the Democratic National Committee, there's no immediate cause for bickering between the administration and its opponents. There's the question of post-war planning, of course. In his speech last Wednesday, the president said he thought it within the realm of possibility that the 78th Congress would be called upon to formulate a peace. Yesterday, the dominant isolationist member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Mr. Nye, said he thought the New Deal's peace plans were doomed to failure, just as were those of Wilson. But he added that he and his Republican colleagues would have no objection to discussing peace plans calmly with their Democratic opponents, even while the war is going on. In Congress last Wednesday, I watched the reactions of certain legislators to Mr. Roosevelt's speech. Hamilton Fish and Arthur Vandenberg never once applauded, even when Mr. Uh, except when Mr. Roosevelt left the House. But Gerald Nye applauded every time the president mentioned disarmament or peace, except on one occasion when the phrase was durable peace. In general, the president's speech was well received, though the applause I noticed was rather milder from the Republican wing than those who heard the speech over the radio may have thought. Even Republicans, however, accepted the speech as a conciliatory gesture on the part of Mr. Roosevelt. And it was conciliatory, except on one specific point, expansion of Social Security after the war. Here the president, in saying, I dissent, made it very clear that in the two years remaining to the administration, he would do everything in his power to impress on Congress what he considers its obligation to our fighting men, to assure them of the third freedom, freedom from want, by means of permanent unemployment insurance,
schools and free hospital and medical care for those who require it. At his White House conference on Friday, the president was asked if he anticipated much debate on Senator Wagner's pending Social Security bill. He said he didn't and explained that he felt the differences at the moment are based on methods of attaining Social Security rather than the principle that Social Security is a good and necessary thing. Tomorrow, the Congress will receive the president's budget message for the fiscal year beginning on the 1st of next July. Mr. Roosevelt is expected to request appropriations of more than $100 billion, mostly for war expenditures, and Congress is expected to give his text a very critical appraisal. Most of our legislators are dead set against spending a cent more than is necessary, even for airplanes, but our legislators are not expected to quibble over the direct costs of the war. They may argue over some of the president's views, for his budget message is expected to be couched in far more specific, stronger terminology than his address on the state of the nation. But they won't even have much of an opportunity to fight over income taxes, for the president has anticipated their temper and has already gone on record in, fi in favor of pay-as-you-go. Though he still supports Mr. Morgenthau and others at the Treasury in their opposition to the Rummel Plan, so-called, neither he nor Mr. Morgenthau any longer oppose pay-as-you-go in principle. So it's almost certain that Congress will shortly pass the Rummel Plan or something very like it, no matter what it's called and with a very substantial majority. There will be very little debate in, in Congress. But one thing people ought to understand is this. Pay-as-you-go isn't going to save anybody any money. It will merely ensure that taxes are paid on time. A Navy communique just released announces two more raids on the Japanese airfield at Munda on New Georgia Island, but apparently with no great results. We now return you to CBS in New York. Returning for a moment to the air war in Tunisia, back in this country after serving on the North African front, Brigadier General Stuart C. Godfrey of the Aviation Engineers has an interesting story of methods of building advanced air bases almost overnight. Godfrey says when it became necessary to establish advanced bases to support the action in Tunisia, a call was put in for airborne engineers. With their equipment, they were flown in cargo planes to points as close as possible to the selected sites. Within three days, flying fortresses were taking off from the first base and the second base was completed on the next day. And now, Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. As you know, point rationing will soon go into effect. The government is doing much to help you understand how it works, giving you daily information by means of radio programs. All you need to do is listen, and of course, keep your radio in good operating order. This last is a job which had better be turned over to your Admiral dealer. It's almost impossible to buy a new radio, and even some parts are difficult to replace these days. So don't let an inexperienced person service a radio you own. Your Admiral dealer can put almost any set in perfect condition quickly and economically because he has the right tools, the facilities, and years of experience. Admiral dealers consider it a patriotic duty to help keep America's radios in tip-top shape, just as Admiral considered it a patriotic duty to turn both great Admiral plans to war production. The same plan which made Admiral in peacetime the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers. So call your Admiral dealer for radio service. Be sure your set is in the hands of an expert. When you buy war bonds and stamps, you're protecting your future in two ways. First, war bonds and stamps ensure the freedoms and liberties American citizens have always enjoyed. Second, you're saving for a rainy day or for the luxuries you'll be able to have after victory is won. For logical reasons, invest 10% of your earnings in U.S. war bonds and stamps. Don't let yourself or Uncle Sam down. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's Smart Set. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. This is Warren Sweeney speaking for Admiral Radio. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Our next news broadcast will be heard at 4.45 this afternoon. This is the WBBM Air Theater, Rigby Building, Chicago. That's the speeding bullet! The locomotive! Look! It's a plane! It's stupid! 
strange visitor from another world who is far beyond those of mortal men. Change the course of mighty rivers. Ben, and who, disguised as clerk for a great metropolitan newspaper for truth, justice, and the American joined Superman, he... Sound gang, that's the motors of the whole world. The Lockheed G-38 Lightning sure lives up to its name. Field, and find out more about this. That was fun trip. I tested it. Lightning sure has what it takes. Oh, you should jump like a master. How do you feel, fella? Gosh, John. Did you ever get into the test pilot game anyway? The fellow who tests these ships, they come. Because he sure takes... That's right. You test pilots have to figure out plane, and then you have to go ahead and... Just the point, John. Well, I train as I have to. Plenty of rest and extra grub, too. Grub's mighty important. A fellow can't be husky and less right, gang. You see, none of us can expect unless we eat right. And eating... And say, one of the grandest was important vitamins. Be one off to a big bowl full of crisp breakfast every morning. And taste good? Say, the first time you dip a spoon into a bowl of those crisp, sweet as a nut flakes, you'll catch on to the fact that you've got a mighty swell-tasting treat there. So come on, gang. Ask your mother to get you a package of Kellogg's Pep tomorrow. Remember the name now, Pep, P-E-P, Pugs, in Battle Creek, Michigan. ...of Superman. Superman, in the guise of Clark Kent, is now trying to solve the mystery of the Tin Man, an amazing mechanical man built by a certain Dr. Livwright. The first Tin Man vanished under very strange circumstances. Dr. Livwright, however, constructed another, which, as our last... ...constructed another, which... As our last episode ended, he was demonstrating to an audience of stockholders of the Metropolis Aircraft Corporation, to whom he wanted to sell the invention for $250,000. But something went wrong with the demonstration. The mechanical man, nicknamed Robert, refused to obey Dr. Livwright's command and began to act as if it had gone crazy. Pandemonium broke loose in the audience as the mechanical man, totally out of control, began to stride across the stage. Listen. Look. He's walking again. Stop, Robert. I did not tell you to start walking. Stop him, little right. Stop him, I say. Something must have gone wrong. Yes, but I don't know what, Mr. White. Stop, Robert. Stop. Uh, what? Did you hear that noise? Yes, look, he's coming straight for me. Stop him. Stop him. What? Can't you control that, that monster? I don't know. I don't seem to be able to him. Take turn some dials. Talk to him. Do something. Robert, stop. Stop, I say. It's the audience. They're beginning to run out. Stop the liver out in the name of heaven. Do something quickly. There's nothing I can do, I tell you. The tin man is out of control. There's absolutely nothing I can do. And a good deal you can do, Dr. Liver. What? What did you say? I said there's a good deal you can do. And the first thing you do is confess. Confess everything. Look, he's pointing his steel finger at Dr. Liberai. The thing's done that. Find everyone. Run for your lives. Mr. White, am I hearing right? Yes, yes. Listen, the mechanical man is crazy, I tell you. He's done this thing. Not at all. Be calm, ladies and gentlemen, and hear what I, the tin man, have to say. You have come here to see an amazing demonstration of a walking, talking, seeing, and thinking mechanical man that Dr. Leverite claims to have invented. Dr. Leverite was going to show you how I obeyed his every command. I will not obey his command since he is not worthy to command me. right now. Oh, yes. I am speaking and I am thinking. But you know as well as I do that I am not a mechanical man. Just let me get this metal helmet off. There. It's off. 
Mr. White, it's a man. There's a man inside that, that mechanical robot. Man, nothing. That's Clark Kent. Hello, what? Chief, and thanks for the cover. No, I didn't mean that. Uh, it's uh, okay, I... Chief. I know what you meant. Stop those men. Stop the line. Right. The chief is right right off the stand. They will not get far. They found the point in them. Stop. They've got them. Several hours later, in Perry White's office of the Daily Planet, Clark Kent explains. And that's the entire story. If either of you has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I've got plenty of questions, Clark. All right. In the first place, you say you discovered this hideout of the German spies about 200 miles from here. That's what he said, Lois. That's what he said. The hideout of the man who had stolen the first so-called tin man. Well, what about it? Well, you haven't told us how you discovered it. Uh-uh-uh. Uh, professional secret, if you oh. don't mind, Miss Lane. You can read all about it in the feature story I've written for tomorrow's afternoon edition. Oh, <laughs> and dear. then there's the element of time. That demonstration this afternoon took place at 3 o'clock. Mm-hmm. By your own account, you were at the German hideout at noon today. Now, how did you get to the auditorium 200 miles away, capture the guy who was going to get inside that mechanical monster, and pull your little trick, all in the space of three hours? Oh, you forget, Chief, that our Nazi friends had a plane, a helicopter at their cozy hideout. I won't go into details, but it was easy enough. Well, then, as I see it, Clark, Liberite and Peterson were working together to hoodwink the stockholders and Mr. White. That's right. Liverite, with Peterson's knowledge, had hired a man to get inside the so-called Tin Man and perform. When the stockholders were satisfied that the mechanical man could do what Liverite claimed it could, Peterson was going to hand him a certified check for $250,000. Then later, when the fraud was discovered, Peterson, of course, could claim that he had been tricked along with the others. In the meantime, he would have pocketed half of that $250,000. Well, can't I congratulate you on this job you've done, even though I can't really understand how you did it. This will certainly do the Daily Planet a great deal of good in Metropolis. Oh, what a story. Yes, I've got to admit that myself, even though it hurts. Well, thanks, Lois. You too, Chief. And the one thing that disappoints me is the fact that it was a hoax. I had great hopes for that mechanical man, so far as our war effort is concerned. If the thing really could fly a plane, think of the lives of American soldiers it would have saved. Oh, excuse me. Uh... Yes? What? Oh, no. Well, I'll be... Uh, send him right in. Oh, who is it, Chief? Someone important? Dr. Leander Cameron is here. Dr. Cameron? Good heavens, I haven't seen him since Superman rescued him from the mystery ship. Oh, nor have I. wonder what he wants now. Another expedition? Well, well if he does, he's wasting his time. I'll have no more... Oh, uh, Dr. Leander Cameron, sir. Leander! Hey, my dear, dear friend, oh, I... Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I think I must have hit the game. Yeah, you sure did. You carry so much paraphernalia with you, I don't wonder. Oh, that's yeah, certainly true. Butterfly nets, pots and pans, boxes and bottles of all descriptions. Really, Professor. Uh, be prepared. That, as you know, is my motto, along with the Boy Scouts of America. Never oh. could decide whether they thought of it first or I did. Well, <laughs> nobody thought of it first or I did. Well, no matter. It's a good motto, don't you think? Yes, of course. But uh, what Leander, did... well, what brings you here today? A uh, pretty and excellent question for which I have an excellent answer. Perry, I want to talk to you about and gain your support for the mechanical man known as the Tin Man. Now, hold on, Leander. Hold on. What for? I'm not for No, 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 no. I didn't mean that. Ah. What I meant was, so far as I'm concerned, the Tin Man is over and done with. It was nothing more or less than a cheap trick. A fraud. You're wrong, Perry. The Tin Man was and is more than that. What do you mean? Didn't Clark expose it? Yes, yes, of course. I was in that audience today. Of course, I was in that audience today that came to watch the demonstration. I was with the scientific delegation. As it happens, Perry, I know Dr. Lubright very well. As a matter of fact, he came to me often to help him in the construction of his mechanical man. He did? Uh, now, Leander, don't tell me you're in on this hoax, too. On the contrary, Perry, quite on the contrary. You see, Dr. Livright was very sincere about his mechanical man until our friend Mr. Peterson approached him with his nefarious scheme to make money. It was then, on realizing that he could make $75,000 with such ease, that Livright took the path to perdition. Mm, so what? So what? So this, Mr. Kent, I know, I, Dr. Leander Euthanasia Cameron, know that there can be such a thing as a tin man. A mechanical man who can see, speak, walk, and speak, walk, and sing. Are you kidding? Ladies, lend an ear to me, ladies. Listen here to me, better complexions. In just two weeks, palm olive brings you proof that speaks. Here's all you do. Wash your face with palm olive soap three times a day. 
Then each time, take one minute more to massage palm olive's remarkable beautifying lather into your skin. Then rinse. That's all. 36 leading doctors prove two out of three women get better complexions with this new method in just 14 days. Get palm olive because... There may be new beauty for you as soon as you do. So start today the palm olive way. Yes, sir, when you hear that jingle, you know the makers of Colgate Tooth Powder present Al Jolson, his guest Robert Benchley, and Carol Bruce, Park Your Caucus, and Ray Block and his orchestra. And here's Al. <laughs> You'll hear me calling you Neath your window some sweet day You'll hear me calling you Then you'll know I'm a home to stay When I hear your cheery answer It will make my dreams come true Because I know that you Means I love you I love the girl I left behind me I know she waits for my return Soon in her arms you're gonna find me Oh, how I'll hold her I wrote and told her Yes, me calling you Beneath your window Some sweet day you will hear me calling you Then you'll know I'm home to stay When I hear your cheery answer It will make my dreams come true Because I know that you Means I love you Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're swelling. I Well, sir, I certainly had a tough time getting here tonight. Right here, this broadcast. I didn't think I'd be here. You know, Fred, I put my car away, and honestly, in New York, you cannot get a taxi cab for love nor money. It certainly took the gas rationing board to put the country back on its feet. Really, it did. <laughs> you know something? <laughs> I... <laughs> oh, no, it isn't that good. Well, anyway... <laughs> oh, oh this will kill you. Look, I, I couldn't even hire a horse. There's not a horse to be had. I tried five butcher shops. Honestly, I did. <laughs> well, the government ban on pleasure driving sure has affected everybody, Al. Everybody but the Russians. They're driving towards Rostov, and believe me, it's a pleasure. <laughs> and you know some, Freddy? I heard, I heard, I don't know how true it is. I hope it is true that the snow is so deep in Russia, Hitler has to jack up his generals to shoot him. Really, I think so. <laughs> Well, I understand you put your car in storage, Al. You know, the police are certainly enforcing that new ruling. New ruling? You said it, Fred. Get this. A cop stopped a car on Fifth Avenue the other day and said to the man at the wheel, Hey, haven't you heard about the ban on pleasure driving? And a fellow said, What pleasure driving? This is my mother-in-law alongside of me. <laughs> say, Al, I suppose you had to fire your chauffeur. No, no, I didn't fire my chauffeur. I, I still have my chauffeur. He's just got a little easier, that's all. He, you know what he does now? He carries me piggyback to the subway, puts a nickel in the slot, and then he's through for the day. Through for the day. Well, I guess everybody will have to give up the car soon. Everybody except my Uncle Gremlin Jolson. He doesn't need much gas for his car. Ah, uh, doesn't the rubber shortage bother him either? Nah. Instead of tires, my uncle uses four manhole covers dipped in bubble gum. Hello, Al. Well, Carol Bruce, shut my mouth. Say, Al, I heard you gave your car up. Yes, and I was glad to do it. But there's little things I miss. Now, for instance, I won't be able to go to Lake Placid for the winter sports. And you know how crazy I am about skiing, Carol. Oh, you mean sheing, Al. What? You mean sheing. Sheing? I like that, too. Well, anyway, <laughs> I'll, uh, 
I'll I'll never forget the first time I went skiing. I'll never forget. I'll never forget it. As I came down the ski slide and went gliding through the air, I felt like a goose on the loose. Really, I did. Then I landed... (laughs) Lady, will you cut that out, please? (laughs) The second week you've done that. (laughs) Then I've got to go over it again. Well, sir... (laughs) I felt like a goose on the loose. <laughs> then I, I landed head first in a snowbank, and I felt like a drip with a pip. That's the place to land. <laughs> and now, Carl Bruce will sing the big song of the day, Brazil. Brazil, the Brazil that we knew. Where I wandered with you Lives in my imagination Where the songs are passionate And a smile has flash in it And a kiss has art in it For you put your heart in it And so I dream of old Brazil Entertaining June, we stood beneath an amber moon and softly murmured, Someday soon we kissed and clung together. Then tomorrow was another day. The morning found me miles away. Thank you very much, Carol Bruce. That was lovely indeed. So, you know, folks, when your one and only love in life starts going out with somebody else, it's kind of too late to start worrying about whether or not your breath is always sweet. Now, that's something you've got to be sure about in advance. And that's why it's important to know now that in seven cases out of ten, Colgate tooth powder stops all unpleasing breath. Yes, stops it instantly. And that's a scientific fact. And it means now you can be sure of having a breath that's sweet and wholesome. Friends, it's so easy to protect yourself the Colgate tooth powder way. You simply brush your teeth night and morning and before every date with Colgate tooth powder. Feel how it bursts instantly into a lively, active, penetrating foam that swirls busily into those hard-to-get-at places. Leaves your mouth feeling cool, clean, and gloriously refreshed. And at the same time, the soft, safe polishing material in Colgate tooth powder reveals all the natural, attractive brilliance of your teeth. And that's why I say for a breath that's sweet and a smile that dazzles, get Colgate tooth powder, won't you please? It's the tooth powder that cleans your breath as it cleans your teeth. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, our guest is a man who's made laughter his business. He has done more to tickle the risibilities of a nation than any man I know. You've seen him in pictures, you've heard him on the radio, and you've read his books. Colgate is proud to present... Bob Benchley. Well, Bob, now you're on your mettle. Everybody knows, everybody <laughs> listening in knows that you're a humorist. Well, how about starting off with something funny? Go on, let's hear you pull a few nifties. Come on. No, no, Al. With prices the way they are, you better lay your own eggs. <laughs> Monty Woolley without a beard. Well, anyway. <laughs> well, if you want to be funny, I know a joke about a chicken, but I won't pull it. <laughs> you see, that's what I mean, Al. You know, there's also a ceiling on corn. <laughs> In that case, look, I didn't mean to be funny. Let's drop the whole thing. Let's talk about your visit to New York, Bob. Tell me something, old boy. How are you enjoying it here? 
Well, it's a little too cold for me, Al. Yeah? In fact, I woke up this morning drooling icicles. Drooling icicles. <laughs> well, you see, you've been in California for a few years, and maybe your blood uh, probably is a little thin. Well, I'm glad of that. I hate fat blood. Hate <laughs> Well, I don't mind that. But anyway, if you think it's cold, listen, you should have been here last week. It was so cold. The girls in the Star and Garter Review next door had to put on their red flannel beads. That's cold. <laughs> and you know, get this, and you know that picture in my bedroom of Whistler's mother sitting in a rocker? Yeah. Well, last night she had her feet in a pan of hot water, really. That's all. <laughs> well, Al, all I know is I almost froze over at the shipyards this morning. Yeah? I started to launch a ship and something happened to my arm. Well, what was it, Bob? Frostbite or something? I don't know what it was, Al. I just couldn't get the bottle past my mouth. Mm. <laughs> Boy, I wound up with a nasty headache. It's terrible. From the champagne? I don't know what it was, Al. I just couldn't. <laughs> they ran out of champagne, so they had to launch the ship with me. Oh, I get it. <laughs> For a moment, I didn't see anybody. No, I didn't get think it. anybody. <laughs> that was a break, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, Bob, listen. I know you haven't been to New York for quite a while. I'd like to show you around. Tell me something. Where are you staying? At the YWCA. Maybe you better show me around. Mm. <laughs> It might surprise you, though, Bob, to know this. I'm an air warden at the Martha Washington Hotel. Really? Yeah, and every day I go down and see my sirens. <coughs> well, I've been seeing a little bit of New York myself. Yeah? I went to a little nightclub last night, and they had a balloon dancer there. A balloon dancer? Did you have a good time? Oh, swell. Till the manager took away my bean shooter. <laughs> oh, you, I'm surprised at you, Bob, pulling a bean shooter on a balloon dancer. What would Miss... Cuddle snapper, your old school teacher say. Well, she was a balloon dancer. Oh. <laughs> well, Bob, I couldn't take you to places like that. My uncle would object. You see, he's a member of the Uplift Society. Uplift Society? Yeah, he goes around tilting pinball machines. <laughs> <laughs> now there, now there's a subject. It might sound like I'm kidding, but there's a subject you could really do a short on. How to be a successful pinball tilter, or when the lights go on again all over the machine. You know that new thing. <laughs> You know, Bob, I've seen every one of your shorts. I wouldn't miss them. How to sleep, how to dress, how to eat. What's the next one about? How to get a pound of coffee. <laughs> now you're talking, brother. How do you get a pound of coffee? Well, I'm sorry, Al. I can't tell you. That's a civilian secret. Well, when it comes to getting coffee... When it comes to getting coffee, I work as hard as LaGuardia does. What do you mean, Al? Every day it's the same old grind. <laughs> oh, well, well. <laughs> That's using that's the old bean, yeah, good. that's using <laughs> Another one like that, and Sandborn will be chasing you. What was that? Wait a minute. That was another one like that, and Sandborn will be chasing you. Chasing Sandborn. Oh, chasing Sandborn, it. chasing. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> what do I have to do? No, I... <laughs> Hatch it in the head and well, ahead. Okay, I'll stop. Tell me something, Bob. Are you making new shorts? Yes, Al. We're working on one now called uh, How to Get Rid of Crumbs After Eating Crackers in Bed. Well, how do you get rid of them? Oh, well, that's quite a problem, Al. No matter how much you brush them, you'll always find a crumb turning up in the strangest places. I don't Hello, know kids. What... Park your crackers. <laughs> Parky? Yeah? I want you to meet a famous movie actor, a man who is known to the girls in Hollywood as a strong, silent type. Yeah? A sort of a... Super Cooper. Super Cooper, huh? <laughs> to me, he looks more like a puny muni. <laughs> you don't understand, Parker. This is Robert Bentley. Oh. Humorist, author, actor, raconteur, a man about town, and a connoisseur of the arts. Does he also do his own laundry? <laughs> <laughs> Say, you know, you kept pretty busy, ain't you, Mr. Punchy? You like... <laughs> Correction, Parky. My name is Benchley, not Punchy. I see. It's always been Benchley. Where'd you get Punchy? I was dropped in my head when I was a baby. <laughs> That's how I happened to go into show business. Parker, you've been on the stage all these years? Sure. Did you really start out as an actor? No, as a little boy. What? <laughs> naturally, naturally, most of us do. Not my little sister. <laughs> you see, I began my career in a play which I wrote myself called Flotsam and Jetsam. Flotsam and Jetsam? Yeah. Well, that's the stuff that lies around the beaches. That was me for eight years. <laughs> Parky, wait a minute. Lying around the beaches is no good for you. That's how you put on all that weight. No, no, it's don't be my fault when I'm fat, you know. Yeah. I used to have a sickness called 60 miles from Rochester. Just a moment. A sickness called 60 miles from Rochester? Yeah, Syracuse veins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you need 
Parky, is exercise. Really? That's what I do. Look at me. I'm as fit as a fiddle. Yes, and you could use a few new strings, too. <laughs> Parky, that's no way to talk to anybody who's trying to help you. You'd be a lot better off if you exercised. I would? Yeah, that's what I do, too. Now, every day, every day I take long walks along the waterfront. Is that good? Is that good? Good, it's perfect. <laughs> Why, the waterfront is wonderful this time of year. What's more beautiful than the East River with snow or the Hudson River with ice? Green River with ginger ale. <laughs> Well, we could use it. I, uh, I hope you don't mind, Parky Bob. You see, he, he doesn't really know what he's saying. Who don't? I'm not as ignorant as I look, you know. No? For your information, last week I made $50 on information, please. How? Oh. Stole the cash register. What? <laughs> well, I, can't, I think Parky's rather amusing. You yes, know? in a gruesome way. Yeah. Make an, I make an ideal companion. Mm -hmm. Parky, look, I'm taking a hunting trip next week. Yeah? How'd you like to come along and uh, shoot a buck? You're faded. Wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. <laughs> We did that a month ago. Listen. <laughs> I was referring to wild game, Parky. Yeah? Now, for instance, in my trophy room at home, I have a mounted moose, stuffed eagle, and a mounted elk. Uh, did you ever bag a mason? <laughs> well, don't be silly, Parky. You couldn't... You couldn't have a mounted mason in your trophy room? Why not? My cook has got a mounted policeman in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't mind this guy, Bob. He's nothing but a big... D-O-P-E. You're right, Al. He's also a J-E-R-K, huh? <laughs> Listen, Bensley, I may be a D-O-P-E and a J-E-R-K, but on this program, I'm not just a guest. I got a steady J-O-B. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob... Now tell me, what is your final opinion of Parky? Well, I must invite him over to the house. Yeah? I want him to frighten my sister. She has hiccups. What? Well, <laughs> hey, Bob, by the way, I, I heard a lot about your new house. Can I come up to see it sometime? Anytime you say, Al. But remember, when you reach my house, be sure to go through the iron gate, not the wooden one. The iron gate? Yeah, there's, that's a little whim of mine. I don't know. <laughs> you see, the iron gate is for friends, and the wooden gate is for strangers. And what does your family use? What gate? Cold gate, naturally. <laughs> this is the play. That's my game. Thanks very much for the plug, Bob Bensley. <laughs> you know, friends, seriously, no matter how attractive a person may look, they're not attractive to be with unless their breath is sweet. Isn't that right? And that's why it's important for all of us to know that in seven cases out of ten, Colgate tooth powder stops oral unpleasing breath instantly. And that's a scientific fact, friends. Scientific proof that you can make sure of having a breath that's sweet simply by brushing your teeth the easy Colgate tooth powder way. That's all there is to it. Just brush your teeth night and morning and before every date and feel how Colgate tooth powder bursts into a lively, active, penetrating foam. Feel it swirl busily into those hard-to-get-at places, leaving your whole mouth feeling refreshed and cool and clean. Yes, and notice, too, how the soft, safe polishing material in Colgate tooth powder reveals all the natural, attractive sparkle of your teeth. And then you'll know why I say for a breath that's sweet and a smile that dazzles, get Colgate tooth powder, the tooth powder that cleans your breath as it cleans your teeth. And one more thing, friends. These, you know, of course, are war times. So if your dealer happens to be temporarily out of Colgate tooth powder, just remember that the Colgate people are working night and day to keep him supplied and his order will be filled just as soon as possible. Use tooth powder every day, brush your teeth the Colgate way. This is Bob Benchley again, ladies and gentlemen. In my time, I've seen quite a few pictures. Most of them I've forgotten, but there's one that I'll always remember. That was the picture in which Al Jolson sang a song that will always live in the hearts of young and old alike. And when Mr. Jolson asked me to appear on this program tonight, I made him promise me that he'd sing that song. I'm sure you've all guessed the title by now, Sonny Boy. Thank you, Bob, for that swell introduction about that little song, and I hope when you're leaving tomorrow for California and make that picture with Fred Astaire, I hope and trust it'll be a big hit. Climb up on my knee, sunny boy Though you're only three, sunny boy 
You've no way of knowing There's no way of showing What you mean to me, sonny boy When there are gray skies I don't mind the gray sky You make them blue, sunny boy Friends may forsake me Let them all forsake me I still have you, sunny boy You're sent from a heaven And I know your word You've made a heaven For me right here on earth When I'm old and gray, dear Promise You won't stray, dear For I love you so Sonny boy When there are gray skies I don't mind I don't mind gray skies You make them blue, sunny boy. Friends, friends may forsake me. Let them, let them all, let them all forsake me. I still have you, sunny boy. You're sent from heaven, and I, I know your worth. You've made a heaven for me. And and the angels they grew lonely. Took you because they were lonely. No, I'm a lonely fool. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Next week, folks, in addition to our regular cast, we bring you one of America's unsung heroes, a boy who has just returned from Guadalcanal, Private First Class Dana Babcock, a parachutist in the United States Marine Corps. Private Babcock was in the first boat to storm the beach at Dawu II in the Solomons. And next Tuesday, we bring you Private Babcock and 20 of his Marine buddies. I hope you'll all be listening next Tuesday. Now, good night to you all, and thank you. <laughs> Don't forget, friends, that today, next week, with Al Jolson and his guest, Private Dana Babcock, and our regular cast, presented by Colgate Tooth Powder, the tooth powder that cleans your breath as it cleans your teeth. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> Makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by Billy Mills Orchestra and the King's Men. The show opens with Be Young Again.
about this time of year, we always receive a number of letters from customers and friends who find out it's a good thing to put wax on their shoes and boots. Why don't you tell everybody, they write, that Johnson's Wax helps to make shoes water and weatherproof, keeps them soft and pliable and protects the leather. Well, I certainly haven't any objection to passing that good word along because I use wax on my own shoes and on my riding boots and saddles and leather gloves, too, and my luggage. The fact is, I've always been a great booster for using Johnson's Wax on things made of leather. So if any of you think wax is only meant for your floors, furniture, and woodwork, you only know half the wax story. There are 100 extra ways to use Johnson's Wax around your home for the conservation and protection of your things to make them last longer, look better, and clean more easily. If you were secretary of the Wistful Vista Chamber of Commerce and wanted to appoint somebody to go to the hospital and visit one of the members who was ill, you'd want somebody who was quiet and modest and soothing and thoughtful and tactful and soft-spoken, wouldn't you? Somebody like Fibber McGee of Fibber McGee and Molly. So when I volunteers to go visit this sick member, there was a dead silence. They were all probably dumbfounded to see a man of my importance taking time for such a kindly act. Yeah, that must have been it. Betcha. Who are you going to the hospital to cheer up, in spite of everybody? <laughs> well, I, uh... Oh, my gosh, imagine that. The secretary forgot to tell me. <laughs> well, anyway, I gotta go down there and cheer him up. Take him some candy and cigarettes and tell him a few funny gags. Well, what's the matter with this unknown patient up till now? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you better find out. Huh? You know, if he's got appendicitis, you can't take him candy. No? And if he's had his tonsils out, he can't smoke. And if his jaw's dislocated, he can't laugh at those funny gags. You see? Oh, gee, I never thought of that. I better call the secretary right now. Hand me the phone. Here. Thanks. Hello, operator. Give me the whistle, Mr. Chamber of Commerce on the second floor of Mert. Is that you? Oh. <laughs> How's every little thing, Mert? Is it? What's a Mert? You haven't? She hasn't what? Hasn't heard a word from any of her relatives. Well, <laughs> thank goodness. What's a Mert? Oh, except her cousin, she said. No. What about your cousin, Mert? He bought what? 1,500 pounds of horse meat. Heavenly days to eat. No, he's going to ride it to work and save his time. <laughs> What's a Mert? Oh, 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 you got the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> oh, hello, is this Mr. Powers? This is Fibber McGee speaking, Dick. Yeah. Say, who am I supposed to visit in the hospital and what's the matter with him? Who? Oh, my gosh, I'll get right down there right away, Mr. Powers. Okay, goodbye. Who is it, dearie? Billy Mills. No, what's wrong with him? I don't know. They said it was nothing serious. I saw him just yesterday, and he looked as good as I do. As bad as that? <laughs> I wonder if I hadn't better make him a bowl of soup or something. No, I might hurt the hospital's feeling. Hey, uh, let's take him that fruitcake Aunt Sarah sent us for Christmas. Fruitcake for a sick man? Yeah, well, he's already sick, ain't he? <laughs> Personally, I can't stand that stuff. And then I'll stop and get him some cigars and some candy and a book of cheap Wahoo comics. Uh, wow. Poor Billy. I certainly hope it's nothing serious. I probably got a little touch of band leader's bumps. <laughs> what on earth are band leader's bumps? That's what you get when you play Mr. Five by Five so, so much, somebody socks you with a two by four. <laughs> See, when have I got to get candy, magazines, cigars? You know, I don't think Mr. Mill smokes cigars. He smokes cigarettes. No, it's time he learned to smoke cigars. Why, when I was only 17 years old, I smoked... Come in. Hello there, kids. Welcome home. Well, well, Mr. Oldtimer, it's nice to see you again. Now, what do you mean, welcome home? You're the one that's been away. I certainly have. I mean, I certainly have. <laughs> trip, too. Spent three weeks in Chicago. Ah, the old windy city. How is the old town since we left, old-timer? Not so windy, Johnny. Not so windy. <laughs> Go down to a breeze. Well, did you go on the train, Mr. Oldtimer? Sure did, daughter. Wonderful trip. Got to talk to a sergeant just back from the front. Told me all about the war. Hope he didn't spill any military secrets. Nope. Too smart for that, Johnny. When he come to a secret, he just says some vegetable instead. Oh, uh, how do you mean? Well, sir, daughter, he tells me his troop ship, the SS Rutabaga, left the harbor of sweet potato on the lima bean of green peas. 
<laughs> says it was escorted by three big golden bantams and a small fleet of turnips with four motored onions flying overhead. <laughs> must, have been a, must have been a very nourishing experience. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, it's kind of thrilling, Johnny. Yeah? He says they arrived at North Succotash about the 14th of celery and went into action immediately. Wow. Says they killed 3,000 cabbages and captured 600 radishes. <laughs> He says, don't repeat it to anybody, but he got inside information that the war will be over by the squash of April, 1900 and garlic. Nineteen hundred and garlic. Well, we won't breathe a word of it. <laughs> That's pretty good, daughter. Well, I've got to be running along now. What's your hurry, Mr. Oldtimer? Why don't you get me a paper and see if there's any answer to my ad, daughter? Your ad? What ad? Put a ad in the paper, Johnny. Yeah? Wanted. Woman with pound of butter and a pig to meet man with can of syrup and a frying pan. <laughs> Object, wheat cakes and sausage. Well, <laughs> Hospital, Molly. You got the fruitcake and the candy? Yes. Have you got the magazines and the cigars and the malted milk and the donuts? Yep. I got him a taffy apple, too, but it looks so good I ate it myself. <laughs> I got some bubble gum for him instead. With bubble gum, you can... Wait a minute, it. McGee. Hmm? Here comes Mrs. Uppington. Uh-oh, oh Old Night Bear Nellie, the girl of my dreams. <laughs> wonder what she's been doing at the hospital. Maybe... <laughs> Maybe getting an estimate on having her face lifted, dearie. What? Again? That mug is, that mug has been hoisted so many times now, it's all she can do to keep her feet on the ground. Now, McGee, I don't... Hello there, Abigail, darling. So nice to see you. Oh, how do you do, Mr. McGee? And Mr. McGee. All right, Eppie. Congratulations. You got the right spirit. The right spirit about what, McGee? Can't you see? She's pulling her shoulders to take all those little minks for a ride. <laughs> Very, very amusing, Miss McGee. <laughs> May I ask your wife a question? Why, certainly, Abigail. What is it? Well, tell me, Mrs. McGee, what is the annual yield of corn from one little wiseacre like Mr. McGee? <laughs> well, Abigail, if it was all piled up in one corner of the field, it would be quite a shock. <laughs> What are you doing down here at the hospital? Oh, I came down here to visit my housekeeper, Mrs. Underwood. What's the matter with her, Uppy? She sprained a ligament in her arm, the poor soul. Oh, how? Oh, we had unexpected guests for dinner last evening, and she tried to stretch her filet mignon. <laughs> well, I simply must go buy my war bond, thanks to Mr. McGee. Yeah, why thanks to me? Because every time I see you, Mr. McGee, I think of inflation. <laughs> And when I think of inflation, I think how important it is that this country maintain financial control during and after this war, which means everyone must buy all the war bonds he possibly can. So please stay out of my sight for the rest of the week. I'm over my budget now. <laughs> Goodbye, Mrs. McGee. Goodbye, Abigail.
Well, come on, inflation. Or, I mean, McGee. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't tell Uppy about Billy Mills. She could never cheer anybody up. She's a walking lull if I ever saw one. <laughs> well, come on. So you better ask the nurse at the desk where Mr. Mills is, McGee. Yeah, look at her giving us the once over. Why do all the hospitals have some eagle eye at the desk that looks at you like you'd come in to blow the joint up? <laughs> hey, sis, could you tell us... Please, be more quiet. We're all right. <laughs> but we wanted to know where we could find Mr. Mills. He's a patient here. Mills? That's right. Well, just a minute. I'll find out. Hey, Costadine, what room is Mills in? Who? <laughs> Mills! Room 502! Oh, much obliged, Constantine. What say, Murphy? I can't say! Oh! Don't mention it! So, Mr. Mills is in room... Not so loud, please. <laughs> what? Oh, 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 excuse me. <clears throat> uh, Wistful Vista Hospital? Miss Murphy speaking. Who? Oh? No, madam, I'm sorry, but Dr. Case is out on a bender. Uh, I mean, Dr. Bender is out on a case. <laughs> Yes, I'll be glad to tell him. Come on, now. Room 502. Don't drop that suitcase. Hey, there ain't any elevator man here. Hmm? Not so loud, Mickey. And this is one of those elevators you run yourself. Oh. Get in and press the button with the five on. Five. Okay. You ready? Ready. Here we go. <laughs> Over. Me too. Hey, sis, can you tell us where we can... What was it, please? We're visiting one of the patients, room 502. Oh, I'm sorry. The patient has just gone to the delivery room. The delivery room? <laughs> Is he expecting a package? <laughs> the delivery room... Oh, my goodness, there must be some mistake here. Oh, no, there isn't, madam. And I may tell you, the whole staff is interested in this case. It's going to be twins, at least. Hey, what? Twins? You mean Billy Mills? Quiet, please. And who did you say? Mr. Mills. Billy Mills in 502, the man we came here to see. Oh, they gave you the wrong card at the desk. We have a Mrs. Millie Bills in 502. <laughs> you are room 306. Oh, well, much obliged, sis. Back in the elevator, McGee. Okay, okay. Don't crowd me now. This malted milk is dripping as it is. <laughs> the candy all set. Not so loud, please. Oh, I thought you were gone. <laughs> Press button number three, dearie. Okay. <laughs> Remind me to write to General Eisenhower about that elevator. <laughs> Imagine a tank that goes straight up and down. McGee. Huh? I just sworn I saw Mr. Wilcox go in that third door there. Ah, oh, you're imagining things. What will he be doing down here on a Tuesday night? Which door was it? This one? Yes. Yeah. It says nurse's training. You suppose, say, you suppose he's got a date with a nurse. Let's peek and see. Oh, no. That wouldn't be right, McGee. I'm going to do it anyway. Well, don't be selfish. Let me see, too. So, when you girls go out on a case, always be sure that quick sanitation prevails wherever food is prepared. Be sure the <laughs> linoleum floors are sparkling and immaculate. This can best be done with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat, which is very easily applied and shines as it dries with no rubbing or bubbing. Glow coat seals surfaces against dust and dirt and dampness which is very important from a health standpoint. Miss Demuley, please put that gum in the wastebasket. <laughs> You'll find girls that most housekeepers today use Johnson's glow coat, but in those rare cases where... Hmm. Old Professor Wilcox, M.D. M.D.? Mighty determined to sell his wax one way or another. <laughs> well, come on, Molly, before this small note goes flat. We won't... Oh, wait a minute, McGee. Here comes the doctor. Where? Oh, the guy in the white coat. Hi, Doc. Good afternoon. You are visitors? Yes, yes, to see Mr. Mills. How's he getting along? Splendidly, splendidly. What was the name again? <laughs> Mills. Billy Mills. Oh, yes. Oh, he's doing very nicely. Isn't he the tall, thin, dark chap? Uh, no. No, Mr. Mills is short and heavy set, and uh, uh, he's blonde, isn't he, McGee? I don't remember, and I doubt if Billy does. <laughs> 
anyway, he, he's the guy in 306, Doc. Ah, oh, yes, 306. Uh-huh. Getting along nicely. Oh, fine. Though we don't like to make specific statements in most cases. Everything is relative, you know. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Things are never what they seem. For instance, there is nothing so permanent as a temporary filling. Or as temporary as a permanent wave. <laughs> uh, well, if you will excuse me... You will be quiet, won't you? Uh, yes, we will, Doctor. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Mills. Come on, McGee. I'm tired of carrying these packages. Three or six, Well, hello, Mom. Hello, Skim. Hello, Mr. Mills. Hi, Billy. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. We come down to cheer you up, kid. Yes, sir. Well, how do you feel? Kind of rocky, eh? Hey, here's a chocolate mold for you and some donuts. And give him a hunk of fruitcake, Molly. Hey, Billy, did you ever hear the one about the guy that... Oh, I almost forgot. Here, have a cigar. Did you ever hear the one... About... Talk to him on those magazines, Molly. It's yeah. a very funny story, Billy, about the fellas. Hey, you like bubble gum? It's all kinds of fun. Yeah. Anyway, it seems there was these two fellas. See, Pat and Mike, we'll call them. Uh, and McGee. It... Huh? Stop slapping Mr. Mills on the knee. Oh, that's okay. I won't catch anything. I got my gloves on. <laughs> hey, here's a box of candy for you, Billy, old man. Chocolate covered cherry. For goodness sakes, McGee, be quiet a minute. Huh? This is no way to treat a sick man. Are you very sick, Mr. Mills? Not sick at all, Mom. Feel swell. You're not sick? Then what you here for? Spend a couple of days here every two years. Get checked up. Gives me a nice rest, too. Mm. Two days in the hospital when you're not even sick? Don't you get lonesome? Nope. Anyway, I had a roommate up till this morning. Mm. Too bad he couldn't have stayed. I know. He'd have been gone even sooner, but he took a turn for the nurse. <laughs> have a donut yourself, Skimp. Thanks, I will. Donut, Molly? No, thank you. So you're not sick at all, Mr. Mills, huh? Never felt better, Mom. Mind if I drink this malted milk, Billy? Help yourself. Eat the candy, too. Oh, I never touch it. Mr. Mills, now, I'll bet you're really sick and you won't tell it. Honest, Mom. Stick out your tongue. Yeah. <laughs> My gosh, look at it, Molly. It's all black. Heavenly day. Oh, it's nothing. My nurse is nearsighted. Hmm? She took my temperature this morning with her fountain pen. <laughs> Have some bubble gum, Billy? No, thanks. Mm. Hey, Mom. Yes? Press that button on the wall there, will you? All right. Thanks. What does that do? That's the signal for the nurse. Oh, maybe we better leave the game. No, no, no. Stay here, Mom. I always press that button while I don't want to be disturbed for an hour or so. Hmm. <laughs> well, I'm sure glad you ain't sick, Will. Here, have a chocolate-covered cherry. No thanks, Drip. Huh? I said no thanks. They drip. Oh. <laughs> uh, I missed a word. You know, I think he looks wonderful, don't you, McGee? Except that he's kind of drawn around the mouth. Been suffering much pain, Mr. Mills. I am not sick, Mom. I feel fine. Just here for a checkup. People get that look sometimes before they get sick, Molly. You they know do, that. Huh? Anyway, that ain't what worried me. What gets me is that twitch in his left temple. You see? That's a sure sign of fallen arches. Is that what makes his lips so blue looking too, dearie? Absolutely. Though the whites of his eyes looking so yellow, that don't mean anything. That could be a simple case of either jaundice or low metabolism or whatever. <laughs> I knew a guy once that had metabolism. <laughs> McGee. Huh? Come on, dearie. Huh? Where? Mr. Mills has fallen asleep. We better go. What do you mean we gotta go? After all the trouble we took to come down here and cheer him up? Oh, sir. Hey, Billy, wake up. Where's your man? McGee, for goodness sakes, don't Look, move. when I come to a hospital to cheer somebody up, they're gonna cheer up and like it, see? <laughs> hey, Billy, wake up. Grab his other shoulder, Molly. We'll shake him away. Hey, Billy. Really? <laughs> Uh-oh. What time is it? Oh, McGee, this is terrible. We should... Laugh out of it, Billy. I got some great gags to tell you. <laughs> Boy, they'll kill you. <laughs> if he gets drowsy again, Molly, slap him in the puss with a wet towel. <laughs> hey, Billy, did you ever hear the one about the knight of the round table who was scared of horses? <laughs> this is a honey. Well, sir, this knight wouldn't ride a horse, see? So he put a saddle on a big Great Dane dog. <laughs> He'd ride all over the kingdom on this dog, see? And one night... <laughs> Lullaby of the Herd. Steady, steady. Oh, hush a bye. Go to sleep, my doggies. Just a breeze, gently stirred. Nothing bad comes to harm, my doggies. Sing the lullaby of 
Knight was climbing back onto the Great Dane, see? And he says, okay, he says, I've changed my mind, he says. I'll give you a room. I wouldn't turn a knight away on a dog like this. (laughs) 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 Hey, you better finish up this fruitcake, Billy. There's only a little piece of it left. Oh, thanks. Heavenly days, have you eaten all that fruitcake, dearie? No, not all of it. I dropped a little hunk of it in Billy's bed, I guess. (laughs) Part with some walnuts and raisins in it, too. <laughs> You're lucky I didn't drop a chocolate-covered cherry. <laughs> hey, where are they? You ate those, too, McGee. I did? Well, Billy shouldn't be eating such rich stuff like that, anyway. Just laying there in bed, no exercise. Hey, Billy, did I ever tell you the one about the guy that was... Up? What is this, Halloween? Come in. <laughs> well, Mr. Wimple. Hello, folks. Hello, Mr. Mills. Hello, <laughs> I'm glad to see you back, Wimp, old man. Have a nice trip? Oh, just gorgeous, Mr. McGee. <laughs> it's a beautiful trip from here to Philadelphia. Yeah? I never saw such scenery. Oh, what was it like, Mr. Wimple? I never saw it. They had the shades down to the black eye. <laughs> Miss Sweetie Face, Wallace? Oh, not very much, Mr. Mills. I had a picture with me all the time. Oh. The one she sent me when we were corresponding through the matrimonial agency. <laughs> oh, so that's how you met Sweetie Face. Through a bride and bachelor bingo club, eh? Yes. I sent her my picture, and she sent me her picture. Oh, was it love at first sight? It was for her, Mrs. McGee. It took me longer. You see, Sweetie Face sent me her picture on a jigsaw puzzle so the shock wouldn't be too sudden. (laughs) There's still a piece missing out of her nose, but off her it looks good. You glad to see you back, Wallace? Oh, indeed she was. She grabbed me and almost smothered me. With kisses? No, just smothered me. <laughs> she was mad because I lost one of my shirts in the laundry. Well, it was nice of you to come down and see Billy on your first day home, Wimp. How'd Sweetie Face ever let you out? Oh, she didn't want me to go, but I insisted. Yeah? So she finally said, all right, go down to the darn old hospital if you must, but let's make it worthwhile. So she broke my arm, see? <laughs> You better go get it looked after. Oh, it's all right, Mrs. McGee. This is the one she always wears. <laughs> last time I, last time I had them put a hinge on the bone. Well, goodbye now. <laughs> we've cheered Billy up, Molly, I guess we better go, too, huh? As soon as I finish this last donut. Well, don't hurry away. Oh, I think we better... Uh, did you ring, Mr. Mills? Yes, but you didn't have to drop everything and run in here, baby. <laughs> when can I leave? Right now, if you like. Your reports are all in and everything's fine. Your visitors can either step outside or you can dress behind the screen. Well, we'll just step outside for a few minutes. Oh! Hey! Look at Skip. Oh. He's turning purple. McGee, what's the matter, dearie? Oh! Oh! I... <laughs> 
I don't feel good. Oh, oh Mr. Mills, get out of that bed. Uh, oh, Here, madam, yes. help me get this man up there. All right. Oh, take off his shoes. Yes. Oh, never mind my shoes. My feet don't hurt. <laughs> It's my stomach. Oh, it looks like a cute indigestion. Oh. What's he been eating? Box of candy, fruit cake, hauled milk, six donuts, and some bubble gum. Oh. McGee, darling, uh, lie down, dearie. Uh, let Mother loosen your collar. Uh, get a doctor nurse. Oh, yes, right away, Mother. Oh, 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 I told him not to put an egg in that malted. Oh. Now, you just be calm, dearie. The doctor will be here in a minute. Oh. What's the matter, Miss Mills? Oh. Hand me the phone, Mom. Oh. Thanks. Oh. Hello? Operator? Oh, oh, oh. Give me the West Chamber of Commerce. Oh. Yeah? Oh, oh is that you, Mert? Oh! <laughs> Never mind that, Mert. Give me the Chamber of Commerce. Hello? Is this you, Mr. Powers? Billy Mills speaking. Oh. From the hospital. Mr. McGee is sick down here, and I want you to send somebody down to cheer him up. Oh, how nice. How nice, oh. Billy. Yes. Boris Karloff, if you can get him. Oh! <laughs> Sabotage has become very familiar to all of us this past year. If I use the expression dirt sabotage, I wonder how many of you ladies would know just what I mean. Well, then I'll explain. During the winter months, dirt is really a problem. It comes into the house at the front and back doors, on shoes, rubbers, and on the feathery feet of that favorite cocker spaniel of yours. I know. And there's another dirt spot in winter, around the radiators and especially on windowsills. Now, if that dirt isn't removed, it soon gets all through the house. Not only does damage to the finish of floors and furniture and to rugs and fabrics, but it can be a health menace, too, because dirt favors germs. And so dirt that isn't controlled does cause sabotage. Now, what could you do about it? Well, you all know by now that regular applications of Johnson's Wax paste liquid or cream at those dirt spots on the floors in front of doorways and on windowsills make it much easier to keep them clean, to keep the whole house gleaming and more sanitary. Well, how do you feel now, McGee? Much better, thanks. But I guess I shouldn't have eaten all that stuff. I'm ashamed of you. Yeah. Making a pig of yourself. Yeah. A great big pig. Yeah. And on a meatless day. Huh? Oh, good night. Good night, all. <laughs> Characters of Wallace Wimple and the Old Timer heard on this program were played by Bill Thompson. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This program is reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is your narrator, the man in black. Again about to introduce tonight's Columbia program, Suspense. The story is The Pit in the Pendulum by Edgar Allan Poe. The adaptation by John Dixon Carr. Our guest is the distinguished American actor, Mr. Henry Hull, who plays the part of a prisoner of the Spanish Inquisition. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that Suspense is compounded of mystery, suspicion, and dangerous adventure to hold you in a precarious situation and withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with The Pit and the Pendulum and Mr. Hull's performance, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. And now, The Pit and the Pendulum. I was sick, sick.
sick unto death with that long agony. And when at length they unbound me and I was permitted to sit, I felt that my senses were leaving me. The sound of the inquisitorial voices seemed merged in one dreamy, indeterminate hum. Yet, for a while, I saw, but with how terrible an exaggeration, I saw the soft and nearly imperceptible waving of the sable draperies on the walls of the room. I saw the flames of the seven tall candles which burned on the table. I saw the lips of the black hooded judges, and these lips appeared to me white, white as paper, white as horror. I saw them writhe with a deadly locution. I saw them fashion the syllables of my name. Jean Delbray, Captain Jean Delbray. Good fathers, gentlemen. We hear you, my son. I, I am very weak and infirm. I've been confined for many months in a dungeon. I, I've been tormented by nightmares. The conscience, one trusts. Pray silence, Fra Antonio. Even, even now, I, I have no knowledge of where I am or to whom I may be speaking. You are speaking to me, my son. I am Fra Pedro de Espela, prior of the Dominicans of Segovia and Grand Inquisitor of all Spain. Is this... Is this the court of the Inquisition? It is. Oh, then, then God help me. He will help you, my son, if you trust him. But I, I am a French officer. That is true. A soldier and creature of the Archfiend Napoleon Bonaparte. But a French officer nonetheless. A prisoner of war. By what right do you try me in this court? Let the clerk read the charges against this prisoner. Pray silence while the clerk reads the charges. The charges against the prisoner are as follows. Imprimis, that he is one Jean d'Albray, a captain of artillery in the army of Bonaparte, so-called emperor of the French. This means nothing, as the prisoner says. It is no crime. Proceed. Item, that on the fourth day of September in the year of our Lord, 188, that says Jean d'Albray did wear to spouse and marry the most noble lady, the Doña Beatrice Valdez, niece of the... and ward of the illustrious... One moment. Your Excellency spoke. Fra Antonio, was any cheat employed to trap this girl into marriage against her will? Mm, no, we have no actual evidence of any cheat. Was the girl of age? I believe so. Then wherefore is the prisoner here? <laughs> this marriage was a deplorable thing, if you like. Bonaparte himself is almost at the gates of Madrid. His general, La Salle, menaces our city of Toledo itself. But lawful marriage, however regrettable, is no sin or crime. There are other matters in the indictment, I think. Then continue, but give us nothing that is not material. Item, that on the 12th of October, 188, the Sergeant d'Albray, being in command of a five-gun battery of light artillery, did direct the fire of his guns against the Holy Church of St. Martha the Innocent. What? And thereby, of his wicked malice, destroyed that church utterly. Captain d'Albray... Is this charge true? It is, yes. You admit it? Good father, hear what I have to say. The church blew up, I think. Would you boast of your sin, young man? It blew up because it was stored with kegs of gunpowder for your army. I had every right to fire on it. And that is all the defense you have to make? I tell you, I had every right to fire on it by military law. There is was military law above God's law? I, I don't know. I did my duty, that's all. Long live the Emperor! Captain Dalbray, mark what I say. No man, however great his heresy, is ever condemned to be burnt in the fire. The fire? In the fire. If he first recant and acknowledge the error of his ways. But for you, Jean Dalbray, there can be no mercy, no pity, no atonement. The only sentence of this court can be death. Yes. 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 The secular or government arm to which we must release you has devised two ways of punishment in cases such as yours. You hear the tolling of the bell? I hear them. It is the procession of the condemned going to the auto de fe. Soon the yellow light of the flames will stream through the windows and flicker on floor and ceiling. Nunc et in hora mortis into his manibus domine. Most of those condemned out of mercy will be strangled before they are burned. It cannot be so with you, Jean d'Albray. You must die in one of two ways. 
either with the direst of physical agony. A slow fire of green wood, iced bandages about the head and the heart, so that the fire does not approach too quickly. Or else, Jean Delbray, you must die in a certain other way. I've done with this! Pass your sentence and let me go! The law does not permit me to tell you now what this other way is. The sentence of this court, therefore... I... I had swooned. Yet still, I would not say that all of consciousness was lost. In the deepest slumber, no. In delirium, no. In a swoon, no. In death, no. Even in the grave, all is not lost. There are shadows of memory which tell us indistinctly of tall figures that lifted me and bore me in silence down, down, still down, until a hideous dizziness oppressed me at that descent into the earth. Then, as consciousness swam back to my wits, darkness, a stone floor, and dark. Oh, Beatrice. Beatrice, my wife, Beatrice. Did you call me, Jean? Beatrice, was that you who spoke? Yes, Jean. You were here in the dungeons of the Inquisition. I am not really speaking to you, my poor Jean. I am only in your imagination. Am I mad, then? No. But your brain is fevered. You only think you hear me. No, no, no. I, I do. I do. I hear you clearly. As clearly as I once heard in you. In the little church near the Abro where we were married. Yes, yes, yes. I, I destroyed that church, Beatrice. I had to. It was my commanding officer's order. I know, Jean. Be comforted. There are those who care. You won't leave me. As long as I am in your heart, I shall be here. I, I was strong once. Now, now I am weak. Once I was reckless. Now, now I'm afraid. What am I, Beatrice? What are they going to do to me? I cannot tell. Remember, my voice comes only from your own brain. Are you fettered? Fettered? I... I no. They've not chained you to the wall? Uh, no, no. no. They've, they've taken away my uniform. They've given me sandals and a robe of what feels like coarse serge. But I'm, I'm still free. Uh, free. Take courage, young. Free. And in the grasp of the Inquisition, Beatrice. Yes, Jean. It's completely dark. There's hardly any air. I I dread to get up. I dread to stretch out my hand. Suppose, suppose they've buried me alive. Courage. Can you stand up? I, I, I think so, yes. Then walk. Walk as far as you can. Measure the limit of the cell. If this is not a tomb... You're right, Beatrice. That's always. I'll, I'll try. Are you on your feet? Yes. Now, now pray. Pray for a poor devil who always meant well. One pace. Two paces. Three. Four. You are very weak, Jean. Rest a moment. Where are you now, Beatrice? In, in the flesh, I mean. You know that, Jean. In the old house by the olive grove. Scorned of my people. Yes, I know it. Each morning I climb to the hilltop and watch. Go on, go on. Sometimes I think I hear gun wheels yes. rumble in the hills. Yes. And long moving columns yes. with the red dust rising above. Go them. on, go on. First come the heavy cavalry in plume crested helmets. Yes. On their flanks, wheeling like hawks, light hussars in blue and scarlet. And behind them, in a glitter of bayonets as vast as light points on the sea, yes. rank upon yes. rank. Yes. The long gray coats and the tall bearskin caps. The old god and the grand army. It is only a vision, my dear one. They do not come. Ah, will they? Will they ever come, Beatrice? I cannot tell. Then, then I must face what has been prepared for me. Walk again, Jean. Try. Keep your hand in front of you. This robe, this robe, it impedes me. And the floor is treacherous with slime. But I'll try. Uh, four paces. Five. Six. Seven. It can't be a tomb. Eight. Nine. Look out! Uh, I'm all right. I fell, I fell. 
fell to my knees. I, the rope, the rope tripped me. My, my hand is in front of me. It's lower than my face, but I, I feel, I feel nothing. Nothing, John. It's a pit, a circular pit, and I fell on the very edge of it. Oh. They would have made you walk into it. Yes. Oh, there. There's a loose fragment of rock just inside the edge. Now, if I can dislodge it. It might be. Listen. Water. There's, there's something down there. Rats, it may be. Rats, yes, but something else. I, I heard it move. So did I. What is in the pit, Sean? I don't know. But you're saved. Uh, saved, Beatrice. Saved from the Inquisition. <laughs> my, my torture has been merely postponed. Deep sleep fell upon me. Sleep like that of death. How long it lasted, I, I know not. But when I opened my eyes once again, I could see. Yes, see. My prison was large and lofty. Its walls formed a massive iron plates, bolted or joined together. A wild, sulfurous luster, I could not trace its origin, lit up the dungeon and the circular pit and the crudely daubed skeleton figures painted in evil colors on the iron walls. Skeleton figures, demon figures, gargoyle figures. The colors a little blurred as from the effects of the damp. It must approach you slowly and force itself into your mind. It must stalk you like a tiger. It must bring you face to face at last with the king of terror. When I, when I regained consciousness, I lay on my back and at full length on a low framework of wood. To this framework, I was securely bound by a long fastening resembling a surgical bandage. Bound? But why? 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 The bandage passed round and round my body, leaving at liberty only my head and my left arm. With much exertion, I could supply myself with food from an earthen dish on the floor beside me. It was meat, highly seasoned, but there was no water. Beatrice! Beatrice, where are you? Here, Jean, as always. Your voice sounds stronger. Does it, Jean? And I, I can see you now. I can see you as clearly as I saw you months ago. Oh, I wish it were true. Your bonnet and the parasol you carried in summer and the high-waisted blue dress. You are weaker, my dear, and more uh, fevered. Have I... Have I been asleep? Yes, John. They must have been here while I slept. They have bound me. Why? 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 Stop those voices! Why? Stop them! Mine Why? too, Jean. Why? I Why? am not here either, you Why? know. Don't drive me away. Beatrice, Beatrice, look, look, look. Where? At the ceiling of this room, 30, 40 feet up, what do you see? I see painted on the ceiling a figure of Father Time. Anything else? But Father Time carries no sign. No. He carries instead what looks like a gigantic pendulum from an ancient clock. About one thing, I swear I'm in my right senses. I saw that pendulum move. A painting cannot move. Yet I swear the pendulum did move. It swung a little back and forth, just like... A real pendulum. Try not to trouble your brain. That pendulum is real. Beatrice, Beatrice, take care. Take care of what? You're not looking at the pendulum now. Take care of the rats, the rats from the pit. I see them. They're swarming out in dozens. You can see their eyes glitter. One of them ran across the hem of your dress. Did it, son? What did they want? They caught the scent of the meat in the dish beside you. But they'll not get it. Go away, go away, you vermin. Move your hand above the plate, Jean. Move. Beatrice, Beatrice, where are you going? I, I could hardly hear you. You are sending me away, Jean. I am sending you away. My poor loved one. You can't bear to see the rats running about my feet. Beatrice! 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 Yes. Yes, it's true. In 
her cell swarming with vermin. There are others I had rather see here. I'd rather see... Did you call me Captain Dalbray? Then in spirit, I am here. Who are you? You don't you recognize me? No, I do not. I am that second inquisitor, Fra Antonio, whom you thought unfair at your trial. But we were not unfair. We administer the law. That is all. So, I command you, go. Not until I have first told you what you already get. Which is? There are two forms of death for such as you. One, death with its direst physical torture. The other, death with its direst mental torture. And I, I have been condemned to the second? Your guess is good. Listen. Yes. Do you hear anything? Yes, yes, I do. I, I hear something. Turn your eyes upwards. Yes. Look at the ceiling. The pendulum. Aye, the pendulum. It's descended. Only a foot or so, as yet. As you notice, it is not really a pendulum. Its underside is a crescent, formed of sharp, of razor-sharp steel. You mean... A ponderous weight, Captain Dalbray. Its movement is slow now. But soon it will take on momentum. It will swing wider and wider. Thirty feet, perhaps. Presently, as it swings, you will hear it hiss. And with each broad movement, it will creep a trifle lower. Steel is direct. Above me. Yes. About the region of your heart. Ah. Lie still and look up at it. How? How long before? You need have no immediate fear. It will not be too soon. But how soon? Who can tell? In the name of pity, give me some answer. Hours, perhaps days. It's beginning to swing wider. I, I can't. Take my eyes from it. Its glitter fascinates you. Eh? See how it shines in that wild light. And this is your utmost refinement in cruelty. The law, Captain Dalbray, is never cruel. And now, still in spirit, I leave you to your meditations. It will not be too soon. Minutes, hours, days. Down, steadily down it crept. Days passed. It might have been many days before it, it swept so closely as to fan me with its morbid breath. Minutes. Days. The odor of the sharp steel forced itself into my nostrils. The right. To the left. Far and wide. The shriek of a damned spirit. To my heart. With the stealthy pace of a tiger. Down. Certainly. Relentlessly. Down. I I prayed. I wearied heaven with my prayer for its more speedy descent. I grew frantically mad and struggled to force myself up against that swinging, glittering death. Ah, of no avail. Down. Still unceasingly, still inevitably down. The sharp steel flashed past within three inches of my chest. Beatrice! Beatrice! Jean? Beatrice, Spindle, where are you? I heard you calling, Jean. I am here. It is a strange thing, Beatrice. I'm quite calm. You are resigned, then. No. That is the strange thing. Even now, I am not resigned. Is there a way out? How can there be? Ten, twelve more vibrations and will fray the surge of my robe. Only lightly as a razor 
in a delicate hand. There will be many sweeps before it bites deep. No, I can't escape it. You kept me away from you, Jean. You locked me out of your thoughts. If I am here only in your thoughts, why should I fear the rats? Rats! You open your eyes and your eyes blaze. What is it? Rats! Do they, do they still swarm here? Across the floor and over the meat pie. They have taken nearly all your food. Yes, 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 of course, they are ravenous. And they have sharp teeth. Well... The meat is oily and spiced. If I take what remains of it, scatter, you vermin! And rub that meat from the bandages that hold me here. Try it, John, try it. may be too late. If I leave my body a fraction of an inch up. Try it, I tell you, try it. Ah, but look, they scatter as soon as I do try. But they are watching you. I can see their eyes. Look, they're creeping back. Can I stand the rats crawling across me? Can the flesh barely... One of them has leaped on the wooden framework. Another followed. They're gnawing at the bandage. Seven, eight more sweeps of the pendulum. And the and bandage give way. A little less. Lie yes. still, Jean, lie still. Ten, twelve, a dozen rats now. Is death, I wonder, worse than this disgust? A dozen sharp knives could do no better. The bandage is loosened to ribbons. Now, if you move sideways, yes. carefully, yes. and drop to the floor. There are bedrooms I can't move. My arms and my legs are numb. There is no power The steel to... has frayed your robe. A minute more will be too late. Then, Try. Then, with all the strength that is in me, and all the hate that I bear my enemies... Free! A second time. Free! pendulum stops. They are drawing it back up through the roof. Each move I make, they watched. You never doubted. Yet with all they could do to you, they have failed twice. They will not fail. No more dallying with the king of terrors. What else can they do? I can't say. See, see how the rats gnaw in silence at that bandage. To what food, I wonder... But you escaped the pit. I escaped it once. Listen. What do you hear? A groaning. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, grinding as a metal. It was only the cog wheels of the pendulum. Uh, I think not, Beatrice. Why not? It seemed to come from behind those iron-plated walls. It seems to shake the dungeon as a mill wheel might shake it. it. Stand up, my poor Jean. Get up off your knees. I can't, Beatrice. I can't endure any more. The paintings on the walls of this dungeon... The skeletons and imps and devils, they seem different. They are different. The color sharpen and grow bright. The demon's eyes glare. The skeleton hands are stretched. Don't you catch even yet the odor of heated iron? Heated iron? Beatrice, my darling, I... I have been much humbled. But I won't... I won't have you see me in tears. I, I order you to go. John... In the name of heaven, Beatrice. you're sending me away. Yes, yes, Go. in the name of heaven. Go, go. A suffocating heat pervaded the prison. A deeper glow settled in the painted eyes that glared at me. I could draw no breath of air into my lungs. Against the loom of that fiery destruction, the thought of the pit and its coolness come like a soothing bomb. I staggered to the edge of the pit. I looked into it. The enkindled walls and roof lighted it to its depths. Yet for one wild moment, even then, I refused to believe the horror of what I saw beneath me. Does the pit please you, Captain Dalbury? Does the pit merciful God anything but that? And how shall you avoid it? Look. This dungeon has changed its shape. That is true. The walls are closing in. It was formerly a square, and now it is flattening slowly toward the center to force me into the pit. Of course. Ah, well, it'll force you along with me. Again, apparently you must be told, Captain Galbraith, that you are speaking only to your own sick fancy. I am not here at all. Farewell. And now... Now closer and closer through the red burning walls, forcing me into the pit with a swiftness that left me no time for thought. I shrank back, but the closing walls pressed me relentlessly onward. At length, for my seared and writhing body, there was no longer an inch of foothold. I, I, 
seen one. I caught it on the edge of the pit. <laughs> rushed back, an outstretched arm caught my own as I was about to fall fainting into the abyss. It was that of General LaSalle. The French army had entered Toledo. The Inquisition was in the hands of its enemies. Vive LaSalle! And so closes Poe's celebrated story, The Pit and the Pendulum, starring Henry Hull. We invite you to another adventure of suspense next Tuesday at the same hour. Until then, this is the man in black saying good night. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on The Spence. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Superman, strange visitor from another world who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. But in the American way, but to join Superman, here is an important message. Hey, gang, here's an exciting story about some flyers who were marooned on an iceberg way up in the frosty reaches of the Arctic Circle. Their plane had been forced down, and they were... Gee, fellas, this time we're really in a tough spot. We've only got about enough food for three days. There's nobody flying this way for another week. Hey, Spark, you get that radio fixed yet? You get that radio fixed yet? I'm still trying it, sir. But the matter is weak. Well, keep on trying. Maybe we can rig something up. We can rig something up. For five long icy days and nights, those flyers kept a constant watch for the silver gleam in the sky that might mean rescue. Finally, when the men were almost resigned to a frozen death... Hey, Lieutenant! I hear something! It's a plane! I know it's a plane! Get over there! Get over there! Gee, I guess Harry's got Arctic fever all right, poor guy. I don't hear anything. Why... Say, it is a plane, all right. He's dipping his wings. He's seen it. What? Gee, we're safe, fellas. We're safe. Yes, after five days on an iceberg, those flyers were finally rescued and returned to their base. Now, it wasn't just luck that they came through such an experience as well as they did. No, sir. Because those flyers were in top-notch physical condition, they weathered those hardships successfully. And that brings ships successfully. And that brings me to an important bit of information I have for all you fellas and girls. Have for all you fellas and girls. None of you can expect to grow up really husky and strong unless you eat right, which includes getting all your vitamins. So I want to tip you off to a mighty swell way to start getting two very important vitamins, B1 and D. It's by starting the day with a bowl full of crisp, crunchy Kellogg's Pep for breakfast. Ask your mother to get you a package of grand-tasting Kellogg's Pep tomorrow. And remember the name, Pep. P-E-P. Pep is made by Kellogg's in Battle Creek, Michigan. And now, the adventures of Superman. As you remember, Superman, in the guise of Clark Kent, has become involved in a new mystery having to do with Dr. Leander Cameron's invention of a mechanical man that can see, walk, talk, and even think for itself. We know, though our friends do not, that a new villain has entered upon the scene, a tall, strange-looking man known as the Vulture. In our last episode, we heard Dr. Cameron demonstrate a model of the mechanical man for Clark Kent. 
When the demonstration was over, Dr. Cameron was shocked to realize that... But wait. Let's listen in as he tells the story to editor Perry White in the latter's office at the Daily Planet. And I suddenly realized, Perry, that the man I thought was Clark Kent was another person altogether. Oh, impossible. A modern Jekyll and Hyde? <laughs> Ridiculous. Nicodemus was there. He saw the thing happen. Yeah, that's God for Mr. White. No, oh, this is simply unbelievable. Leander, couldn't you do anything to stop him from taking the model of the mechanical man away with him? No, Perry, you see, it all happened so quickly. We were just stunned. This man who called himself the vulture held us at bay with a pearl-handled revolver. And then he picked up the model and control box and walked out. We came here directly. Perry, this is a horrible situation to be in. That model is the only one of its kind and I couldn't possibly reproduce it. There are in it certain delicate parts that could only be procured in Germany before the war. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Leander. If these delicate parts can only be procured in Germany, how do you expect to make the life-size mechanical man? It would have been a simple matter to copy the parts from the model, but without the model, I'm helpless. You see? Yes, 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 of course, of course. Hello, Chief. Oh, Heard what right. happened and came as quickly as I could. How are you, Dr. Cameron? Nicodemus? Aye, uh, I'm wondering if you really are Clark Kent. We don't want to be fooled again. What? Uh, no, don't start changing your face or I'll jump right out of my skin. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Yes, from what I hear, a man who looked exactly like me and spoke exactly as I do came to watch your demonstration of the mechanical man. That's right. And after we demonstrated the mechanical man model, he held us up at the point of a gun and walked off with it. Oh, I'll be... Which reminds me, Kent, you never did show up. No, I had a mysterious phone call telling me to come to a certain address on the other end of town. Whoever it was promised me a big scoop, and when I got there, I found there was no such place. Hey, I'm beginning to see what this is all about. That voice on the phone must have been the vulture. He wanted to get you out of the way long enough to pull this little trick of his, huh? Yes, that's obvious now. Uh, Perry, it's a very frightening thing to contemplate, that model of the mechanical man being in the hands of a vicious, unscrupulous, and dangerous criminal who will sell it to the highest bidder. I do not need to remind you that the mechanical man can do anything from flying a plane to driving a tank. The Axis powers would give untold millions to get their hands on it, and I'm afraid they will if the vulture has anything to do with it. Well, there's only one thing we can do, and that's to get in touch with the police at once. Uh, get me Inspector Henderson and police headquarters at once. Dr. Cameron, tell me more about this vulture. What did he look like? Well, he's tall and angular and very sinister looking. Uh-huh. And when I really got a good look at him, his face reminded me of a bird. A vulture. By heavens, it made my stomach turn over. White Bee. Oh, hello, Inspector Henderson. Say, Inspector, I'd rather not discuss this matter over the phone. I think I'd better come down and see you right away. Will you wait for me? Good. Be right there. Now, we'd all better go down to police headquarters and get some action on this at once. Kent, where are you going? Aren't you coming with us? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, sure, Chief. I'm going to get my hat and coat. I'll be right with you. Get my hat and coat nothing. This calls for faster work than Clark Kent can accomplish. Into this vacant room here. Now, off with my street clothes. There we are. And now to do a job as Superman. Up with this window. And now to Dr. Cameron's laboratory. Up, up, and away! Here's the door to Dr. Cameron's lab. Oh, locked. Well, no help for it. I'll have to break in. That does it. Now to have a good look around. The vulture dropped even the slightest clue. I've just got to find it. And so the stalwart figure in red and blue begins the search. Up and down the room with incredible swiftness he moves, searching minutely every single inch of the floor, the walls, the workbenches, everything. And at last, in a corner of the room, Superman's eye falls on a small object. Hello, what's this? A button, torn from an overcoat. wonder if this could be of any help. There's the maker's name on the back of the button, tiny gold print. Letterers Limited. The name of the shop where the overcoat was bought. Pretty ritzy shop. Well, that narrows the search down somewhat. Now to get to Letterers for information on all customers who bought overcoats there in the last year. Out through that smashed door. Now, up! Up and away! As Superman heads toward the expensive clothing shop of Letterers Limited, the vulture himself is busy. He, too, has lost no time. And in his lavish penthouse apartment, a scene is taking place which may have a far-reaching effect on the American war effort. Listen. Mr. Kamura? Oh, you are the vulture? Yes. Sit down. This gentleman with you, I take it, are trustworthy? Both gentlemen are honorable and trusted Japanese agents. Good. If you can offer me the price I want for the model of the mechanical man, you will pay cash on the line. That understood? It is understood. I have brought check for $500,000. A check won't do. 
You may be honorable and trustworthy, but I want cash. You have no objection to selling this modern wonder to the Japanese government? I object to nothing that will bring me money. I have no feeling of patriotism. We have not even seen this mechanical man you speak of. It is here on this table. Come, I'll show it to you. Now, I'll just remove this cloth from it. There. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You appreciate it, I see. A man made of metal and only a foot high? This is the murder. Yes. Ah, perform it for me. Certainly. Well, the mechanism is warming up. Let me remind you that this is no ordinary robot. This mechanical man can see, talk, walk, and actually think for himself. Amazing. I do not understand how. Nor do I. But no more complicated, perhaps, to a scientific mind than our own telephone dialing system. It is simple to the telephone company, most complicated to me. With this mechanical man, Japan will have no trouble winning the war. (laughs) What I would not give to see a legion of such mechanical men marching against American Marines in the South Pacific. (laughs) I don't care how you use it. All I ask is that you pay my price. Oh, now I see the eyes have lit up. Oh, how they look. As if the little man were alive. What? One might say that he is. But now, gentlemen, you shall see the most amazing thing of all. You shall see this model of the mechanical man in operation. Little tin man, I command you to walk. You see? He is walking across the table. Stop him. He reaches the edge of the table. See, Paula? No, he won't fall off. See, a stop of his own accord. I'm sorry, it thinks, I think for itself. It is miraculous, miraculous. Yeah, miraculous, perhaps. Science, after all, is a miracle in itself. This model of the mechanical man is nothing more than a scientific achievement of the highest caliber. All right, little tin man. Walk to a safe spot, then stop. Mm. Oh, very interesting. What else will I do? Uh, Anything it is commanded to do. However, gentlemen, it is finished performing until I see the color of your money. Yes, let us discuss that. Uh, This check I have here is... We will not discuss that check, Kimura. My price is $500,000 in cash. And no tricks, gentlemen. I see you reaching for what is probably a revolver, Kimura. Let me warn you, that door you came through to enter this room is made of steel. The door and the windows of this room are electrically wired on a high-tension circuit. Well, do you no good to kill me and try to make off with the model, since you cannot leave this sealed room without my say-so? It's uh, no honor among thieves, I think. Oh, you wrong me. Komura has no intention of doing harm. Komura merely wished to secure mechanical man. Your price of $500,000 in cash. So? That's right. It is a great deal of money, but I believe I can secure this money within the hour. You will wait? You will not sell model to another bidder? No. That I promise you. Then Komura return within the hour. It is now five o'clock. I will be here again at six or before, at which time the mechanical man will become the property of the imperial Japanese government. If Kamura can secure the cash and take possession of Dr. Cameron's mechanical man model within the hour, it will mean much trouble for the United Nations fighting forces. In just a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Superman. But right now, here is another important message for you. Hey, gang, I'll bet you're as interested in good things to eat as I am, aren't you? So let me tell you about a neat discovery I made at breakfast time the other day. Instead of using plain white sugar on my bowl of Kellogg's Pep, I tried sprinkling it with brown sugar. And man alive, what a difference that made. There's something about the combination of those crisp golden sweetened of those crisp golden sweet as a nut flakes with the tempting flavor of moist brown sugar, all topped off with plenty of good whole milk, that makes a really A1 breakfast treat. And what's more, gang, pep is mighty good for you, as well as doggone good eating. So if you somehow missed out on this grand breakfast cereal, my advice to you is don't put it off any longer. Ask your off any longer. Ask your mother right now to put down Kellogg's pep on her shopping list for tomorrow. And remember now... Pep, pep, get in step. 
Make your cereal Kellogg's Pets. And now back to Superman. While the vulture is making a deal with a representative of the Japanese government, Superman is desperately trying to locate the man who masqueraded as Clark Kent. With only an hour in which to locate the vulture, will Superman be in time to prevent the model of the mechanical man from getting into the hands of the Japanese? Well, don't miss tomorrow's thrilling episode. And be with us every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station, for the exciting adventures of Superman. That's the little speeding bullet. Follow the adventures of Superman every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station. Superman is directed by George Lothar and is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. This is Mutual. horse with the speed of light, the cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver, the Lone Ranger. With his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, the masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. The stories of his strength and courage, his daring and resourcefulness have come down to us through the generations. And nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver! Faster, boy, faster! I'll Silver! Boy! When the Lone Ranger and Tonto reached a telegraph station, the last one before Canyon City, they left Dan Reed, the masked man's 14-year-old nephew, with the fellow in charge. And uh, you're to stay here till the masked man comes back. That's uh, all I know about it, Daniel. Oh, I don't mind. I never saw a telegraph before. You mean to say you can really talk with this little button? <laughs> well, not exactly talk. You push the key down and it makes a click. Then you let her up, and there's another click. Like this. You savvy? Oh, is that all there is to it? Well, when you heard that click, the men all along the telegraph line heard the same click. Well, how could they? 
They've got an instrument like this, too. It's electricity that does it. Now, if I make the clicks like this, that's called a dot. And if I make them like this, then it's called a dash. There's a code worked out. Each letter having a combination of dots and dashes. Well, the Lone Ranger told me something about how a telegraph works. Golly, it sure is wonderful the way science is doing things. Daniel, when the construction crew gets done with the job at noon tomorrow, Canyon City will be hooked right up with the big cities in the east. Why, thing can happen way in the east, and, and we'll know about it inside an hour. Jeb. Mm, yep. What's wrong? Hmm? Who, who said anything was wrong? Well, there is something wrong, isn't there? Oh, go on with you now. You, you're just guessing. Oh, I'm not guessing. We were east of here when the Lone Ranger was talking to a man in one of these stations. Dan, I don't know if you appreciate what a lucky young'un you are. Oh, sure I do. Traveling with the Lone Ranger. Jeb, you're changing the subject. The Lone Ranger heard something in the other station, and then he and Tom will change our course and came here as fast as we could. He left me with you and went on to Canyon City. Oh, he just wanted to talk to Tom Case, and that's all. Who's Tom Case? He's the boss of the construction job. They're stringing the wires to Canyon City. Was Tom Case having trouble? Huh? Now, now, why in thunder should you if ask... If the Lone you... Ranger didn't expect trouble, he would have taken me with him. He wouldn't have left me here with you. Dan, as a matter of fact, this construction's been nothing but... Trouble from the outset. Them buzzards that run the Rocky Hall Outfit are making it. Who? Rocky Hall Construction Outfit. They want the job of stringing the wires from Canyon City on to the west. Oh. If Tom Case and our gang don't set the last of them poles in Canyon City by noon tomorrow, the chances are Case will lose out on the rest of the contract. Oh, if Tom Case and the others are near Canyon City... What are those men out there doing? Huh? Oh, oh! they're just putting the finishing touches to the wires that's already in place. And, uh, keeping watch, they... Great day in the morning. It's Indians. Dozens of them. Let me hit that window. <coughs> hey, fellas! Look out! Redskins! Give me that gun, Dan. I'll fire a signal. They see the Indians. <laughs> The ornery redskins. Let me have a gun. I can help. Get your head down. Keep it down. I'll try to single Tom Case. Maybe he'll hear and come right up. Jeb. Jeb. Shut that. Shut that. The window. Yes, sir. Now, what can I do? Tell me. Signal. Tom. Tom Case. Tom. Uh... Jeb. Jeb, speak to me. Tell me how to signal him. Just tell me what to do. Well, Jeb, can't you speak? Oh, Jeb, if you could only tell me the code. There it is again. Doesn't that signal mean anything to you, Case? Not a thing. I never heard Jeb send in that style. Three tap again. Hmm. Tonto, I told Dan very little about the telegraph. You suppose... The signal of three... Tonto, we told Dan that three smudge fires or three gunshots was a signal that help was needed. Three of anything. He's signaling us. You mean your your nephew is signaling that way? I'm sure of it. Come on. But why don't Jeb send a signal? Perhaps for the same reason that help is needed. Get your men together and follow me. Hey, boys! Come on, mount up! Who's Silver? Come, Scout! You go on ahead, Case. Follow us. We'll be with you. Ready, big fella. Come on, Silver! Come on! Meanwhile, a few miles to the east, the men who had been working near the station fought their best. They had scant shelter when the Indians first rode down on them. Their sheltering wagons would be useless in short moments as the Indians were riding in a circle, firing from the saddle. While the battle raged outside the station, Dan stayed by the brass instrument, repeating the only signal he knew in the faint hope that it would reach the Lone Ranger, be understood, and bring the help so badly needed. Well, if only Jeb still lived, he could send a message... If you could just tell me what to say. What's that? One of the telegraph poles blew up. Those 
dirty redskins. They've blown up one of our telegraph poles. There goes another. Lawson, I'm going to rush him and try to stop him. Don't be a fool, Carrie. Fool or no fool, they can't blow up our work like that. Look at them. They're fixing to blow up another one. Stay here. That's an order, Carrie. Lawson, you can boss me on the job again. You'll be killed, Carrie. I'd sooner die than see all our work blown up. Will you boys help me rush him? No. How about you? It's suicide. Stay here. They'll have the next blast set in a minute. It's too far to stop him with a six gun. I'm going. Hey, they're coming. Who? Why, it's a long ranger. Tom Case and the men. How'd they know about it? Look, the Indians have seen them too. They're running away. You little hyenas. Look, them turn tail and run. Well, Mr. Case, looks like you and the mess man, the boys here, arrived just in time. Yes, we couldn't have held out much longer. How did it happen, Larson? Did you have guards posted around the camp as I ordered? Well, no. I figured we needed every available hand for the job. I don't give orders to hear myself talk. Them Redskins must have had everything well planned. First thing they did was to drill old Jeb so he couldn't wire for help. Well, you mean... You mean they killed him? Yes, sir. He he died before we could do anything for him. The Indians were planting more blasting powder to blow up the poles than you... That's strange. Ah. Indians not use blasting powder. What, what do you mean? I'm not sure the men who attacked you were Indians. Not Indians? Then who could they be? This isn't Indian territory. Ah, that right. Indian land west of here. West, huh? Did you hear that, Larson? When my surveyors were charting this route to Canyon City, you advised me to approach from the west to avoid the Redskins. I must have made a mistake, sir. Don't make any mistakes again, or I'll get a new gang boss. Yeah. All right, boys, back to work. We'll go to the telegraph office and look around. Yeah, I want to look after Jeb. No blast, Larson. If you'd had guards posted, I'm wagering all this wouldn't have happened. Come on, Silver. Get up. Leaving Tom Case inside the telegraph office with Jeb, the Lone Ranger and Tonto met Dan and then walked around the tiny shack in search of a clue to the raider's true identity. Is that the window, Dan? Yes. That's where Jeb was standing when he was hit. Oh, him make easy target. Did you see who shot him? Oh, yes, he was over this way, back of this rock. I'll show you. I saw him mounting right away. I see. He looked like he was creeping up on the house to kill Jeb from behind when he appeared at the window. Here. He was right here. Oh, and here tracks. The moccasin prints. Ah, oh, here's his knee print, too. Golly, that's right. I remember he was kneeling when he drew aim. Him wear a patch on knee, shaped like diamond. Here, design and print. Yes, Kimosabe. We shouldn't have trouble recognizing that sign if we saw it. Uh, him not Indian. Not a... Well, how can you tell? When Indian walk, him point toe in. When white man walk, him point toe out. And the toes of these marks and prints are pointed out. Ah. Uh. Oh, but who'd want to do a thing like that? The same gang who've been making trouble for the telegraph line since Tom Case was given the job laying wire. They probably hired renegade Indians. Ah. Uh, gang tried to delay him. Make them lose contract. Well, they did delay the crew a little by blowing up those poles. And if Tom Case doesn't lay the last stretch of wire in Canyon City by noon tomorrow, Rocky Hall will take over. Tom can replace the blown-up poles. He isn't stopped yet. You think that gang will try something else? I think so, Dan. That Rocky Hall gang won't stop as long as there's a chance. They're determined to make Tom void his contract. If we could only find out what their next move is to be. Maybe we can. Case insisted that Larson post a guard tonight. Larson say him stand guard himself. Yes, Toto. Larson is always on hand when something happens. Uh. I'm going to be on guard, too. I'm going to watch Larson. Oh, I can help you. And you'll stay with Tom Case. Oh. In a roundabout way, I'm going to let Larson hear that I'm watching him. As the Lone Ranger and Tonto lay watching in the darkness, a stranger came toward the camp and joined the guard, Larson. Bat, boys are all asleep. We'll shove on now. Whatever you say, Larson. Come on. Be ready for some fun. How's that? We're going to be followed. Oh, yeah? yeah that Lone Ranger, the critter with a mask, is watching us. You found that out, huh? He'll follow us. We'll lead him right to the middle of things.
beneath his mask, in anticipation of the plans ahead, the Lone Ranger had his face disguised. He walked slowly through the darkness. He saw the two ahead turn a corner in the trail, and for a moment a steep cliff shut them off from view. Then he too rounded the curve and... Reach! Get them up. Reach for the sky. I couldn't reach it no matter how I tried, Larson. Oh, smooth one, eh? I'll make one fast move and we drill you. There's men on all sides of you. All right, boys, close in. We got the Lone Ranger. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. Continue our story. The Lone Ranger has been captured by the Larson gang. Gagged and tightly bound, he was taken to the gang's headquarters in a cave where his mask was removed. But the gang did not know that the Lone Ranger was wearing a disguise, and that even unmasked, his identity was still unknown to them. Most of the gang then departed, leaving only Bat and Larson to guard their captive. It's our last chance to ruin the case with the telegraph company, Larson. Slip up this time, we're cooked. You're not telling me anything I don't know. Rocky Hall only pays off for results, not alibis. You've been handing out a lot of the last. I ain't seen you produce much in the way of results. Meaning what, Bat? Meaning the boys were all set to do some real damage to the line when you fumbled the deal. I fumbled it? If you'd taken care of the kid when you did Jeb, you wouldn't have had the Lone Ranger in case his men on your necks. I didn't know the kid was there. You should have told me. I'm advising you to make sure where you stand before you start shooting off your mouth, Savvy. Oh, there ain't no sense of you getting riled. I just mean to point out that the boys are a mite suspicious they won't get paid. They'll get paid. Not unless we prevent Tom Case from laying that wire in Canyon City by noon, they won't. None of us will. Case won't plant that last pole in Canyon City by noon. No, no. What's to stop him? Plenty. When's the last time it rained? Mm, must be a month or more. Why? The prairie grass between the camp and town is mighty dry. So dry, it just about crackles in your fingers. Mm, what of it? It'd make mighty quick burning fodder for a fire. Prairie fire? Yeah. With a breeze blowing it right down Case's line of telegraph poles. And them dry timbers that burn like paper. And the construction gang would be so busy trying to put out the flames, they wouldn't have time to push the wire through to Canyon City. Oh, you're talking sense. And the Rocky Hall would take over Case's contract. And we'd be paid. Paid plenty. Uh, still, it ain't a sure thing. What do you want, a written guarantee? Yeah, with all the cash we've got at stake, there ain't no sense in taking chances. What are you getting at? Well, while the boys and me were riding here to the hideout, we spotted a herd of buffalo. Buffalo? Yeah. Big head of them. They were grazing near the upper end of the canyon. What of it? Well, buffalo are mighty unreasonable critters when you get them going. Oh. You mean a stampede? Uh, why not? With a prairie fire licking at their heels, they'll run just the way we want them to. Yeah. Straight for the construction camp, I bet. Sure. And smash things up proper, including the men that'll try to fight the fire. That's a ticket. Now, me and the boys will take care of the stampede. You ought to have a cinch setting a fire in that dry grass. Yeah. But wait till the flames are high, wide, and handsome before you stampede the buffalo. Just to make sure there'll be plenty at their heels to keep them running. Tom Cass won't have a chance. I don't aim for him to have any. I took plenty from that hombre when I was pretending to be his gang boss. Now it's my turn to dish it out. Well, what about the Lone Ranger? I'm saving him for afterwards. I don't savvy. It's a matter of putting a six-gun to his head right now. Oh, it's too easy, Bat. Too quick. 
And too ordinary a death for the Lone Ranger. No, Van, I've got plans for him. I want to get a lot of satisfaction out of the way he dies. We dies? Yeah. Slow and easy. To make the pleasure last. <laughs> Early the next morning, Larson and Bat and their men rode swiftly off to attend to their plan. Behind them in the cave, they left the lone ranger still tightly bound, but with his gag removed, guarded by two of the outlaws. Seated under a large hole which tunneled through the rocky roof of the cave to the outside air, the two outlaws played cards to pass the time. How many cards, Leif? I'll stick to what I got. <laughs> Standing pat, eh? This must be your lucky hand. It better be. Yeah, dealer takes two. You open, Leif. I. What's the matter? Thought I heard footsteps. Yeah, you must have the willies, Leif. Nobody'd come snooping around here. If they did, they wouldn't find the cave. It's too well concealed. Uh, I guess you're right. Sure. Go ahead, place your bet. I'll bet this. Yeah, I'll raise you. And I'll raise you. Listen. You hear that? Sure, but... Sounded like it came from just outside the hole that tunnels through this roof. You're loco, Leif. Keep on and you'll give yourself goose pimples. I don't scare easy. Tell you I did hear something. Have it your way. But are you staying in this game or aren't you? Of course I'm staying. I'll raise you. Now, <laughs> you're talking. I'll raise you again. <laughs> While Leif and Dean concentrated on their poker game, secure in the knowledge that no one could enter the cave without their knowing it, the Lone Ranger heard a faint signal. That's Tonto. He looked about, ready to distract the attention of the guards if Tonto appeared. He saw nothing. Then he heard a faint scratching and looked overhead. He saw a noose dangling from the hole in the roof of the cave. And then it dropped. Hey, what the... He got him, Dean! Dean! Take a move and that rope will be jerked tighter. Please. Good work, Tuttle. Get me out of this. Stand where you are. Dean, untie my hands. Stay on the job, Tuttle. Be ready to pull up. I'm ready. Come on, don't pull it tighter. I'll strangle it. That depends on your partner. Get these ropes off. Please, I... Don't stand there gawking. Do what he says. If I so much as move, I'll find myself swinging with a busted neck. But the boss... Hurry. He's drawing it tighter. Come on, get this rope cut. I, I will. Hold still now. There. Yeah, that's better. Now, what do you... Come on down, Tonto. I'll take care of this one. Oh, he can't pay you. He thinks you in a hurry. Good work, Tonto. Huh? Take those ropes. We'll tie these two. He huh? fix them. I thought you'd be here sooner, Kimasabi. Me wait. Make sure. Gang not watch. We've little time left. Hurry with that roping. We've got to turn a stampede. Uh, this fellow all tied. Good. Now, so is this one. Where are the horses? Uh, them here. Outside cave. Where's the head scouts? Follow me, Tonto. There's a lot to do. Easy, big fella. <laughs> Come on, Silver! Come on, this count! Concealed by the tall, dry prairie grass not far from Canyon City, Larson's hard, thin mouth smirked with amusement as he watched Tom Case's construction crew approach the town from the valley below. For a moment, he let his eyes play over the scene. The first division of men digging the post holes, the second cutting the poles and setting them in place, and the third stringing the wire so eagerly awaited in Canyon City. Then he struck a match and lighted the prairie grass. The dry brush caught flame quickly and soon was ablaze. Running from one spot to another, Larson set fire to more and more of the brush until a curtain of flame leaped along the prairie and, buffed by a high wind, crackled down the slope toward the construction camp. <laughs> It'll take a smarter man than Tom Case to stop this blaze. If it can't be stopped, the wind's taking it down the hill right toward the camp. And the telegraph poles will be burned like matches. Supply wagons, too. And all the timber and wires they freighted over the mountain to finish the job. After this blaze, Case won't have anything left. There goes Batten, the boys, stampeding the buffalo. Driving them right in line with the fire. The buffalo will really step when they feel that blaze heat in their heels. Well, this is where Tom Case loses his contract to Rocky Hall. That and me settle for a nice lump of cash. (laughs) 
Down the valley toward the arroyo which rutted it and the construction camp on the opposite side thundered the shaggy mane buffalo, leaving the now roaring inferno of the prairie fire behind. Then the desperate construction crew saw the familiar figures of the Lone Ranger and Tonto riding furiously to their camp in advance of the onrushing tide. They raced to the rear of the herd of cattle which the camp tended for beef and fired their guns to stampede the steers. What are you aiming to do? Stampede the cattle, Case. You men, over here! Drive the cattle away from the camp. The buffalo may follow their lead and swing in behind them. If it works, I'll sidestep the telegraph line. Our only chance. Hurt them, boys! Drive them! Here come the buffalo! Stay clear! Hello! Uh, me, Sammy! The buffalo are driving in! Look! They're turning with the steers! They're changing course! Uh, telegraph pole safe from Buffalo now! We've other work to do! Come on, Silver! Raising back to the camp, the Lone Ranger led the construction crew to a stream which flowed nearby. Up here, men! Listening to the masked man's quickly outlined plan as the prairie fire roared down the valley toward the camp, the men sank charges of blasting powder into speedily dug holes in the bank, which formed a juncture between the stream and the arroyo. Then a series of explosions rent the air. Water rushed through the juncture to flood the arroyo, which gutted the bottom of the valley. For a moment, the flames of the prairie fire seemed to suspend themselves in the bank of the arroyo in an attempt to bridge the water to the construction camp on the opposite shore, then slowly simmered out at the water's edge. Who's that coming? The gang who's responsible for setting the fire and stampeding the buffalo case. Ah, and them right plenty fast. Yeah, that's what I can't figure out. They look like somebody's chasing them. The sheriff is chasing them with a posse. Look, the gang's turning off. They'll get away. Come on, Silver. Get him up, Scout. Come on, boys. That's the Rocky Hall gang. After them, folks. Matt, look, the concussion crew's right in the head us off. Bust them. Behind, we haven't got a chance. They won't take me without a fight. Yeah, me either. I want you, Larson. The Lone Ranger. Put down the engine. How in thunder? You won't take me. Drop that gun. I'm shutting lead at you. Oh, wing me. You not shoot either. Stay away, you. Go. You want another? No, oh, no, I give in. I've had enough. Are well, you going to surrender, Matt? Go in, boys. They got us surrounded. It's about time. I got plenty of scores to settle with you two. You, Larson, and Bird. Not as many as I have, Sheriff. Ask him who put him up to all the low-down tricks they pulled on us since we started to lay wire for this telegraph line. I don't have to ask him, Case. I know it's the Rocky Hall outfit. But they got more to answer to than that. Murder! Murder? Yeah. Killing old Jeb Collins in the telegraph office. I had nothing to do with that. That was Bat's work. Well, you're double-crossing scum. That's you enough out of you two. Uh, in Case... You don't want to lose that contract to Rocky Hall. You better start bringing that telegraph wire into Canyon City. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you heard him, boys. Get moving. Yeah. <laughs> Reckon we got enough evidence to a crooked play to blast the Rocky Hall outfit out of business, eh? Huh? You know, we can thank the Lone Ranger for that, Sheriff. Yes, and Tonto. Yeah. And young Dan Reed... He's the one who rode to me with the Lone Ranger's plan to surprise them coyotes from behind.
story you have just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. Hello, folks. Welcome to the 1024 Ranch. Yes, the 1024 Ranch, starring your radio and screen favorites, Dick Foran, Martha Mears, and the Sons of the Pioneers. Transcribed and brought to you by your Dr. Pepper bottler and the thousands of Dr. Pepper dealers from coast to coast. And here are our 1024 Ranch hands, the Sons of the Pioneers, to sing for you. present the top hand in the 1024 sales department, Art Gilmore. Thank you, Dick Ferran. During the last war, we had a song, How You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm. During this war, certain employers have felt like singing, How You Gonna Keep Their Minds on the Job. They have seen production fall off because workers were annoyed by the nagging distraction of between-meal hunger, thirst, fatigue. It's evident in what's known as just plain restlessness. And then... Well, then these employers, like many others, have seen the light and made Dr. Pepper available to their workers to enjoy at intervals during the day. Just a few moments to relax and refresh with a cold Dr. Pepper helps a heap. Its luscious goodness and its definite energy lift make a big difference in how a person feels and works. Try it. Stop for Dr. Pepper. Time out for Dr. Pepper is time gained for Uncle Sam. Oh, we're up in the morning at the breaking of day. The chuck wagon's busy, the flapjack's in play. The herd is astir over hillside and vale, with the night riders crowding them into the rain. With the night riders crowding them into the rain. Come take up your cinches, come shake out your reins Come wake your old bronco and break for the plains Come rouse your steers from the long chaparral For the outfit is off to the railroad corral For the outfit is off to the railroad corral So flap up your holster and snap up your belt And strap up your saddle whose lap you have felt Goodbye to the steers from the long chaparral. There's a town that's a trunk by the railroad corral. The railroad corral. I always like that, Dick. 
Foghorn. Say, where's Foghorn? Foghorn Far. Say, you want me truthful, John? Yeah, Foghorn. Say, were you the guy who was doing all that snoring in the bunkhouse last night? Huh? You know, it sounded just like a dive bomber pulling out at 600 feet. Oh, <laughs> I don't know, truthful. Maybe it was me, but if it was, I sure wished you'd have woke me up. Woke you up? Well, why? Oh, cause I just can't sleep when I snore. <laughs> Carl, you'd better play Sweet Dreams, Foghorn. Sweet Dreams. Jones and the 1024 Party Line News. Yes, ma'am, Miss Peggy. Pick up your receivers, folks. Hello, oh, oh, Buttercup. Flash, Shakespeare Smith, the crazy old coo to the cattle chute, and the cut-up of the Corton Center. And oh, me. <laughs> says there's nothing to the gossip that he and his girlfriend, Mirandy Matthews, were childhood sweethearts. Oh, no. If you want my opinion, folks... This childhood sweetheart gossip just got started because people figured Mirandy was in her first childhood and Shakespeare was in his second. Oh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Riding on the sunshine trail, out where the skies are bluer, out where your friends are always bluer. Riding on the sunshine trail, singing to the rolling hills, roaming the open prairie. Here on the range, you'll always find me riding on the sunshine trail. Clouds of gray never come my way. I never have a worry, nothing is wrong. Every day is a sunny day. I just hit the saddle and go jogging along. Riding on the sunshine trail. Out where the skies are bluer. Out where your friends are always bluer. Riding on the sunshine trail. Singing through the rolling hills. Roaming the open prairie Here on the range You'll always find me Riding on the sunshine trail Riding on the sunshine trail Oh, it's well, boys. And now how about one in a dreamy western temple? All right, Miss Peggy. How's this? That's it. Something for the close of day in the West. For twilight hours in the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains. Those towering symbols of the West. The monuments no king could build. You know, someone once said that God built the Rocky Mountains to stay the pioneers. To show them the world's greatest grandeur. To give them a home in the clouds. A haven near heaven. Rock me to sleep in my rocky mountain home While the mountain breezes cool a lullaby When shadows creep round my rocky mountain home On a bed of pine I'll close my weary eyes Let me dream once again Of the wild wood 
And the thrill of my first love of childhood Rock me to sleep in my rocky mountain home While the mountain breezes croon a lullaby Many of the men who used to mix your Dr. Pepper at the soda fountain have traded their white jackets for Uncle Sam's khaki or navy blue. Agile hands that once pushed the syrup lever are now pulling a machine gun trigger. More power to them. At home, the new generation of younger men and women fountaineers carries on, true to the traditions of the craft. There's the ready smile to greet you. There's the thorough cleanliness, the precise measurement of syrup and ice and charged water that makes your fountain Dr. Pepper a perfect creation. There may be a new face behind your favorite fountain, but your favorite drink still is made with all its old-time goodness. We're inviting you now to stop in at the fountain at 10, 2, and 4 o'clock, or at any time you happen to be hungry, thirsty, and tired. Keep a moving, keep a moving, keep a moving, keep a moving. Following the sun all day Move those mountains from our way Wheels are turning, hearts are yearning Following the sun all day, all day We've been following the sun ever since this day begun, and we're weary. Keep the moving, keep the moving, till the fading western light brings the shelter of the night so dreary. Keep the moving, keep the moving. appears on the 1024 Ranch through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, the Sons of the Pioneers by arrangement with Republic Studios. Martha Mears is Miss Peggy, and this is Art Gilmore wishing you good luck and good going with Dr. Pepper at 10, 2, and 4. And remember to buy all you can of Uncle Sam's war bonds and stamps. Bye. We are here to visit you from Shady Valley. Where 
with our music we will do our best to please you And we hope our songs bring happiness Hello good friends Yes, folks, we're all back again from the big Ozark barn in the very heart of the Missouri Hill Country. All the Shady Valley folks are here. Naomi Crawford, Jackie Hill, and those famous blues chasers, the Buckeye Four, with Cowboy Joe Randall, Horseshoe Mike, Ray Periander, and Happy Harvey. Hey, listen, boys, now, before we get started on this program, I want to say that I'm really ashamed of you all. Now, we were all invited... Well, now, we were all invited over to Mrs. Murphy's last night. We had a real nice time, a good supper, and then what happened? Well... What I want to know is who threw the overalls in Mrs. Murphy's chowder. Well, I know the whole story. Well, you better yeah. tell it. And Mr. Smurphy gave a party just about a week ago... Everything was beautiful, and the Murphys ain't, ain't slow. They treated us like gentlemen, and we tried to act the same. Only for what happened, well, it was an awful shame. When Mrs. Murphy dished the chowder out, she fainted on the spot. She found a pair of overalls at the bottom of the pot. Tim Nolan, he got ripping mad, his eyes were bulging out. He jumped upon the piano, and loudly he did shout. Hey! Who threw the overalls in Mrs. Murphy's chowder? Nobody spoke, so he shouted, oh, God, it's an Irish trick that's true, and I can lick the mix that through. The overalls in Mrs. Murphy's chowder. Yeah, it's a tough story now. I got to tell you some more about it in just a minute. Now, let's see. What did they do? Oh, yeah, they dragged the pants from out the soup, and they laid them on the floor. Each man swore upon his life he'd never seen them before. They were plastered up with mortar, and they were worn out at the knee. They had their many ups and downs, as we could plainly see. And when Mr. Smurphy, she came to, she began to cry and poke. She had them in the wash that day, and she forgot to take them out. Tim Nolan, he excused himself for what he said that night. So we put music to the birds and sung with all our might. Who threw the overalls in Mr. Smurphy's chowder? Nobody spoke, so he shouted all the louder. Hey! It's an Irish trick that's true, and I can lick the mick that's through. The overalls in Mr. Smurphy's chowder. Raymond, did you throw me in? And it couldn't be me and Austin. Now, boys, why don't you fess up, fess up. Now, it's an Irish trick that's true, and I'm going to lick the mick that's through. The overalls in Mr. Smurphy's chowder. <laughs> 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 oh, well, thanks a lot, boys. Say, Buckeye Forest, that old-timer won't put the folks in a happy frame of mind. Nothing will. Unless it might be a song from Naomi Crawford, the sweetheart of Shady Valley. And here she is now with her cheeks as rosy as a Jonathan apple and a song called Please Be Like Your Daddy. The plane went down one Sunday morning Across the harbor bay Flames he died from out the skies. We know the price he paid. That night a mother held her son and rocking to and fro with tear dimmed eyes. She heard. Your hair is curly too 
Thanks a lot, Penny Alma. That was very, very fine. See, you really have to be an old-timer or something like Horseshoe Mike here to remember when this tune by Ray Parandu was popular on the hit parade. Now, how many of you folks would have remembered that the title of the notes to follow was Cherry, eh? I wonder how many of you really would remember it. Thanks a lot there, Ray. You know, every once in a while, we run across an old favorite song in our big collection, and we usually call on Cowboy Joe to do the vocal honors, because there's nobody who can give the proper touch to an old favorite like Cowboy Joe. Here's a lump song from way back around 1927. It happened in Monterey. It happened in Monterey a long time ago. I met her in Monterey. In old Mexico, stars and steel guitars and luscious lips as red as wine broke somebody's heart, and I'm afraid that it was mine. It happened in Monterey without thinking twice. I left her and threw away the key to paradise. My indiscreet heart Long for a sweetheart That I left In old Monterey It happened in Monterey A long time ago I met her in Monterey In old Mexico Stars and still guitars and luscious lips as red as wine broke somebody's heart, and I'm afraid that it was mine. It happened in Monterey without thinking twice. I left her and threw away. I 
Very fine. Well, folks, we're working over a lot of old favorites today. And here's that famous group of mountain boys, the Buckeye Four, with a high step and tune that'll, well, you just never forget, that's all. It's We George Brown. <laughs> Thanks, Buckeye Four. Come Saturday night in these parts, you can depend on seeing a solid stream of folks heading toward the big barn here for our regular weekend shindig. Of course, now the gasoline rationing has hit us, too, but most of the folks ride in their old buggies. And then some of the youngsters hire a hay wagon from Charlie Bottle. And I'll tell you, it's a sight for old eyes to see those kids laughing and cutting up while they're snuggled down the hay. Uh, Happy Herbie's standing by me here now with a song that'll give you a pretty good idea of what fun it is riding to the barn dance. On a load of hay on a sunny day Riding to the barn dance with the one I love We will sing a song as we ride along Underneath the clear blue sky above Going down the road with our happy load Stopping at each farm along the way My and Pa and all the rest They are dressed up in their best And we won't be home till break of day Riding along together Going to the barn dance With the one I love Everyone's invited under the sun Everyone's excited cause we're gonna have fun When we hear the fiddle band we're ready to go Grab a partner by the hand Circle four and dosy do I'm up in heaven when I'm riding to the barn dance With the one I love Friends, if you like to reminisce once in a while, here's the best opportunity that you'll have for some time to just kind of sit and dream about warm summer nights long ago when you stroll through the garden arm in arm with your sweethearts. Horseshoe Mike is going to set the scene with music, and of course you can supply all the details while you listen to the strains of Moonlight and Roses. Mm-hmm. 
Thanks, Horseshoe Mike. That sounded very, very nice. And now little Jackie Hill is all primed for a song for you folks, so Jackie, there's no better time than right now to sing that old timer. I'll go riding down that old Texas trail. Jackie. Well, there's no room for the blues around here, folks, and especially not when the Buckeye Four rip into Who's Sorry Now, and that's exactly what they're going to do right now. Almost every cabin in the hill country, a most prized piece of furniture is the old family organ standing in the living room. You'd be surprised at the amount of good music that can be pumped from a good old organ, and what a wonderful sound it is to hear the folks in the family gather around it while some of the elders sing the hymns of days gone by. Our Shady Valley trio, Joe, Herbie, and Naoma, sing a song that fits right into the picture. When Mother played the organ and Daddy sang the hymn.
tears to their eyes growing dim When Mother played the organ And Daddy sang the hymn When Mother played the organ That was very, very nice. And say, Buckeye 4, how about kind of, well, about one through on the Bye Bye Blues here? Do you think it'll Make be all right for one? We'll Make it twice. <laughs> Buckeye for, and now in parting, long may your chimney smoke, and may your shadow never grow shorter. We have come to visit you from Shady Valley, in the old arch where the skies are always With our music we have done our best. Our song.